Kotaro Isaka. Bullet Train. Translated from the Japanese by Sam Melissa. About the authors. Kotaro Isaka is a best selling and multi award winning writer who is published around the world. He has won the Shincho Mystery Club Award, Mystery Writers of Japan Award, Japan Booksellers Award, and Yamamoto Shagoro Prize, and 12 of his books have been adapted for film or TV. Sam Melissa holds a PhD in Japanese literature from Yale University. He has translated fiction by Toshiki Okada, Shun Metaruma, and Hideo Furukawa, among others. Kimura Tokyo Station is packed. It's been a while since Yuichi Kimura was here last, so he isn't sure if it's always this crowded. He'd believe it if someone told him there was a special event going on. The throngs of people coming and going press in on him, reminding him of the TV show he and Wataru had watched together, the one about penguins, all jammed in tight together. At least the penguins have an excuse, thinks Kimura. It's freezing where they live. He waits for an opening in the stream of people, cuts between the souvenir shops and kiosks, quickening his pace. Up a short flight of stairs to the turnstile for the Shinkansen high-speed bullet train. As he passes through the automated ticketing gate he tenses, wondering if it will somehow detect the handgun in his coat pocket, slam shut while security swarms around him, but nothing happens. He slows and looks up at the monitor, checking the platform for his train, the Hay 8. There's a uniformed police officer standing guard, but the cop doesn't seem to be paying him any attention. A kid with a backpack brushes by, looks to be eight or nine years old. Kimura thinks of Wataru, and his chest tightens. He pictures his beautiful boy, lying unconscious and unresponsive in a hospital bed. Kimura's mother had wailed out loud when she saw him. Look at him, he looks like he's just sleeping, like nothing even happened to him. He might even be hearing everything we're saying. It's too much. The thought of it makes Kimura feel scraped out from the inside. Bastard will pay. If someone can push a six-year-old boy off the roof of a department store and still be walking around, breathing easy, then something in the world is broken. Kimura's chest clenches again, not from sadness but from rage. He stalks towards the escalator, clutching a paper bag. I quit drinking. I can walk a straight line. My hands are steady. The Hay 8 is already on the track, waiting for its turn to depart. He hustles to the train and boards the third car, according to the info he got. From his former associates, his target is on the three-seater side of the fifth row in car 7. He's going to enter from the next car and sneak up from behind. Nice and easy from behind, sharp and alert one step and then another. He enters the gangway. A recess with a sink is on the left, and he pauses in front of the mirror. Pulls the curtain shut on the small vanity area. Then looks at his reflection. Hair unkempt, beads of gunk in the corners of his eyes. Whiskers sticking out at odd angles, even the downy fuzz on his face seems coarse. Ragged and raw. It isn't easy to see himself this way. He washes his hands, rubbing them under the water until the automatic stream cuts off. Fingers trembling. It's not the booze, just nerves, he tells himself. He hasn't fired his gun since Wataru was born. He only even touched it when he was packing his things for the move. Now he's glad he didn't throw. It out. A gun comes in handy when you want to put a little fear into some. Punk when you need to show some asshole that they are way out of line. The face in the mirror twists. Cracks split the glass, the surface bulges and warps, the face curls into a sneer. What's done is done, it says. You're gonna be able to pull the trigger. You're just a drunk, couldn't even protect your boy. I gave up drinking. Your boy's in the hospital. I'm gonna get the bastard. But are you gonna be able to forgive him? The bubble of emotion in his head is no longer making sense, and it bursts. 
He reaches into the pocket of his black tracksuit jacket and draws out the gun, then pulls a narrow cylinder from the paper bag. He fits it to the muzzle, twists it into place. It won't completely eliminate noise from the shot, but on a little point two two like this one it'll muffle it down to a tiny thunk, lighter than a pellet from a toy gun. He looks in the mirror once more, nods, then puts the gun in the paper bag and steps away from the sink. A female car attendant is prepping the snack trolley and he almost barrels into her. He's about to snap, move it, but his eyes fall on the cans of beer in the cart and he backs off. Remember, one sip and it's all over. His father's words flash through his mind. Alcoholism never really goes away. One sip and you're right back where you started. He enters car number four and starts up the aisle. A man seated just inside the car on his left bumps Kimura as he passes. The gun is safely tucked away in the bag, but it's longer than usual due to the silencer, and it catches on the man's leg. Kimura hastily hugs the bag towards himself. His nerves spike and he feels a violent surge. He whips towards the man, nice guy face, glasses with black frames, who bobs his head meekly and apologizes. Kimura clicks his tongue and turns away, about to move on, when the nice guy pipes up. Hey, your bag is torn. Kimura pauses and looks. It's true, there's a hole ripped in the bag, but nothing sticking out that could be obviously identified as a gun. Mind your own business, he growls as he steps away. He exits car 4, and moves quickly through cars 5 and 6. One time Wataru had asked, how come on the Shinkansen car one is at the back? Poor Wataru. Kimura's mother had answered, whichever car is closest to Tokyo is car number one. Why, daddy? The closest car to Tokyo is car one, the next is car two. So when we take the train to where daddy grew up, car one is in the back, but when we go back to Tokyo car number one is up front. When the Shinkansen's heading to Tokyo they say it's going up, and trains heading away from Tokyo are going down, Kimura's father had added. It's always about Tokyo. Granny and Grandpa, you always come up to us. Well, we want to see you, that's why. We come all the way up the hill, heave ho. But you don't do it, the Shinkansen does. Kimura's father had looked at him then. Wataru's adorable. Hard to believe he's yours. I get that all the time. Who's the dad? His parents ignored his sulky remark, chattering away happily. The good stuff must have skipped a generation. He enters car 7. On the left side of the aisle are rows of two seats and on the right side are rows of three, all facing forward, backs of the seats to him. He puts his hand in the bag, closes it around the gun, then takes a step in, once, twice, counting the rows. There are more empty seats than he had expected, just a sprinkling of passengers here and there. In the fifth row, by the window, he sees the back of a teenager's head. The kid stretches out, white-collared shirt under a blazer. Clean cut, like an honors student. He turns to stare out the window, dreamily watching other Shinkansen pull into the station. Kimura draws closer. One row away he's seized with a moment's hesitation, am I really gonna hurt this kid? He looks so innocent. Narrow. Shoulders, delicate frame. Looking for all the world like a schoolboy quietly excited about a solo trip on the Shinkansen. The knot of aggression and determination inside Kimura loosens ever so slightly. Then sparks burst in front of him. At first he thinks the train's electrical system is malfunctioning. But it's his own nervous system, gone haywire for a split second, first sparks and then blackness. The teenager by the window had whirled round and pressed something into Kimura's thigh, like an oversized TV remote. By the time Kimura realizes it's the same sort of homemade stun gun those school kids had used before, he's paralyzed, every hair on his body bristling. Next thing he knows he's opening his eyes, seated by the window. Hands bound in front of him. Ankles too, wrapped in bands of sturdy fabric and duct tape. 
He can bend his arms and legs, but his body isn't going anywhere. You really are stupid, Mr. Kimura. I can't believe you'd be so predictable. You're like a robot following its programming. I knew you'd come for me here, and I know exactly what you came to do. The kid is sitting right next. To him, talking brightly. Something about the double-folded eyelids and the well-proportioned nose looks almost feminine. This kid had pushed Kimura's son off the roof of a department store, laughing while he did it. He might only be a teenager but he speaks with the self-assurance of someone who's lived several lives. I'm still surprised that everything went so smoothly. Life really is too easy. Not for you though, sorry to say. And after you gave up your precious booze, and got yourself all worked up for this. Fruit. How's that cut doing? Tangerine, in the aisle seat, asks Lemon, next to the window. They're in car 3, row 10, the three-seater. Lemon is staring out the window, muttering. Why'd they have to get rid of the 500 series? The blue ones. I loved them. As if finally hearing the question, he knits his brow, what cut? His long hair sticks out like a lion's mane, though it's hard to tell if he styles it that way or if it's just bedhead. Lemon's complete lack of interest in work, or in anything really, shows in his eyes and his curled upper lip. Tangerine wonders vaguely if his partner's looks dictated his personality or the other way round. From when you got slashed yesterday. He points. The cut on your cheek. When did I get slashed? Saving this rich kid. Now Tangerine points at the guy sitting in the middle seat. A younger guy, early twenties, long hair, wedged in between them. He keeps staring back. And forth from Lemon to Tangerine. He's looking a lot better than when they rescued him the night before. They had found him tied up, worked over, shaking uncontrollably. But it hasn't even been a full day and he seems pretty much back to normal. Probably nothing going on inside, thinks Tangerine. Often the case with people who don't read fiction. Hollow inside. Monochrome, so they can switch gears no problem. They swallow something and forget about it as soon as it goes down their throat. Constitutionally incapable of empathy. These are the people who most need to read, but in most cases it's already too late. Tangerine checks his watch. 9 a.m., so, 9 hours since they rescued the kid. He was being held in a building in the Fujisawa Kangocho part of town, in a room three floors underground, this rich kid, Yoshio Minejishi's only son, and Tangerine and Lemon busted him out. I'd never do something so stupid as get slashed. Give me a break. Lemon and Tangerine are the same height, around 5'10", and both have the same rangy build. People often assume they're brothers, twins even. Twin killers for hire. Whenever anyone refers to them as brothers, Tangerine feels a deep frustration. It's unbelievable to him anyone could lump him in with someone so careless and simplistic. It probably doesn't bother Lemon. Though. Tangerine can't stand Lemon's sloppy ways. One of their associates. Once said that Tangerine is easy to deal with but Lemon is a pain. Just like the fruit, no one wants to eat a lemon. Tangerine had agreed wholeheartedly. Then what's that cut on your cheek from? You've got a red line from here to here. I heard it happen. That punk came at you with a blade and you screamed. I'd never scream because of that. If I did scream, it was because the guy went down so fast and I was disappointed. Like, oh my god, is he really such a wuss, you know? Anyway, this thing on my face isn't from a blade. It's just a rash. I've got allergies. Never seen a rash look so much like a slash. Are you the creator of rashes? Am I the what? Tangerine looks dubious. Did you create the rashes and allergic reactions in this world? No. Then maybe you're a health critic, and you're denying my 28-year history with allergies? What exactly do you know about rashes? 
It's always like this. Lemon gets all puffed up and starts casting wild. Aspersions, spouting off at random. If Tangerine doesn't either accept the blame or stop listening altogether, Lemon will keep it up indefinitely. But they hear a small sound between them, coming from the kid, Little Manejishi. He's making uncertain noises. Ah. Uh. Um. What? asks Tangerine. What? asks Lemon. Um, what? Uh, what were your names again? When they had found him the night before, he was tied to a chair and wrung out like a limp rag. Tangerine and Lemon woke him up and carried him out, and he just kept saying I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he couldn't get anything else out. Tangerine realizes that the kid probably has no idea what's going on. I'm Dolce, he's Gabbana, he says offhandedly. No, says Lemon with a nod, I'm Donald, he's Douglas. What? But even as Tangerine asks, he knows that these are characters from Thomas and Friends. No matter what the subject is, Lemon always manages to steer the conversation to Thomas. A long-running TV show for Kids, filmed with model trains, Lemon loves it. Whenever he needs an Allegory chances are he'll pull it from an episode of Thomas and Friends. Like everything he ever learned about life and happiness came from that show. I know I've told you this before, Tangerine. Donald and Douglas are twin black locomotives. They speak very properly. Well, well, if it isn't our good friend Henry, like that. Talking like that makes a good impression. I'm sure you agree. Can't say I do. Lemon sticks his hand in his jacket pocket, rummages around, pulls out a glossy sheet about the size of an address book. He points at it. Look, this is Donald. There are a bunch of trains on it, Thomas and Friends stickers. One of them is black. No matter how many times I tell you, you always forget the names. It's like you're not even trying. I'm not. You're no fun. Look, I'll give this to you so you can remember their names. Starting from here, this is Thomas, here's Oliver, see, they're all lined. Up for you. Even the diesel. Lemon starts rattling off names one by one. Tangerine shoves the sheet of stickers back at him. So, uh, what are your names, asks Little Manejishi. Hemingway and Faulkner, says Tangerine. Bill and Ben are twins too, and so are Harry and Bert, puts in Lemon. We are not twins. Okay, Donald and Douglas, sirs, says little Manejishi earnestly. Did my dad hire you to save me? Lemon begins digging around in his ear, looking disinterested. Yeah, I guess that's right. Although if I'm being honest, we kind of had to take the job. Too dangerous to say no to your dad. Tangerine agrees. Your father is a frightening individual. Do you think he's scary too? Or maybe he goes easy on you cause you're his boy. Lemon pokes the rich kid, only very lightly, but the kid jumps. Uh, ah, uh, no, I don't think he's that scary. Tangerine smiles acidly. He's starting to settle in. That particular train seat smell. You know about the things your father did when he was in Tokyo? There's all kinds of crazy stories. Like the one about when he was lone. Sharking and a girl was five minutes late on her payment and he chopped off her arm, you heard that one. Not her finger, you know, her arm. And we're not talking about five hours, she was only late five minutes. And then he takes her arm and here he cuts himself off, feeling like the well-lit world of the Shinkansen isn't the place for gory details. Yeah, I've heard that one, mutters the rich kid, sounding uninterested. And then he put it in a microwave, right? Like he's talking about the time his dad tried some new recipe. Okay, okay, how about the one Lemon leans forward and pokes the kid again, where Manejishi had a guy who wouldn't pay up, and he got the guy's son, and he stood father and son in front of each other and gave them both box cutters and I've heard that one too. You heard about that? Tangerine is nonplussed. But really, your father's smart. 
he keeps it simple. If someone's giving him a problem, get rid of them, he says, and if something's complicated, he just says forget about it. Lemon watches through the window as another train pulls out of the station. A little while back there was a guy in Tokyo named Terahara. Made a ton of money, and made a mess doing it. Yeah, his organization was called Maiden. I know. I've heard about him. The kid's starting to feel comfortable, giving off a whiff of entitlement. Tangerine doesn't like it. He could get into a story about a spoiled kid if it was in a novel, but in real life he isn't interested. All it does is aggravate him. So, Maiden fell apart six, maybe seven years ago, continues Lemon. Terahara and his kid both died, and the operation was split up. In the aftermath, your father must have known that things were gonna get ugly, so he just picked up and left town, up north to Moriaka. Like I said, smart. Um. Thank you. What are you thanking me for? I'm not praising your dad here. Lemon. Keeps his eye on the white body of the departing train as it fades into the distance, apparently sad to see it go. No, I mean thank you for rescuing me. I thought I was a goner. They tied me up, there must have been thirty of them. They had me underground and everything. And I had this feeling that even if my dad paid the ransom they'd kill me anyway. They seemed to really hate my dad. I was like, this is it for me, for sure. The rich kid seems to be getting more and more talkative, and Tangerine makes a sour face. You're pretty sharp. First, basically everyone hates your dad. Not just your friends from last night. I'd say you're more likely to meet someone who's, I don't know, immortal than find someone who doesn't hate your dad. Second, like you said, they would have killed you the moment they got the money, no doubt about it. When you thought you were a goner, you were right. Minejishi had contacted Tangerine and Lemon from Moriaka and tasked them with bringing the ransom money to the captors and rescuing his son. Sounded simple enough, but nothing is ever simple. Your pop was very specific, Lemon grumbled as he counted off on his fingers. Save my son. Bring back the ransom money. Kill everyone involved. Like he thinks he's gonna get everything his heart desires. Minejishi had prioritized the list. Most important was bringing back his son, then the money, then killing all the perpetrators. But, Donald, you did all of it. You did great. The rich kid's eyes are sparkling. Wait, Lemon, where's the suitcase? Tangerine is suddenly worried. Lemon was supposed to be carrying the suitcase with the ransom money in it. It didn't feel quite big enough for more than a few days away but it was a decent-sized model with a sturdy handle. At the moment, it's not on the luggage rack or under the seat or anywhere in sight. Tangerine, you noticed. Lemon leans back and props his legs up on the seat in front of him, smiling broadly. Then he starts to fish around in his pocket. Here, check this out. The suitcase doesn't fit in your pocket. Lemon laughs, though no one else does. Yeah, all I've got in my pocket is this little piece of paper. He produces something the size of a business card and waves it in the air. What's that? The rich kid leans in for a closer look. It's an entry for a giveaway from the supermarket we stopped at on the way here. They run it once a month. Check it out, first prize is a paid ticket for a holiday. And they must have messed up because there's no expiry date, so if you win you can go whenever you want. Can I have it? No way. I'm not gonna give it to you. What do you need travel tickets for? Your dad can pay for your holidays. You've got dad tickets. Lemon, forget about the giveaway, tell me where the hell the suitcase is. There's an edge in Tangerine's voice. A nasty premonition flickers through him. Lemon looks over at him serenely. You don't know much about trains so I'll break it down for you. On current models of the Shinkansen there's storage space in the gangways between the cars for large luggage. 
big suitcases, ski equipment, that kind of thing. Tangerine is at a momentary loss for words. To relieve the pressure of the blood boiling in his head he reflexively elbows the rich kid in the arm. The kid yelps, then whines in protest, but Tangerine ignores him. Lemon, didn't. Your parents teach you to keep a close eye on your belongings. He does his best to keep his voice even. Lemon is obviously offended. What does that even mean, he sputters. Do you see anywhere I could have put the suitcase? There are three people sitting here, how exactly was I supposed to fit the suitcase? Gobs of spit rain down on the rich kid. I had to store it somewhere. Could have used the overhead rack. You weren't carrying it so you don't know, but that thing's heavy. I did carry it for a bit, and it isn't that heavy. And don't you think that if anyone noticed a couple of shady-looking dudes like us with a suitcase they'd figure oh there must be something valuable inside, and then the jig would be up. I'm trying to be careful here. The jig would not be up. It would. And anyway, Tangerine, you know that both my parents died in an accident when I was in kindergarten. They didn't teach me much of anything. I guess if they taught me one thing it was not to keep suitcases. Nearby. You're so full of shit. The mobile phone in Tangerine's pocket vibrates, making his skin buzz. He takes out the phone, checks the caller ID and grimaces. It's your father, he says to the rich kid. As he stands and heads towards the gangway, the Shinkansen starts to pull away. The automatic door opens and Tangerine accepts the call as he steps into the gangway. He puts the phone up to his ear and hears Minejishi. Well? The voice is quiet but penetrating. Tangerine draws up next to the window and follows the passing city scene with his eyes. The train just left. Is my son safe? If he weren't, I wouldn't be on the train. Then Minejishi asks if they have the money, and what happened to the kidnappers. The noise of the train running gets louder and it becomes harder to hear. Tangerine makes his report. Once you brought my son back to me, your work is done. You're just up there relaxing in your villa, how much do you really care about your boy? Tangerine bites his tongue. The line goes dead. Tangerine turns to go back but stops short, Lemon is standing right in front of him. It's a strange feeling, facing someone exactly his height, like looking into a mirror. But the person he sees is more careless, more badly behaved than he is, giving Tangerine the peculiar sensation that his own negative traits have taken human form and are staring back at him. Lemon's natural jumpiness is on full display. Tangerine, this is bad. Bad? What's bad? Blame me for your problems. It's your problem too. What happened? You said that I should put the suitcase with the money on the overhead rack, right? I did. Well, it started to worry me too, so I went to get it. To the storage space in the gangway, on the other side of our car. Good thinking. And? It's gone. The two of them fly through car number three to the gangway on the other side. The storage space is next to the bathrooms and sink area. Two racks, one large suitcase on the top. Not the one with Minejishi's money inside. Next to them is a small empty shelf that looks like a payphone used to live there. You put it here. Tangerine points at the empty rack below the large suitcase. Yeah. And where'd it go? The toilet? The suitcase? Yeah. It's not clear whether Lemon's playing or serious as he steps over to the men's room door and yanks it open. But when he shouts, where are you? Where'd you piss off to? Come back, his voice sounds frantic. Maybe someone took it by mistake, thinks Tangerine, but he knows that's not true. His heart rate rises. The fact that he's shaken up shakes him up. Hey, Tangerine, what three words describe our situation right now? A twitchy muscle in Lemon's face keeps firing. Just then the snack trolley enters the gangway. 
The young attendant stops to see if they'd like anything but they don't want her to hear their conversation and they wave her on. Tangerine waits until she and the cart disappear through the door. Three words. We are screwed. We are fucked. Tangerine suggests that they return to their seats to calm down and think. He starts off and Lemon follows. But hey, I'm not done. Any other three-word combinations? It may be that he's confused, or that he's just simple-minded, but there's not a shred of gravity in his voice. Tangerine pretends not to hear him and enters car three, makes his way. Down the aisle. The train isn't crowded, only maybe 40% full on A. Weekday morning. Tangerine doesn't know how many people are usually on the Shinkansen, but this feels quiet. Since they're walking towards the back of the train, the passengers are facing them. People with arms folded, people with eyes closed, people reading the newspaper, business people. Tangerine scans the overhead racks and the footrests. Looking for a mid-size black suitcase. Little Manejishi is still in his seat, halfway down the car. He has the seat leaned back and his eyes closed, his mouth gaping, his body lolling towards the window. He must be tired after all, two days ago he was kidnapped, held and tortured, then busted out in the middle of the night and hustled to the train without a wink of sleep. But none of these thoughts cross Tangerine's mind. Instead his heart goes full jackhammer. And now this. He flounders for a moment but reins himself in, swiftly sits next to the kid and feels his neck. Lemon steps closer. Sleeping in a time of crisis, young master. Lemon, our crisis just got worse. How? The young master's dead. No way. Several seconds pass before Lemon adds, we are royally fucked. Then he counts on his fingers and mutters, guess that's four words. Nanao. Nanao can't escape this thought, if it happened once it can happen again, and if it happened twice it can happen three times, and if three times then four, so we might as well say that if something happens once it'll keep happening forever. Like a domino effect. Five years ago, on his first job, Things got way hairier than he expected, and he had mused to himself, if this happened once, it could happen again. There must have been some kind of binding power in his idle thought, because his second job was a disaster too, and his third. Always a total mess. You're overthinking it, Maria had said on multiple occasions. Nanao gets his jobs from Maria. She describes herself as basically just an agent but Nanao doesn't think that's all there is to Maria. Words floated through his mind like epigrams, I prepare the food and you eat of it, you command and I obey. Once he asked, Maria, why don't you do any jobs? I've got a job. I mean a job. You know, like in the field. That kind of job. Nanao tried to put it in terms of a genius football player standing on the sidelines shouting orders to their amateurish teammates stumbling around on the field, chewing them out for their blunders. And you're the genius football player, which makes me the amateur. Wouldn't things go smoother if the genius got in the game? Less stress for everyone, and better results. Come on. I'm a woman. Yeah, but you're really good at Kenpo. I've seen you take out three men at once. And I'm sure you're more reliable than I am. That's not what I mean. I'm a woman, what if my face gets messed up? What year are you from? Ever heard of gender equality? This conversation is sexual harassment. He couldn't get anywhere with her on the subject, and Nanao had given up. It seemed there would be no altering the situation. Maria calling the shots and Nanao following orders, the genius coach and the amateur player. Maria said the same thing about this job that she said about all of them, simple. You'll be in and out, easy peasy. Nanao had heard these promises before, but he almost couldn't bring himself to protest. I'm guessing something will go wrong. So pessimistic. You're like a hermit crab who won't leave its shell because it's worried about earthquakes. Is that what hermit crabs worry about? If they weren't worried about earthquakes, 
they wouldn't have portable houses, would they? Maybe they just don't want to pay property taxes. She ignored his desperate attempt at a punchline. Listen, the kind of job. We do is basically all rough stuff, dangerous work, so it shouldn't surprise. You if there's some trouble every time. You could say that trouble is our job. Not some trouble, Nanao said emphatically. It's never just some trouble. He wanted to be 100% clear on this point. I've never only just had some trouble. Take that job in the hotel, when I was supposed to get photos of that politician having an affair. You said that one would be simple, in and out. It was simple, all you had to do was get some photos. Sure, simple, as long as there isn't a mass shooting in the hotel. A man in a suit had suddenly opened fire in the lobby, spraying bullets all around. He was later identified as a prominent bureaucrat who had been suffering from depression, leading him to kill several guests and end up in a standoff with police. It had no connection whatsoever to Nanao's job, just a total coincidence. But you did great. How many people did you end up saving? And you broke the shooter's neck. It was him or me. And then what about that job where I was supposed to go to a fast food restaurant and try the new thing on the menu and make a big showy deal about how it's so delicious, it's an explosion of taste, I was supposed to say. You're saying it wasn't delicious. It was delicious. But then there really was an explosion in the restaurant. A recently fired employee had set off the bomb. Although there weren't many casualties from the blast, the interior quickly filled with smoke and flames, and Nanao had done everything he could to get the customers outside. But a famous criminal happened to have been in the restaurant at the same time, and an expert marksman contract killer was targeting him from outside with a high-powered rifle, plunging the scene into even more chaos. But you handled that too, you found out where the sniper was hiding and beat him to a pulp. Another one of your great successes. You told me that job would be simple too. Well, what's hard about eating a hamburger? And it was the same with that last job. Hide some money in a restaurant toilet, that's all, you said. But my socks got soaked and I almost ended up eating a hamburger drowning in mustard. There's no such thing as a simple job. It's dangerous to be so optimistic. Anyway, you still haven't told me anything about this job you want me to do now. I did tell you. Steal someone's suitcase and get off the train. That's it. You didn't tell me where the bag is, or whose it is. You just want me to get on the Shinkansen and you'll contact me with more details later. Doesn't sound to me like it's going to be so simple. And you want me to get off the train with the bag at Weno? That's only a couple minutes after it leaves Tokyo. I won't have enough time. Think of it this way. The more complicated a job is, the more you need to know ahead of time. Special considerations, trial runs, contingency plans. On the other hand, not getting any details beforehand means the job will be simple. Like what if you had a job that was breathe in and out three times? Would you need details beforehand? That's some sideways logic. No thanks. No way this job will be simple like you say. There's no such thing as a simple job. Sure there is. There are plenty of simple jobs. Name one. Mine. Being the go-between is the easiest thing in the world. Well, that's just great for you. Nanao stands waiting on the platform. His phone vibrates and he brings it up to his ear, just as a station announcement comes in over the loudspeaker the Moriaka-bound Hei 8 Komachi train will arrive momentarily on track 20. The male voice reverberates across the platform, making it difficult for Nanao to hear what Maria is saying. Hey, are you listening? Can you hear me? The train's coming. The announcement causes a buzz of movement on the platform. Nanao feels like he's suddenly enveloped in an invisible membrane, blocking off the sounds around him. The autumn wind blows crisply. Wisps of cloud dot the sky, making the clear blue seem to shine. I'll get in touch with you as soon as the info on the suitcase comes in. 
which I guess will be just after the train leaves. Will you call or message? I'll call. Keep your phone handy. You can do that, right? The slender beak of the Shinkansen glides into view, leading the white length of the train into the station. It slows to a stop at the platform. Doors open, passengers exit. The platform overflows with people, filling up empty spaces like flowing water covering dry land. The orderly lines of people waiting to board are scattered. Waves of humans pour down the stairs. Everyone left on the platform reforms their lines, no one speaking, no one looking at anyone else. There is no signal, everyone just falls into place automatically. So bizarre, thinks Nanao. And I'm doing it too. They can't board just yet though, the doors remain closed, presumably for the cleaning staff to give the train a once-over. He lingers on the phone with Maria for a few more seconds before hanging up. I wanted to go in the green car. A voice nearby. He turns to see a woman with heavy makeup and a short man holding a paper bag. The man is moon-faced and bearded. He looks like a kid's toy version of a pirate. The woman wears a sleeveless green dress, showing off her powerful-looking arms. Her skirt is ultra-short. Nanao turns away from the exposed thighs, feeling more uncomfortable than he should, fingering his black-framed glasses. Green car's too expensive. The man scratches his head, then shows the tickets to the woman. But look, we're in car two, row two. Two two, like February the second. Your birthday. That is not my birthday. I wore this green dress cos I thought we were sitting in the green car. The well-built woman wails her displeasure and punches the man in the shoulder, causing him to drop the bag and spill the contents on the ground. A red jacket comes tumbling out, a black dress, a little garment avalanche. Mixed in is something black and furry looking, like a small animal, which makes Nanao start. He gets goosebumps at the sudden appearance of the unidentified creature. The man scoops it up irritably. Nanao realizes it's a hairpiece. More like a full wig. Upon closer inspection the woman in the green dress is not a woman, but a man in makeup. Adam's apple, broad shoulders. Micro skirt and the bare thighs. Hey, buddy, ogle me a little more, why don't you? Nanao flinches, realizing the voice is being directed at him. Yeah, buddy, the bearded man with the toy face says as he takes a step closer, still bent over, get a good look. You want these clothes? I'll sell them to you, 10,000 yen. Well? Show me the cash. He keeps shoveling them back into the bag. I wouldn't buy that stuff for a hundred yen, Nanao wants to say but he knows that will just get him further involved. He sighs. It's happening already. The man presses. Come on, chop chop, I'm sure you've got the money. Sounds like he's shaking down a school kid. Nice black frames, brain. You a. Brain. Nanao does an about face and walks away. Stay focused on the job. His task is simple. Get the suitcase, get off at the next stop. No problem. Nothing's going to go wrong, no surprises. He had been yelled at by a crossdresser and a man with a beard, and that would be it as far as bumps in the road. He tells himself this like performing a ritual, like he's banishing bad energy from the path ahead. A loudspeaker voice thanks the people for waiting. It's a pre-recorded message, but it seems to soothe the stress of standing around. At least it soothes Nanao, even though he hadn't been waiting for all that long. He hears a train attendant call out that the doors will open, and then they do, just like magic. He checks his seat number. Car number 4, row 1, seat D. He remembers what Maria had said when she handed him the ticket, the Hay 8 is all reserved seats, did you know that? I made sure to reserve yours early since you'll need to get off quickly. I figured an aisle seat would be easiest. What's in the suitcase, anyway? I don't know, but
but I'm sure it's nothing that important. Oh you're sure? You really expect me to believe that you don't know what's in it? I'm telling you, I don't. You wanted me to ask and piss off the client? What if it's something contraband? Contraband, like what? Like a dead body, or a stash of money, or illegal drugs, or a swarm of insects. A swarm of insects would be scary. The other three would be worse. Is the bag hot? I couldn't rightly say. It's hot, isn't it? Nanao was starting to lose his temper. However bad what's in the suitcase is, all you have to do is carry it. No problem. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, fine, how about you carry it? No way. Too risky. Nanao eases into his seat at the end of car number four. A fair number of seats are empty. He waits for the train to depart, keeping his phone in his hand and his eyes on his phone. Nothing yet from Maria. They'll arrive at Weno Station just minutes after pulling away from Tokyo Station. He'll have very little time to steal the bag. This concerns him. The automatic door whispers open and someone enters the car. Just as this is happening Nanao tries to adjust his crossed legs and bumps his knee into the paper bag in the hands of the man who enters. The man glares. He looks decidedly unwholesome, stubble uneven, face pallid, eyes sunken. Nanao quickly apologizes. Sorry about that. Strictly speaking it was the man who had bumped into him, and should have been the one to apologize, but Nanao doesn't mind. He wants to avoid any friction. He'll make as many apologies as he has to to avoid friction. The man angrily starts to move on. But Nanao notices a hole torn in the paper bag, probably from when it hit. His leg. Hey, your bag is torn. Mind your own business. The man shuffles off. Nanao takes off the lightweight leather waist pack he wears to check his ticket once more. The pack is stuffed with items, pen and notepad, metal wire, a lighter, pills, a compass and a powerful horseshoe magnet, a roll of heavy-duty tape. There are three digital wristwatches with alarms. He's found alarms to be useful in all sorts of situations. Maria makes fun of him, calls him a walking Swiss army knife, but it's all just stuff he had in the kitchen or bought at a convenience store. Except for the steroid paste and blood clotting cream, in case he gets burnt or cut. A man who gets no love from Lady Luck has no choice but to be prepared. That's why Nanao always brings his bag of tricks. He fishes the Shinkansen ticket out of where it was stuffed in the waste pack. The printing on the ticket makes him do a double take, it's a ticket. From Tokyo all the way to Morioka. Why Morioka? Just as he thinks this, his phone rings. He answers immediately and hears Maria's voice. Okay, here you go. It's between cars three and four. There's a luggage storage space, and a black suitcase there. Some kind of sticker near the handle. The person the bag belongs to is in car three, so once you get the bag head in the other direction and get off as soon as you can. Got it. He pauses for a moment. I just noticed something though. I'm supposed to get off at Weno, but for some reason my ticket goes to Morioka. No reason in particular. For a job like this it just made good sense to get you a ticket till the end of the line. Just in case anything happens. Nanao gets a little louder. So you do think something's going to happen. It's just in case. Don't get all worked up about it. Try smiling. What's that old saying, a smile is a door for good fortune. I'd look pretty weird sitting here smiling all by myself. He hangs up. The train starts moving. Nanao stands and heads to the door behind him. Five minutes till Weno. Cutting it close. Luckily, he finds the luggage storage immediately and locates the black bag with no problem. It's mid-sized, fitted with wheels. Sticker by the handle. It's hard-sided, though he can't tell what material it's made from. 
he pulls it off the rack as quietly as he can. Simple job, Maria had said in her honeyed voice. Simple so far. He checks the time. Four minutes until arrival at Weno Station. Come on, come on. Nanao returns to car four with the suitcase, taking regular, even steps. No one seems to be paying him any attention. He passes through car four, then car five, steps into the gangway between five and six. Then he stops and exhales with relief. He was worried that there might be something blocking the door, some kids dozing in front of it or doing their makeup, just taking up space, and when they caught Nanao looking at them they'd say what's your problem or fling some other abuse at him and get in his face, or there might be some couple having a lover's spat and they would turn to him and demand to know whose side he's on, suck him into their nonsense, whatever it was. He was certain there would be something to trip him up. But no one is by the door, so he feels relieved. All there is left to do is pull into Weno and get off the train. Exit the station and call Maria. He can. Already hear her poking fun at him, see how simple that was, she'll say, and. Though he doesn't love being teased, he'll take that over serious trouble any day. The outside goes suddenly dark as the train begins to slope underground, signaling the imminent arrival at Weno's subterranean platform. Nanao squeezes the suitcase handle and checks his watch, though he has no reason to. He catches his reflection in the window on the door. Even he has to admit, he looks like the sort of guy who has no good luck, no good fortune, no good mojo whatsoever. Ex-girlfriends had complained to him, since we started dating, I keep losing my wallet, I always seem to be messing things up when I'm with you, my skin just keeps getting worse. He had protested that none of that could possibly be his fault, but somehow he knew it probably was. Like his bad luck had rubbed off on them. The high-pitched hum of the train on the track starts to ease off. The doors will be opening on the left. The view outside brightens, and suddenly... The station appears, like stumbling on a futuristic city inside a cave. People. Here and there on the platform, already receding. Stairwells and benches and digital displays disappear to the left. Nanao stares at the glass, making sure no one is coming up from behind. If the bag's owner or anyone were to challenge him, things could get complicated. The train starts to drop speed. It makes him think of the one time he played roulette in a casino. The way the wheel slowed seemed to lend great significance to each slot the ball might come to rest. He gets the same impression as the Shinkansen pulls in, like it's choosing where to stop, which car in front of which passenger, lazily shedding speed, oh who to pick who to pick. And then, it stops. A man stands on the other side of Nanao's door. Smallish, wearing a flat cap that makes him look like a private eye from a kid's story. The door doesn't open right away. There's a long moment, like holding your breath underwater. Nanao and the man are now standing opposite each other, with the window between them. Nanao frowns. I know a guy with the same gloomy face, same stupid detective hat. The man he's thinking of is in the same line. Of work, back alley stuff, dangerous business. He's got some run of themo name, but he talks big, always making outrageous claims about his exploits or badmouthing everyone else. People call him the wolf. Not because he's heroic and solitary like a lone wolf. More like he's the bullshit wolf that the boy keeps crying about. But he doesn't seem to mind the derisive name, proudly declaring that it was given to him by Mr. Terahara. Terahara was busy steering the whole underworld and it seems hard to believe he would waste time coming up with a nickname, but the wolf at least says it went down that way. The wolf has a lot of tall tales. Like one he once told Nanao when they happened to be in the same bar. You know that guy, the suicide guy, who knocks off politicians and bureaucrats and makes it look like a suicide? Calls himself the whale or the orca or something, big guy. People are saying they don't see him around no more. Know why? Cause I did him. 
What do you mean, I did him? It was a job, you know. I killed the whale. The suicide specialist who went by the whale had in fact suddenly gone missing, and people in the business were talking about it. Some said the killer was one of them, others said he was in a horrible accident, some even said the whale's body had been acquired at a high price by a politician with a grudge who hung the corpse up in his house as decoration. But whatever the truth, one thing was clear, for a big job like that, no one would ever hire the wolf, who only worked as bag man or to rough up girls or civilians. Nanao had always done the best he could to avoid dealing with the wolf. The more he looked at the guy the more he wanted to punch him in the face, which he knew would only cause trouble. And he was right to be concerned about his ability to control himself, because one time Nanao actually had attacked the wolf. He was walking down a back street in the bar district when he chanced. Upon the wolf, who was about to beat up three kids who couldn't have been. Older than ten. What do you think you're doing? Nanao asked. These little kids were making fun of me. I'm gonna give them some medicine. And then he balled up his fist and hit one of the petrified kids across the face. Blood surged into Nanao's head. He knocked the wolf down and kicked him in the back of the skull. Maria heard about the incident and made sure to get her jabs in. Protecting the children, you're a real sweetheart. It's not because I'm nice. It was something to do with the image of a frightened kid, defenseless, begging for someone to save them. When kids are in trouble, I can't help myself. Oh, you mean your trauma? So on trend. That's not fair, it's more complicated than a buzzword. The trauma boom is over, she said with some disdain. He tried to explain that it wasn't a boom. Even though the term trauma had become a cliché and suddenly everyone's traumatized by something, people still had to cope with the pain of their past. Anyway, she added, the wolf, he's always dealt with kids and animals. Things weaker than him. Really, he's the worst. As soon as he thinks he's in any danger he starts mouthing off about Terahara, I've got Terahara's protection, I'll tell Mr. Terahara. Terahara's dead. I heard that when Terahara died, the wolf cried so much he got dehydrated. What a moron. So, in the end, you gave him the medicine. Being kicked in the head by Nanao hurt the wolf's pride as much as his body. He fumed, eyes bleary, promising that Nanao would be sorry next time they met, and then ran off. That was the last time they had seen one another. The Shinkansen doors open. Nanao is about to get off, suitcase in hand. He's now face to face with the man in the flat cap, who looks exactly like the wolf, an unbelievable likeness really, and then the man points at him, hey, you, and he realizes that of course it is the wolf and none other. Nanao hastily tries to get off but the wolf's face is a mask of grim. Determination as he barrels forward, forcing his way onto the train and Knocking Nanao backwards. Well, imagine my luck meeting you here, says the wolf with glee. What a treat. His nostrils are flaring eagerly. Some other time. I'm getting off. Nanao keeps his voice low, worried that speaking loudly might attract attention from the bag's owner. Think I'm gonna let you get away? I've got a score to settle with you, buddy. Settle it with me later. I'm working. Or better yet, don't settle it at all, I forgive you your debts. No time for this, and just as the thought flashes through Nanao's mind the doors swish closed. The Shinkansen pulls away, heedless of Nanao's predicament. He hears Maria's voice somewhere, see what a simple job this is. Nanao wants to scream with frustration. The job is going south, just like he knew it would. The Prince. He opens the tray table and sets his water bottle down, then opens a packet of chocolates and pops one in his mouth. The train leaves Weno and returns to the world above. A few clouds float in the sky, but mostly it's just clear blue. The sky's as sunny as I am, he thinks. He sees a driving range, with its backstop like a giant green mosquito net. 
It flows off to the left and the school slides into view, a string of concrete rectangles, uniformed students hanging around the windows. He can't tell if they're his age or a little older, and Satoshi, the Prince Aji spends a moment trying to figure it out, but almost immediately decides that it doesn't matter. They're all the same. Whether it's school kids like him or adults, everyone's all the same. All so predictable. He turns to Kimura sitting next to him. This man is a prime example of how disappointingly boring humans are. At first he was thrashing around, even though he was all taped up and couldn't go anywhere. The prince pulled the gun he had taken from him, holding it close between them so no one else could see. Calm down, this'll only be for a little while. I'm telling you, if you don't listen to the story until the end, Mr. Kimura, you'll wish you had. That had settled him down. Now the prince asks, I've been wondering, didn't you at any point think that something felt strange? Me riding the Shinkansen all by myself, and you being able to find out where I was sitting so easily. It never occurred to you that it was a trap. You put that intel out there. Well, I knew you were looking for me. I was looking for you because you disappeared. Lying low, not showing up at your school. I'm not hiding. I couldn't go to school, my whole year is on sick leave. It's true. Even though there was still a while till winter, flu had broken out in his class and they were told to all stay home for a week. The epidemic showed no signs of slowing down in the following week, and they were told to stay home again. The teachers didn't stop to consider how the flu spreads or its gestation period, or what percentage of cases become severe, no, they just had an automatic system where if a certain number of kids are off sick then. The whole class has to stay home. The prince thought it was ridiculous. Just. Blindly following a set of rules to avoid assuming any responsibility, avoid taking any risks. Enacting sick leave without a moment's hesitation, the teachers all seemed like fools to him, fools who had shut off their brains. Zero consideration, zero analysis, zero initiative. Do you know what I've been doing while school's been out? Don't care. I was finding out about you, Mr. Kimura. I figured you must be pretty mad at me. I'm not mad. Really? I'm a whole lot fucking worse than mad. Kimura spits the words like spitting out blood, causing a smile to crease the prince's cheeks. People who can't control their emotions are the easiest to handle. Well, anyway, I knew you wanted to get me. I figured you'd look for me and come at me when you found me. So I knew it would be dangerous for me to stay at home, and since you were coming for me, I figured I'd find out everything I could about you. You know, when you want to go after. Someone, or bring someone down, or use someone, the very first thing you have to do is gather information on them. Start with their family, their job, their habits, their hobbies, that'll tell you what you need to know. Same way the tax bureau does it. What kind of school kid looks up to the tax bureau? You're the fucking worst. Kimura sneers. What can a kid find out, anyway? The prince furrows his brow in disappointment. This man isn't taking him seriously. He's being fooled by age and appearance, underestimating his enemy. If you pay, you can get information. What, did you break open your piggy bank? The prince is utterly disenchanted. Or it might not be money. Maybe there's a man who likes schoolgirls. Says he's willing to play private eye if he gets to feel up a naked teenager. He might find out that your wife left you, that you got divorced and live alone with your cute little kid, that you're alcohol dependent, that kind of thing. And maybe I have some friends, girls, who wouldn't mind taking their clothes off if I asked them to. You'd make a schoolgirl get with an adult. Force some insecure girl into doing it. I'm just saying for example. Don't get so excited. I'm just saying money isn't everything. People have all kinds of desires and do things for all kinds of reasons. It's just about leverage. Push the right button in the right way and even a school kid can make anyone do anything. 
And you know, sexual desire is the easiest button to push. The prince makes sure to sound mocking. The more emotional someone gets, the easier they are to control. But I was impressed when I heard about the dangerous stuff you used to be involved in. Tell me, Mr. Kimura, have you ever killed anyone? The prince drops his eyes to the gun in his hand, still pointed at Kimura. I mean, you had this. Really cool. This thing you had on the end is so the gun doesn't make any noise, right? Really professional. He holds up the silencer, now. Removed. I was so scared I almost cried, he says in a dramatic sing-song. But of course it isn't true. If he's about to cry it's from the effort of holding in his laughter. So you were just waiting for me here. I heard you were looking for me so I spread around that I'd be on this Shinkansen. You hired someone to find out where I was, right? An old acquaintance. From when you were still in the business. And he didn't think it was weird that you were looking for a teenage boy. At first he did. He said, I didn't know you were into that. But when I told him my story he got heated, wanted me to find you. Nobody's gonna do that to your boy and get away with it, he said. But in the end he betrayed you. I found out he was asking around about me so I made him a counteroffer so he'd tell you the information I wanted you to have. Bullshit. Once he found out he could do whatever he wanted to a teenage girl he started breathing all heavy. I thought to myself, are all adults this way? The prince loves this, scratching the membrane of people's feelings, his words like claws. It's easy to build up your body, but developing emotional. Resistance is tough. Even when you think you're calm, it's almost impossible. Not to react to the pinprick of malevolence. I didn't know he was into that. You shouldn't trust old acquaintances, Mr. Kimura. Doesn't matter what you think they owe you, they'll eventually forget about it. Our trust-based society is long gone, if it ever even existed in the first place. But still, you actually showed up. I couldn't believe it. You're just such a trusting fellow. Hey, I've been meaning to ask, how's your son doing? He devours another chocolate. How the fuck do you think? Keep it down, Mr. Kimura. If someone comes over here you'll be in trouble. You've got a gun and everything. The prince whispers theatrically, stay cool. You're the one holding the gun. The prince is continually disappointed with how Kimura never once sets foot outside of the bounds of predictability. I'll just say I managed to wrestle the gun away from you. And what about tying me up? That doesn't matter. You're an ethanol addict, a former security guard, currently unemployed, and I'm a typical school student. Whose side do you think they'll take? The hell is ethanol? I'm addicted to alcohol. Ethanol is alcohol, it's what makes drinks alcoholic. You know, I have to say I'm impressed that you managed to quit drinking. I'm serious, that's hard. Did something happen that helped you quit? Like your kid almost dying. Kimura glares with fanatic malice. Anyway, I'll ask again, how's your cute little kid doing? What's his name? Can't remember his name but I know he likes rooftops. But he should be careful. When little kids go to high places by themselves they sometimes fall. The railings on the roofs of department stores aren't always solid, and kids always find the dangerous spots. Kimura looks like he's about to start shouting. Quiet, Mr. Kimura, or you'll be sorry. The prince turns to look out the window, just as a Tokyo-bound Shinkansen hurdles past in the opposite direction, so fast it's nothing but a blur. The whole train trembles. He feels a quiet thrill at the overwhelming speed and force. Against a giant metal object traveling at more than 200 kilometers an hour, a human being would be powerless. Imagine putting someone down in front of an oncoming Shinkansen, they'd be splattered to bits. The overwhelming power differential fascinates him. And I'm just as dangerous. I may not be able to move at 200 kilometers an hour, but I can destroy people just the same. A smile appears, unbidden. 
the prince's friends had helped him take Kimura's son out on the department store roof. Strictly speaking, they were the prince's classmates who followed his orders. The six-year-old boy was frightened, frightened because he had never encountered cruelty before. Hey look, over there by the railing, look down from there. You don't have to be scared, it's safe. He had said it with a warm smile, so the little boy believed him. It's okay. I won't fall. He pushed him, and it felt intensely good. Kimura scowls. Weren't you worried, sitting here, that I might get the drop on you? Worried? You know what kind of work I used to do. You had to figure I'd have a gun. If the timing worked out differently I might have killed you. I wonder. The prince is actually wondering. He hadn't felt the least bit of fear. He was more keyed up with anticipation, waiting to see if things would play out as he was betting. I didn't think you'd shoot me or stab me right away. Why not? With the way you must feel about me, getting it over with so quickly wouldn't be enough. He shrugs. I didn't think you'd be satisfied if you just snuck up on me and killed me. You'd want to scare me, threaten me, make me cry, hear me apologize, right? Kimura neither affirms nor denies. Adults always keep their mouths shut, thinks the prince, when I'm right. Anyway, I was guessing I could get you first, and he pulls the homemade taser from his backpack. A regular fucking electrician. The prince savors the last reverberation from the passing Shinkansen, then turns back to face Kimura. Mr. Kimura, when you were still in the business, how many people did you kill? Kimura's bloodshot eyes narrow to pinpoints. Ah, he may be tied up but he's about ready to come at me anyway. I've killed people, the prince tells him. The first time was when I was ten. Just one person. In the three years since then, nine more. Ten total. Is your number higher than that? Or lower? Kimura looks taken aback. The prince is once again let down by his reaction. It takes so little to throw this guy off. But I should clarify, I only killed one person myself. The hell does that mean? It's stupid to put yourself at risk. Right? I want to make sure you don't mistake me for someone dumb enough to do that. Kimura twists up his face. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Well, the first one, begins the prince. Back when he was in school, after coming home from class he went out again, rode his bike to the big bookstore to buy a book he wanted. On the way home he came to a main road and stopped his bike at the crossing, waiting for the signal to change. Next to him was a man in a sweater wearing headphones and staring at his phone, but no one else was around. There was barely any traffic either, the road was so quiet that it was easy to hear the music seeping out of the man's headphones. There wasn't any deep reason why he started pedaling out when the light was still red. He just thought that it was taking a long time to turn green and there didn't seem to be any cars so there was no point in dutifully waiting. For the light to change. He nudged his bike out into the road and started. Across. A moment later there was a cacophony behind him, screeching brakes, and the sound of impact, although actually the thud of the collision came first and the grating squeal of the brakes afterwards. He turned to look and saw a black minivan stopped in the middle of the road, a bearded man clambering out of the driver's seat. The man in the sweater was on the ground, his phone smashed to bits. The prince wondered for just a moment why the man would have crossed when a car was coming, but he immediately pieced together a likely scenario, he himself had biked across, and the man just assumed that the light had turned green. Headphones in, eyes glued to his phone, he must have sensed the prince's bicycle move out into the road and just followed along reflexively. And then he got mowed down by a minivan. The sudden appearance of the van was more surprising to him than the man's death, given how deserted the road had seemed, but in any case the man was dead. Even from across the street, the prince could see that he wasn't breathing. The cord from the headphones trailed out like a line of blood. I learned two things from that. What? 
Kimura growls. That you should always obey traffic signals. The first was that if you're careful how you do it, you can get away with killing someone. The whole episode was handled like a typical traffic accident. No one even paid any attention to me. Guess not. The second thing was that even though it was my fault that someone died, I didn't feel bad at all. Lucky you. That's when it started. When I got interested in killing. What it's like to kill someone, how someone reacts when you're killing them, that kind of thing. You wanted to try out the ultimate sin, was that it? Did you think you were special because you could imagine yourself doing something so awful that the thought never enters into normal people's minds? Listen, everyone has those thoughts, even if they don't do anything about it. Why is it wrong to kill people, or how can everyone be so calm when every living thing is? Going to die, oh, life is so empty. Everyone thinks this stuff. It's like standard. Teenage angst. Why is it wrong to kill people? The prince tries asking. He isn't being cynical or making a joke, he actually wants to know the answer. He wants to meet an adult who can give him a satisfying answer. He knows that Kimura won't be the one. He can imagine Kimura's unconsidered position, killing someone is no problem, long as it isn't me or my family, otherwise, who? Cares. Then Kimura gives a stubbly grin. I don't think there's anything wrong with killing. I mean, as long as we're not talking about killing me or my family. But otherwise, sure, have a blast, kill and be killed. The prince sighs heavily. Impressed? No, just disappointed at such a predictable answer. Anyway, as I was saying, after that episode one made up my mind to experiment. First I wanted to kill someone a little more directly. And that was the person you did yourself. Exactly. So when you pushed Wataru off the roof, was that an experiment too? Kimura's voice is quiet but tight, dripping venom. No, no. Your kid must have wanted to play with us or something. We told him to leave us alone but he wouldn't. We were exchanging trading cards in the car park on the department store roof. It's dangerous up here, we said, don't run around, but he toddled off towards the stairwell. Before we knew what was happening he fell. You and your friends pushed him. A six-year-old? From the roof? The prince brings his fingertips to his open mouth in a cheesy gesture of fake shock. We could never do something so horrible. The thought would never even cross my mind. Adults think the scariest things. I'll fucking kill you. Kimura's hands and feet are bound but that doesn't stop him from lurching towards the prince, snapping his jaws. Mr. Kimura, stop. The prince holds his hands out in front of him. What? I'm about to say is important, so listen carefully. It could mean your son's life. Just settle down for a minute. He sounds completely calm. Kimura is all worked up, nostrils flaring with rage, but the mention of his son's life stops him, and he falls back into the seat. Then the carriage door opens behind them. It must be the snack trolley, because they hear someone say excuse me, followed by the sounds of a transaction. Kimura twists round to look. Don't try anything funny with the carriage attendant, mister. Anything funny? You mean like ask her on a date? I mean like asking her for help. Just try and stop me. That would defeat the whole point. Defeat what point? What fucking point? That it would be so easy to open your mouth and ask for help, but you can't. I want you to feel that powerlessness. If I physically forced you to keep your mouth shut, it would defeat the purpose. I want you to feel what it's. Like not to do anything even when you could. I want to see you squirm. Kimura's eyes take on a different cast, shift from anger to a mix of disgust and fear, as if he had just discovered some new horrible insect. He forces a laugh to cover his discomfiture. Sorry, but the more you tell me I can't, the more likely I am to try. That's just the way I am. 
always have been. So when the girl comes by with the cart I'm gonna throw myself at her, I'll scream and shout, do something about this school kid. If you're saying you don't want me to, then I definitely will. How is this middle-aged man so stubborn? Even with arms and legs bound, even with his weapon taken from him, even with the power dynamic between us made crystal clear, how is it he can still talk down to me? The only possible explanation is that it's because he's older than I am. He's lived longer than me, that's all. The prince can't help but feel sorry for Kimura. And where have his thousands of wasted days got him? I'll put this as plainly as I can, Mr. Kimura, so that you can understand. If you don't follow my instructions, or if something happens to me, your little son in the hospital will be in trouble. Kimura is silent. The prince feels a mix of satisfaction and dejection. He tries to focus on the pleasure of watching someone at a complete loss. I have someone standing by near the hospital in Tokyo. The hospital where your son is, understand? Near means where? Maybe it means inside the hospital. All that matters is that he's close enough to do the job as soon as he needs to. The job. If he can't get in touch with me, he'll do it. Kimura's anguish shows plain on his face. What do you mean, if he can't get in touch? He's going to call at the time we're supposed to be pulling into each station, Omiya, Sendai, then Moriaka. To see if I'm okay. If I don't answer, if he figures that something's wrong. Who is it? one of your friends. No, no. Like I said before, people do things for all different reasons. Some. Like girls, some want money. Believe it or not, there are grown-ups whose sense of right and wrong is totally skewed, and they'll do pretty much anything. So what's your guy gonna do? He apparently used to work for a medical equipment company. It wouldn't be hard for him to do something to mess up the machine your son is hooked up to. Wouldn't be hard, my ass. He wouldn't be able to do anything. Well, we won't know until he tries. Like I said, he's waiting somewhere very close to the hospital. Waiting for the signal. All I have to do is call him and give him the green light, and he'll do it. And if he calls me, even if it's not one of the scheduled calls at each station, and it rings more than ten times without me answering, that's a green light too. If that happens, my guy will go to the hospital and start messing with your son's respirator. Some set of rules. Basically all green lights. What if we're somewhere your phone gets no service? They've been installing antennas in train tunnels so I don't think it will. Affect my service. But you're probably better off praying that it doesn't, just. In case. Anyway, if you try anything funny, I just won't pick up when my guy calls. Maybe I'll get off at Omiya, go to the movies, turn my phone off for a couple of hours. By the time I get out of the cinema something terrible will have happened to your son's life support machine. You're full of shit. Kimura stares daggers. I am not full of shit. I'm always deadly serious. I think maybe you're the one who's full of shit. Kimura's flaring nostrils show that he's on the brink of an explosion, but it finally seems to dawn on him that there's nothing he can do. His rigid body goes slack, he slumps back in the seat. The attendant is pushing the snack trolley by and the prince makes a point to stop her and buy more chocolates. Somehow she doesn't notice that Kimura's hands and feet are bound. Watching Kimura sitting next to him with mouth clamped shut and face red with rage feels exquisite. You should be paying attention to my phone, Mr. Kimura. If I get a call. And it rings ten times, you won't be happy about what happens. Fruit. Tangerine, what do we do? Lemon looks down at little Manejishi, who sits their eyes closed, not moving. The mouth hangs open in a stupid gape, like he's making fun of them. It makes Lemon feel uncomfortable. What can we do? Tangerine is rubbing his cheeks busily. Seeing Tangerine off balance for a change is a slight comfort to Lemon. This is all because you let him out of your sight. Why did you leave the kid alone? 
I had to. You were on my case about the bag so I wanted to go and check up on it. What did you expect me to do, after giving me such a hard time? The bag was stolen for sure. Tangerine sighs. Everything with you is sloppy, your words, your actions, your way of thinking. You're such a typical bee, lemon snorts. Don't try to sum me up by my blood type. There's no scientific proof for that. Talking seriously about that stuff just makes you sound stupid. If it were true, that would make you organized and precise just because you're an A. I am organized and precise, and when I do a job I do it nice and neat. Big talk. Listen, my failures are my own. They have nothing to do with my blood type. Yeah, you're right, Tangerine says brightly. Your failures come down to your character and your lack of judgment. Tangerine is getting self-conscious standing in the aisle, so he leans down and hoists little Manejishi's body over to the window seat, propping it up against the window with head tipped slightly forward. Guess we just have to make it look like he's sleeping, for now. Tangerine takes the middle seat, and Lemon eases down into the aisle seat muttering darkly. Who the fuck did this? How did he even die? Tangerine starts feeling around the body. There are no obvious cuts, no blood. He opens the kid's mouth wide and peers inside. He doesn't want to. Look too closely, though, in case there's something poisonous in there. No obvious marks on the body. Poison. Could be. Or maybe an allergic reaction and he went into shock. What could he have been allergic to? Don't know. I'm not the creator of allergies, remember? Hey, it could be that all of this was too much for him, getting kidnapped then rescued, no sleep, totally exhausted, and his heart just gave out. Is that medically possible? Lemon, have you ever seen me reading a medical textbook? You're always reading something. Tangerine does take a book with him wherever he goes, even on jobs, and starts reading whenever there's any downtime. I like fiction, not medical books. How should I know if there are medically established cases of people's hearts giving out? Lemon pulls at his hair. But what are we going to do? Just show up in Morioka and go to Manejishi, sorry, sir, we rescued your son but he died on the Shinkansen. Don't forget that the ransom money was stolen too. If I were Manejishi I'd be pretty angry. I would be too. Furious. But it's like, all he did was sit around in his villa. They didn't know for certain, but there was a rumor that Manejishi was on holiday with his mistress and their illegitimate daughter. There's a whole fiasco with his son getting kidnapped and all but he goes on a family trip with his girlfriend. It's bullshit. The little girl's still in school, supposed to be really cute. And then you have his heir, this rich kid here. A lightweight, a nobody. It's not hard to guess which one he loves more. Tangerine doesn't sound like he's making a joke. Well, now he's a lightweight nobody who's also dead. But hey, maybe this works out for Manejishi and he'll go easy on us. No way. Say you have a car that you don't really like, if someone else wrecks it you'd still be pissed off. And there's the matter of his reputation. Lemon looks like he's about to wail about the tough spot they're in, so Tangerine quickly holds up a finger and says Itch, we'll just have to figure something out. Figuring things out is your job. Moron. Lemon starts to move around, checking the area by the window next to the body, checking the trays attached to the seats in front of them, flipping through the magazines in the seat back pockets. What are you doing? Thought there might be some kind of clue. But there's nothing. Stupid rich kid. Clue. Like maybe he wrote the killer's name in blood or something like that. That could happen, right? It could happen if this were a murder mystery novel. Not in real life. I guess you're right. Lemon puts the magazine back despondently, but. Still pokes and prods the seat and walls around the corpse. I doubt he had time to leave any kind of clues before he died. There isn't even any blood, how could he have written a message in blood? 
Lemon looks irritated by Tangerine's logic. Well, dying like this doesn't help the people trying to solve the case at all. Just for future reference, Tangerine, if you think someone's about to kill you, make sure you leave behind some useful clues. What kind of clues would you like me to leave? Like the identity of the killer, or the truth or something. At the very least make it clear whether it was murder or suicide or an accident. Otherwise it'll be a pain in the ass for me. If I go, it won't be suicide, Tangerine proclaims in no uncertain terms. I like Virginia Woolf and Mishima, but suicide doesn't sit right with me. Virginia who? Those trains you're always talking about are much harder to keep straight than books. Why don't you try reading one of the books I recommend to you? I've never been into books, not even when I was a kid. You know how long it takes me to finish a book. And what about you, you never even try to remember all the Thomas and Friends characters, no matter how many times I tell you. You don't even know which one Percy is. Which one is Percy again? Lemon clears his throat. Percival is a small, green engine. He is rather cheeky and loves to play tricks, though he is very serious when it comes to his work. He often pulls pranks on his friends, but is also somewhat gullible. I always wonder how you can memorize all these. It's on the trading card from the toy model. Pretty cool, huh? It's a simple explanation, but it also has depth. Percy often pulls pranks on his friends, but is also somewhat gullible, see? It's kind of touching. Makes me get a little emotional, even. I bet your books don't have the same kind of depth. Just try reading something and see. Start with, I don't know, to the lighthouse. Waddle it tell me. How insignificant we all are, how we're all just a single existence among the countless other existences. It'll make you feel how small you are, how you're lost in the limitless expanse of the ocean of time, swallowed by the waves. It's powerful stuff. We perished, each alone. The hell does that mean? It's a line from one of the characters in the novel. It means that everyone dies, and they're alone when they do. Lemon sneers. I'm not gonna die. You'll die, and you'll die alone. Even if I do die, I'll come back. Yeah, it's like you to be so stubborn. But I'm going to die someday. Alone. And I'm telling you, when you do, leave me some kind of clue. Okay, okay. If by some chance it looks like I'm about to be killed, I'll do my best to leave you a message. When you're writing the killer's name in blood, do it clearly, make it legible, okay? No initials or mysterious abbreviations. I'm not going to write anything in blood. Tangerine stops to think for a moment. Here, how about this? Say I have a chance to talk to the killer before he does me, I'll give him a message. A message? I'll say something that'll stick with him. Like, tell Lemon the key he's looking for is at the baggage check at Tokyo Station, something like that. I'm not looking for any key. Doesn't matter. I'll say something that will pique the killer's curiosity. I bet eventually he'd show up and pretend not to know you and ask politely if you're looking for a key. Or maybe he'd just go to the baggage check at Tokyo Station. Something that'll interest him, huh? And if you ever meet someone like that, you'll know that's the person. Who killed me? Or at least they have something to do with it. That's a pretty damn unclear message. Well, I'm not going to give the killer a message that's easy to understand, am I? But hey. Lemon suddenly looks serious. I'm not gonna die easy. No, I guess you won't. And if you do, you're stubborn enough to come back. You too, Tangerine. You and me, if we die, we'll come back for sure. Like trees bearing fruit every year. We'll both be back. The Shinkansen sways gently as it begins to dip underground, signaling the approach to Weno. The view out the window goes dark and the scene inside the train appears reflected in the glass. Lemon pulls a magazine from the pocket in the seat back in front of him and begins to read. Hey, 
Tangerine says almost immediately, this isn't the time to start pleasure reading. I've already said it a bunch of times. Thinking is your job. Leave the machi sales to the machi salesman, right? If I'm the machi salesman, what's that make you? The train begins to slow. First there are lamps in the tunnel, then suddenly they're in a brightly lit space. The platform appears. Tangerine stands up. Toilet. Lemon asks. Let's go. Tangerine tries to push past his partner. Where are we going? Lemon doesn't understand what's happening, but he sees the fearsome look on Tangerine's face and stands up to go with him. Are we getting off? Don't you think taking the Shinkansen just one stop a bit extravagant? The automatic door opens onto the gangway. No one else there. The platform glides by out the doors on the left-hand side. Exactly. Lemon furrows his brow quizzically. Getting on the Shinkansen at Tokyo and getting off at Weno is extravagant. You could just take a local train. But someone might be getting off after all. Who? Someone who stole a bag on the Shinkansen and wants to get away as soon as possible. Lemon nods in dawning comprehension. Oh, I get it. He steps closer to the door and taps the window with his finger. If someone gets off at Weno, that's the thief. It'll be easy to tell if the person is carrying our suitcase, but there's a chance they stuffed it inside another bag. Still, it'd have to be a pretty big bag. Either way, anyone who gets off here is our prime suspect. If you see someone, go after them. Me? Who else am I talking to? Leave the machi sales to the machi salesman, right? You might never have sold machi, or used your head for that matter, but I know you've chased down thieves. The brakes sing as the train slows to an almost complete stop. Lemon stares at the platform, suddenly concerned. What do I do if there's more than one? Guess you'll have to go after whoever looks more suspicious, Tangerine says curtly. What if there's more than one person who looks suspicious? These days everybody looks suspicious, damn it. The train stops and the door opens. Tangerine steps onto the platform with Lemon close behind. They stand just outside the train, peering down the length of it to see if anyone is getting off. It's a straight shot all the way down the platform, as long as they pay close attention it should be easy enough to tell if someone is exiting the train. Lemon and Tangerine both have sharp eyes. If something's moving, even if it's far away, they'll notice. No one gets off. They do see a guy two or three cars up standing right in front of the door. To car five or six and pointing inside, someone they don't recognize, wearing. A flat cap, but other than that there's nothing particularly noteworthy. The train stretches into the distance, and Tangerine realizes he can't see all the way to the end after all. It's hard to tell what's going on at the front, he grumbles. I doubt the thief is in any of those cars. Everything past car 11 is the Kamachi, headed for Akita. We're in the Hay 8. The Kamachi is connected to our train for now, but there's no passing between the two. Well, that's confusing. Trains can be a pain in the ass. Hey, Tangerine, it's not nice to say something's a pain in the ass. Music sounds on the platform, signaling the train's departure. A handful of people get on, but no one gets off. What do we do? Asks Lemon. Nothing we can do, says Tangerine, but get back on the train. No sooner do they get back on than the Shinkansen starts to move, up the gradual slope, making for the light of day. A tinkling version of the departure music plays inside the train as well. Lemon whistles along as he returns to his seat, but his mood darkens as soon as he sees little Manejishi propped up against the window. It's like suddenly being reminded of an unpleasant task that needs to be taken care of, which makes sense, because this whole thing needs to be taken care of, and it's most certainly unpleasant. Well, here we are again. Lemon sits back down in the aisle seat and crosses his legs. What do we do now? 
His reliance on the Machi salesman is like an article of faith. Chances are the thief is still on the train. Do I have any bullets left? Lemon pulls his gun out of the shoulder holster concealed under his jacket. He had used a lot of ammo rescuing the rich kid. Only got one clip. Tangerine checks his piece too. Same here. Almost out. I didn't think I'd need any for the train. Should have known better. Then he reaches into a pocket and pulls out a different gun. I do have this, he says somewhat sheepishly. Where'd you get that? One of the guys holding the kid had it. I thought it was cute so I took it. Cute? Guns aren't cute. It's not like they have Thomas stickers on them. Thomas and Friends is for kids. Cute stuff and gun stuff are totally separate. No, not that kind of cute, Tangerine says with a smirk. It's rigged. It won't shoot bullets. Look. He turns the muzzle towards Lemon, who jerks his face away. Hey, watch it. That's dangerous. No, I'm telling you, this thing won't shoot. It looks like a normal gun but the barrel's stopped up. It's an exploding gun. It shoots explosives. The thought of explosions reminds Lemon about a movie he saw a while back, Runaway Train. The movie didn't particularly interest him, but he liked watching the trains and locomotives in it. That got him excited, the sound of the wheels clacking, the movement of the rods, the muscular plume of smoke billowing from the smokestack, the screech of the rails, and most of all the overwhelming force of the steel train barreling along. He doesn't remember the plot of Runaway Train, but he can still picture the main character standing bravely on top of a train raging. Through a snow's cape. That guy must have loved trains too. No, no, if you try to shoot it, it explodes. Why would you need something like that? It's a trap. The guy who had it really looked like he wanted me to take it off him. Which I did, but if I'd pulled the trigger, bang, it would have gone off in my hand and he'd have had the last laugh. Good thing you noticed. How come you're so careful? I'm not careful, you're just careless. If there's a button you push it, if there's a string dangling you pull it. You get a mysterious envelope in the mail and you open it and are infected with anthrax. If you say so. Lemon unfolds his legs and stands up, looks down at Tangerine. I'll go and have a look, he says, gesturing towards the front of the train with his chin, see if there's anyone suspicious looking. Whoever has our bag must be here somewhere. We've got some time before we get to Omiya. Whoever has it might have hidden it somewhere and is sitting there trying to be casual. Anyone who looks funny, check them out. I know. But don't look like you're trying to check them out. We don't want to. Cause a scene. Nice and easy, understand? You're a pain in my ass. I hear it's not nice to call someone a pain in the ass, Tangerine shoots back. Get moving. If we don't find it by the time the train gets to Omiya, there'll be trouble. Really? Tangerine looks exasperated. How can he forget stuff like this? One of Manejishi's men is waiting for us, remember? Really? As Lemon says it, the details creep back to him, someone will be at the station to make sure little Manejishi and the ransom money are both safe and sound on the Shinkansen. Oh, right. Trouble. No no. Well, fancy meeting you here, the wolf's glittering eyes seem to say as he grabs Nanao's collar and shoves him back against the opposite door. The train bursts out of the Weno subterrain, picking up more speed as it moves. The city scenery goes flying by. Nanao starts to sputter his protest that he was trying to get off at Weno, but the wolf clamps his forearm over Nanao's mouth and pins him against the window. The suitcase is by the other door, unattended. Nanao is worried that the swaying of the train will cause it to roll away. Thanks to you I'm missing some of my back teeth. Saliva bubbles at the corner of the wolf's mouth. Missing my teeth. I knew it, thinks Nanao. I knew something like this would happen. His jaw hurts from the wolf's arm, 
but more than anything he's dismayed at the turn of events. Why can't any of my jobs ever go smoothly? Now he has to stay on the train until Omiya, and there's a good chance he'll run into the bag's original owner. And to top it all off, here's the wolf spewing imprecations and shaking his head back and forth, causing a blizzard of dandruff to rain down from the long hair that spills out under the cap. Revolting. The train lurches and the wolf staggers, releasing the pressure on Nanao's jaw. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Nanao says as quickly as he can, let's not get violent, okay? He holds both hands up, looking like he's doing a miniature cheer. We don't want to make a scene on the Shinkansen. Let's just go to Omiya, get off together and discuss it then. But even as he proposes this, Nanao has the sinking sensation that missing his chance to get off at Weno will be the start of things going steadily downhill. You're in no position to be making demands, Ladybird. This makes Nanao mad. His head momentarily buzzes with heat. More than a few people in the business call him Ladybird. He doesn't have anything against that particular insect, he thinks they're cute, tiny and red. With a little constellation of black dots on the back, and being as unlucky as he is he especially likes the ladybirds with seven spots because he thinks they might be good luck. But it's all too clear that when other people in the business grinningly call him ladybird they're making fun of him, likening him to a weak, tiny insect. He can't stand it. Back off. What do you want with me anyway? As Nanao says this the wolf pulls a knife. Nanao quails slightly. Hey, put that thing away. If someone sees you, you'll be in trouble. Shut up. We're going to the toilet. I'm gonna slice you up good. But don't worry, I got a job to do, so I won't have time to do you slow like I want. If I had time I'd make you squeal, I'd make you beg me to let you die, but I'm gonna cut you a break. I don't like toilets on trains. I'm glad to hear it, because your life is gonna end in a train toilet. The eyes under the brim of the flat cap sparkle malevolently. I'm on a job. Me too. A big one, unlike you. Like I said, I don't have a lot of time. You're lying. No one would give you a big job. No, it's true. The wolf's nostrils flare in indignation at the blow to his. Bloated pride. The hand without the knife fishes around in his coat pocket. And pulls out a photograph. It's of a girl. Know her. Why would I know her? Nanao grimaces. The wolf always carries around photos of his victims, one from the client and one that he himself takes when the job's done. He's got a whole collection of before and after shots, before and after beating, before and after death and he loves to show them off. Something else that Nanao can't stand how come it's always girls? Looking for your little red riding hood? Guess you don't know who this one is. She's no ordinary girl. Who is she? This one's revenge, man, revenge. A blood vendetta. And I know exactly where she is. Getting back at an old girlfriend who dumped you. The wolf screws up his face. Hey, man, don't be such a jerk. Says the guy who beats up women. Think what you want. Anyway, I shouldn't be wasting time talking to you, someone might beat me to it. I'm like Hideyoshi going after Akechi. Mitsuhide. Nanao doesn't see how the historical reference fits the situation. I gotta get a move on, so I'll take care of you real quick. The wolf presses the blade up to Nanao's throat. Scared? Yes. Nanao doesn't feel the need to bluff. Don't do it. Please don't do it. Please don't do it, Mr. Wolf, sir. Nanao knows that if any other passengers show up there'll be a scene. Even if they don't see the knife, they'll see two men pressed up against each other and think something's wrong. What do I do, what do I do? The thought spins around his head. The knife is on his neck, he could be cut at any moment. The feel of the blade on his skin almost tickles. 
Keeping one eye on the knife, he steals a look at the wolf's stance. Nanao is a good deal taller, and reaching up to hold out the knife has the wolf off balance. He's wide open, as soon as Nanao thinks this he sidesteps and whips round behind the wolf, catching him under the arms and behind. The head in a full Nelson. He grinds his chin into the back of the wolf's skull. The wolf is rattled by the sudden turnaround. Hey, wait, time out. Keep quiet, Nanao says into his ear. You're going to go to your seat. I don't want any trouble. Nanao knows how to break necks. When he was first starting out he practiced the technique over and over again, like someone might practice juggling a football, until he could do it without thinking. If you can get a hold of someone's head, it's just a matter of accounting for angles and speed, give it a good twist and the neck goes snap. Of course, Nanao has no intention of breaking the wolf's neck. He doesn't want things to get any more complicated than they already are. It's enough for him to keep a firm grip on the other man's head and threaten, I'll do it, stay still. Okay, okay, let me go, the wolf stammers. The train lurches again. It doesn't feel like very much movement, but maybe Nanao doesn't have secure footing for maintaining his hold, or... Maybe the wolf's shoes have bad traction, whatever the reason, the two. Topple over. The next thing Nanao knows his butt is on the floor, his face red from embarrassment at having fallen. Then he realizes he still has a tight grip on the wolf's head, holding him by a fistful of hair. The wolf is also down on the ground. Nanao worries for a moment that the wolf might have stabbed himself in the fall, but a glance at the knife still clutched in the man's hand shows no blood on the blade. He exhales with relief. Get up. Nanao untangles his fingers from the wolf's hair and gives him a sharp push on the back. The wolf's head lolls crazily, like a baby that can't yet hold its own head up. No. Nanao blinks several times. He scuttles around in front of the wolf. The facial expression doesn't look right at all, eyes bugged, mouth hanging open. And of course there's the sickening angle of the neck. No no no, but saying this doesn't change anything. He had fallen with his arm around the wolf's head, and the momentum had broken the neck. Clean in two. Nanao's phone vibrates. He answers without bothering to check the caller ID. Only one person ever calls him. I really think there's no such thing as a simple job, he says while getting to his feet. He hauls the wolf's body up as well, leans it up against himself until it's balanced, trickier than he would have thought. Like handling a giant puppet. Why haven't you called me? What's with you? Maria sounds angry. Where are you? You got off at Weno, right? You have the bag? I'm still on the Shinkansen. I've got the bag. He tries to keep his voice as casual as he can. His eyes are on the suitcase, up against the opposite door. I didn't get off at Weno. Why not? Her tone sharpens. What happened? Then she lowers her voice, apparently doing her best to keep her cool. Getting on a train at Tokyo and getting off at Weno, was that too tough a job for you? What exactly can you do? Can you work a cash register? No, probably not, it's a pretty complicated job, lots of little variations and real-time adjustments. I guess you can handle a job that only involves getting on a train at Tokyo. Station. You can get on fine, it's getting off that's tough for you, is that it? From now on I'll bring you easy jobs like that. Nanao tamps down the urge to smash his phone on the ground. I tried to get off at Weno. The door was open, I had only one step to go, but there he was, he forced his way onto the train. He was on the platform, standing right in front of my door. He looks down at the wolf, leaned up against him. Now he's here with me. Who the hell are you talking about? The god of the Shinkansen? Did he stand in front of you and say thou shalt not disembark? Nanao ignores the jibe. The wolf, he says quietly. You know, the
the creep who only takes jobs hurting girls and animals. Oh, the wolf. Maria's voice changes, she finally sounds concerned. But probably not about whether Nanao is okay, no, she's worried about the job. He must have been thrilled. He's got a score to settle with you. He was so happy he threw his arms around me. Maria falls silent. She must be trying to process the situation. Nanao. Wedges the phone between his shoulder and ear as he holds up the wolf, thinking of where he can put the body. The toilet, like where he wanted to put me. But he immediately decides against it. It would be easy to stash a corpse in the bathroom, but he knows he would be paranoid about whether or not it had been discovered, and would keep getting up from his seat to check, which would probably draw unnecessary attention. So are you going to tell me what happened? Well, at the moment I'm trying to find a place to hide the wolf's body. More silence from the other end of the line. Then, but what happened? The wolf got on and hugged you. And now he's dead. What happened in between? Barely anything. Basically, he pulled a knife on me and had it at my throat. Why? Like you said, he's not a big fan of mine. Then I got around him and put him in a hold, threatened to break his neck. But I was just threatening, okay? I didn't mean to do it. Then the train swerved. The train will do that. So that's how it went down. I just can't believe that idiot showed up at that exact moment. Nanao lets his frustration creep into his voice. Don't speak ill of the dead, she says earnestly. You didn't need to kill him, you know. I didn't mean to kill him. He slipped, we fell, his neck broke. It wasn't a mistake, it was an act of God. I don't like men who make excuses. Don't speak ill of the living, he jokes, but she clearly isn't in the mood. Anyway, I'm holding up the wolf now, and I'm at a complete loss. You know, as to what to do with his body. If you've got your arms around him you might as well just stay there in the gangway and make it look like you're kissing. She sounds a bit desperate. Two men embracing on the train, all the way to Omiya. Doesn't sound like a realistic plan. If you want a realistic plan, how's this, find a seat and put him there. Just. Be careful nobody notices you doing it. You could put him in your seat, or. Find his ticket and put him in his seat. Nanao nods. It sounds sensible. Thanks. I'll give it a shot. He notices the wolf's mobile phone peeking out of the chest pocket of the cheap-looking jacket and grabs it, thinking it might come in handy. He puts it in his cargo pants pocket. Don't forget the suitcase, Maria adds. Good thing you reminded me, I was about to. Maria sighs audibly. Just take care of it. I'm going to sleep. It's the middle of the day. I was up all night watching movies. Every single episode of Star Wars. I'll call you later. Kimura Kimura twists and flexes his wrists and ankles, hoping to find some way to squirm out of the heavy straps and duct tape that bind him, but they show no signs of loosening. There's a trick to it, Yuichi. A sudden welling up of memory from his childhood. Someone talking to him. A scene he hadn't pictured for years, maybe not even once since it first happened, his house from when he was growing up, a man in his twenties with arms and legs tied up. His dad was laughing, let's see you try to escape, Shigeru. His mum standing nearby, she was laughing heartily too, and a kindergarten age Kimura joined in. Shigeru was a former co-worker of his father's who still came by to visit now and again. He seemed honest and sincere, and there was something dashing about him, like a professional athlete. Shigeru regarded Kimura's father as something of a mentor, and he doted on little Kimura. You know your dad was pretty scary on the job, Yuichi. Everyone called. Him the condor. Kimura's father and his younger friend actually shared the First name Shigeru, which was how they started to become close. Kimura remembered that when his father and Shigeru drank together, 
the younger man would often complain about his job. It's a hustle, you know. I'm thinking of looking for something else. Hearing that made Kimura realize that adults have problems too, that they aren't always as strong as they seem. At some point they lost touch with Shigeru. What Kimura is remembering now is the time Shigeru imitated an escape artist they were watching on TV. I can do that, he said after seeing the person wriggle out of being tied up. Kimura's eyes had drifted back to the television, and in the moments he wasn't looking Shigeru managed to untie the rope. How did he do it? How can I do it now? He digs at the mountain of memory, hoping to excavate some crucial bit of information, some clue as to how Shigeru had escaped, but finds nothing. I'll be right back, Mr. Kimura. I'm just going to the toilet. The prince stands and steps into the aisle. Kimura looks at him in his blazer, clearly a kid from an upper-class family, raised with every opportunity. I can't believe I'm taking orders from this brat. Oh, should I get you a drink, the prince? Asks snidely. A little can of sake? Having launched this barb, he walks off towards the back of the train. It occurs to Kimura that there's a closer bathroom in the other direction, but he doesn't say anything. No doubt about it, rich kid, everything handed to him. Rich school kid with a rotten soul. He thinks back to the first time he met the prince, a few months ago. He returned home from working the night shift at the hospital in Kuraicho that morning as towering cumulonimbus clouds filled up the sky. When he got home, Wataru was complaining of a stomach ache, so Kimura took him straight to the pediatrician. Normally he would drop him off at nursery school and get into bed, but he had no chance that day and his head was heavy with fatigue. The doctor's office was unexpectedly crowded. Of course he couldn't have a drink in the waiting room. He noticed his hands were trembling. All the kids in the waiting room looked to him to have lighter symptoms than Wataru. He grew increasingly angry as he stared at them in their face masks, damn fakers, they should let the kids who are actually suffering go first. He glared at the other parents one by one. Each time the nurse came and went his eyes lingered on her ass. It turned out that Wataru's symptoms were light as well. Just before they were called, he turned and whispered sheepishly, Daddy, I think I feel better. But after waiting all that time Kimura didn't want to go home without seeing the doctor, so he made Wataru pretend his stomach still hurt, got some medicine from the doctor and left the clinic. When they were outside, Wataru asked uncertainly, Daddy, were you drinking? Once Kimura knew that his son was feeling better he had felt a wash of relief and taken a nip from his flask. Wataru must have seen him. He had taken his flask from his pocket, turned to face the wall so the other people waiting for the doctor wouldn't see and had a tiny swig. He kept the flask filled with cheap brandy and carried it with him when he was at work so he could have a sip when he needed to. He told himself that it was the same as someone with allergies carrying nasal spray. If he didn't have alcohol, his concentration would falter and he wouldn't be much use as a security guard. His hands would shake, he might fumble his torch, and that wouldn't be good. Having a drink ready to go was like keeping his medicine handy, medicine for his chronic ailment. He convinced himself that he needed alcohol to do his job. Wataru, did you know that brandy is distilled spirits, and distillation goes all the way back to Mesopotamia? Of course Wataru didn't know what Mesopotamia was. All he knew was his father was making excuses again, but it was a fun word to try to say, mesopa, mesopotapota. In French they call distilled spirits eau de vie. Know what that means? It means water of life. Isn't that cool, the water of life? Saying it made him feel better. That's right, every sip is a lifesaver. But the doctor was surprised because you smelled like drinking, daddy. He had a face mask on. But even with a mask he could smell it. It's the water of life, who cares if it smells? The doctor knows that, Kimura muttered. As they were walking through the shopping arcade on the way home. Wataru said, Daddy, I gotta pee. 
They went into the nearest building, full of clothing stores popular with teenagers, to look for a toilet. There weren't any on the ground floor, and Kimura grumbled a stream of curses as they took the lift to the first floor and had to walk past seemingly endless shops to get to the bathrooms at the back of the building. You can go by yourself, right, buddy? I'll wait right here. He gave Wataru a little slap on the butt, then settled down on a bench near the bathrooms. The accessory shop right opposite had a salesgirl with big breasts and a low-cut shirt, and he intended to sit there and take in the view. Yeah, I can go by myself, Wataru declared proudly, and went in. He came back out after what seemed like just a moment. Kimura looked down at his own hands and realized that he was holding the flask. When did I take it out? Don't remember, but the cap's still on, so I can't have had any. It was like he was piecing together someone else's actions. Well, that was quick. Did you go? I did go. It was full. Full. Full of pee. No, there were lots of big boys. Kimura stood up and stepped towards the bathroom. Let me see. They were kind of scary, Wataru said, grabbing Kimura's hand. Let's go home. Kimura shook him off. If it was a bunch of teenage boys, they were probably hanging out smoking cigarettes or horsing around, or else planning some shakedown or shoplifting, and he thought he might like to go in and have a little fun with them. He was feeling grouchy from lack of sleep and lack of drink and he wanted to blow off some steam. You wait here, he told Wataru, and left him by the bench. Inside the men's he found five kids in school uniform, young looking. It was spacious, with urinals on two walls and four cubicles on the third. The kids were huddled by the cubicles. They glanced up when Kimura came in but almost immediately turned back to each other and continued their little conference. Kimura casually stepped up to the closest urinal to them and began to piss. He tried to make out what they were saying. Probably some meaningless discussion, planning some stupid prank. Let's mess with M a little. He had retired from the rough stuff he used to do for a living, but that didn't mean he'd gone off causing trouble. What are we gonna do? The kid sounded angry. Somebody's gotta explain it to the prince. Yeah, but who? You were the one who pussied out and ran. No way. I was ready to do it. It was Takuya who pussied out. He said his stomach hurt. My stomach did hurt. Tell it to the prince. Oh, I had a tummy ache, I couldn't do what you told us to. No way. I could barely take the shock last time. Any stronger I bet I'd die. Then they all fell silent, which Kimura didn't fail to notice. Kimura didn't know the particulars of what they were talking about, but he could guess at the basic contour of it. These kids had a leader. Maybe a classmate, maybe a senior, could even be an adult, but someone was giving them orders. This person they were calling the prince. Stupid name. So they didn't do what His Highness the Prince ordered them to. They let him down. The prince was probably angry. And now these kids were in the men's room trying to figure out what to tell him, who would take the fall. That seemed to be the size of it. The peasants didn't collect enough taxes to satisfy their precious prince, he thought derisively. Meanwhile, his stream of piss just wouldn't stop. But there was one thing he couldn't figure out, the one kid mentioned a shock. Was he talking about an electric shock? Kimura pictured the electric chairs they use for executions in America. Somehow he didn't think that was what the kid was talking about. But then he had said that if it was any stronger he would have died, and this stuck with Kimura. Teenagers often talk about dying or killing each other or something killing them, without any of the weight that the words should hold, but this felt different. This felt like the kid was actually aware of the possibility of his own death. He finally finished peeing. Pulling up his zip, he stepped over to the boys. 
what are you kids doing hanging out in a filthy place like this? You're blocking the way. So, who's gonna be the one to apologize to His Highness the Prince? He reached out and wiped his unwashed hand on the shoulder of the nearest kid, the smallest one. They quickly changed formation from a huddle to a line facing Kimura. They had the same uniform on, though they all looked different. One was tall and pimply, one had a buzz cut, one was fat and stupid looking. They tried to be menacing, but to Kimura they just looked like little kids. You guys aren't gonna figure out anything by talking about it in here. Shouldn't you just go and apologize to your prince? Kimura clapped his hands once, making all the kids jump. None of your business. Get out of here, old man. Kimura couldn't help but smile at them trying to look mean when they were still so obviously innocent kids. You guys practice those tough faces in. The mirror. I mean, I did, when I was your age. Scrunching your eyebrows all mean. The fuck you looking at? Like that. It takes practice. But I'll tell you, it's not worth your time. Once you're done puberty and you look back on it, you'll laugh. Better off looking for porn online. This guy stinks of booze, said the one with the buzz cut. He was pretty well built, but the exaggerated gesture of pinching his nose shut made him look like a little boy. So what were you guys trying to figure out, anyway? Go ahead, you can tell me. Let the old man help with your problems. What did your prince want you to do? The kid seemed confused. After a moment the one on the end asked, how'd you know about that? I overheard your little conference when I was pissing. Kimura looked at each of the school kids. How about it, you want my advice? I'm happy to help. Tell the old man all about the prince. The kids were silent. They exchanged glances with each other, like they were having a silent meeting. Then Kimura bellowed, Ha, huh, did you really think I'd listen to your problems? I was just messing around. Why would I give advice to a bunch of brats like you? Anyway, I'm sure he just wanted you to sneak into a sex shop or beat someone up. But the kids didn't relax at all, they actually looked even more serious. Kimura raised his eyebrows. Why are they so stressed out? He stepped over to the sink and washed his hands. He saw in the mirror the boys reform their huddle and resume their discussion, more agitated than ever. Sorry I made fun of you guys. Later. He wiped his hands on one of their jackets, a different one from the first one he did it to but they barely seemed to notice. Kimura emerged from the toilets. Okay, Wataru, daddy's back. But Wataru was gone. He cocked his head. Where the hell? He looked down the walkway between the shops, but didn't see his son anywhere. He half ran over to the big-breasted salesgirl. Hey! She tossed her. Highlighted hair as she looked up at him with her big eyes, a distasteful look. On her face, though he couldn't tell if it was from the brusque way he addressed her or because he smelled of booze. You seen a little boy, about this tall. He held his hand at hip level. Oh, she said, a bit dubiously, I saw him head that way, and pointed towards the corridor out the back of the store. Why would he go back there? I have no idea. But he was with another kid. What do you mean, another kid? Kimura's voice had an edge. Another kid in kindergarten? I thought maybe it was his older brother. Good looking kid, kind of fancy. Fancy? Who was it? How should I know? Kimura ran off without saying thank you. Down the corridor, round a corner, looking around wildly. Wataru, where'd you go? Where are you? He pictured his ex-wife's contemptuous look when she had asked him if he could really take care of a child. Anxiety turned to a rush of sweat, his pulse started to hammer. When he finally found Wataru by the escalators he was so overcome with. Relief that he almost sank to his knees. His son was holding hands with a boy in a school uniform. 
Kimura barked at them and rushed over, wrenching Wataru's hand away. Despite the violence of it the boy in the uniform seemed unfazed. He looked placidly at Kimura. Aha, is this your daddy? The kid was about five foot four, on the skinny side, with fine hair that was longish but didn't seem to have any weight to it. His eyes were large and clear, shining like a cat's eyes in the dark. Looks almost like a girl, Kimura thought. He felt the thrill of being stared at by an attractive woman and laughed at himself uncomfortably. What the hell do you think you're doing? Kimura squeezed Wataru's hand and pulled him over to his side. He had said it to the kid in the uniform, but Wataru seemed to think his father was yelling at him. He said that my daddy was over here, the little boy said timorously. How many times have I told you not to talk to strangers? Kimura's voice was forceful, but as soon as he said it he thought about all the times his parents, Wataru's grandparents, had scolded him specifically for not telling the boy things like that. He turned to look fiercely at the schoolboy with his well-proportioned face. Who are you? I'm a student at Kanoyama School. The kid was calm and composed, as if he was just doing what his teachers had told him to. My friends are hanging out in the men's room, and I thought they might scare this little boy, so I figured I would take him a little way away. Then he said he didn't know where his father was, so I was taking him to the information desk. I was in the men's too. Wataru knew that. Don't try to feed me that load of crap. Wataru seemed certain his father was angry with him and he just cowered and trembled. Well, that's odd, he didn't tell me he knew where. You were. The kid looked completely unruffled. Maybe he thought the way. I was talking was too scary he couldn't speak up. I was worried about him so maybe I spoke a little too roughly. Kimura didn't like it. More than the fact that this kid had walked off with Wataru, it bothered him how calm the boy was, that he didn't seem the least bit affected by Kimura's aggressive questioning. It wasn't that the kid was rude or a smart ass, no, there was something more unsettling about him, something sly and cunning. As he was about to leave with his son, Kimura said, those kids in the toilets kept talking about a prince. They were having some kind of secret meeting. Oh, that's me, the kid said lightly. My last name is Aji, spelled with the Chinese characters for prince. Weird name, huh? Lots of people make fun of me for it. Satoshi Aji, but they call me Prince Satoshi, or just the prince. Um, just so you know, my friends and I might have been hanging out in there. Loose, but we weren't smoking or anything. Goody two shoes to the hilt. He walked off towards the toilets. The prince re-enters the train car and sits back down, shaking Kimura from his recollection. Hands and feet still tied, Kimura brings up the episode. What were you gonna do with Wataru that time we first met? I wanted to check something, the prince answers sweetly. I was just listening in on my classmates in the men's room. Listening in. You mean you bugged the toilets? No, one of my friends hid a device in his coat pocket. You had a spy. It feels a little childish to say. Worried that people are trashing you? Not quite. I don't mind if people talk about me. But if they find out that they were being listened to, or if they're worried about who's a spy, it'll mess with them. They'll stop trusting each other. That's good for me. What's any of this have to do with anything? Like I said, all I was doing was listening in on their conversation. I was planning to let them know later that there was a spy, which would make them all paranoid. And actually that's exactly what eventually happened. But when I was there listening I spotted your boy looking at me. He seemed interested in me, so I thought I would play with him a little. He's six years old. I can't imagine he had anything particular in mind when he was looking at you. I know. But there he was, and I wanted to play with him. I wanted to see what it would do to a little kid. What what would do? An electric shock. I wanted to see how a kid that age would react to high voltage. The prince points to his backpack and the taser inside. 
I thought I would test it out, but you came along, Mr. Kimura, and ruined everything. Fruit Lemon begins his search towards the front of the train, heading first to car number four. He tries to remember what the stolen suitcase looks like. Back when he was in junior school his teacher had told his grandparents that he only ever remembered things he was interested in. He can recall exactly which gadgets Doryman used in every issue of the comic, the teacher had said in frustration, but he doesn't know the name of the school's principal. Lemon couldn't understand what the teacher was so upset about. Between the principal's name and Doryman's gadgets, it was blindingly obvious which was more important. The suitcase must have been around a half meter tall and a little less across. It had a handle. It had wheels. It was black, made of some tough material that was cold to the touch. It also had a lock with a four-digit code, but Lemon and Tangerine didn't know the combination. If we don't know. The combo, how are we supposed to do the trade with the kidnappers? Lemon had been unable to resist asking Manejishi's man when they got the bag. We can't show them we actually have the money, so how do you expect us to get the job done? It was Tangerine who answered, sensible as usual. It's not the bad guys they're worried about, it's us. They think we might make off with the cash. Well, what the fuck? If they don't trust us why should we even work for these assholes? Don't worry about it. If you did know the combination, wouldn't you want to open it? Later Tangerine had suggested they mark the case somehow. He pulled a kid sticker out of his pocket and stuck it near the lock. That's right, the bag had Tangerine's sticker on it. In front of the entrance to car 4 he finds the young woman with the snack trolley. She seems to be checking the inventory, punching something into a little handheld device. Hey, you seen somebody with a black suitcase, about this big? Huh? She looks startled, a suitcase. The blue apron over her uniform makes her look domestic. Yeah, a suitcase, like a bag for carrying stuff, you know. A black bag. I had it on the luggage rack but it's gone. I'm sorry, I really couldn't say. She seems unsettled by his gaze and moves behind the cart so it's between them. Really couldn't say, huh? Guess not. Lemon moves on, entering car 4. The gentle hiss of the door swiftly sliding open reminds him of the inside of a spacecraft he saw in a movie once. There aren't many passengers. He moves up the aisle, checking left and right under the seats and on the overhead racks. There aren't many bags either, which makes it easy enough for him to see that the black one he's looking for isn't there. But he does spot a paper bag that catches his eye on the right hand overhead rack. A paper bag of considerable size, on the rack halfway up the car. He can't see inside, but he wonders if maybe someone put his suitcase in this bag. Once the thought enters his head he acts without any hesitation, steps up to the row where the bag is. A man sits in the window seat, and the other two seats in the row are empty. At first glance Lemon figures the man is a little bit older than himself, maybe around 30. He's reading a book. Could be a post-grad student, though he's wearing a suit. Lemon sits down in the aisle seat, then turns to the man. Yo, he says, putting his hand on the armrest next to the man and leaning towards him. That bag up there, he points at the luggage rack, what's that all about? It seems to take a moment for the man to realize that someone is talking to him. He finally turns to look at Lemon, then up at the rack. Ah, that's just a paper bag. Yeah, I know it's a paper bag. What's in it? Sorry. My suitcase is missing. I know it's still somewhere on this train so I'm looking around for it. The man processes this for a second. I hope you find it. Then he appears to realize what Lemon is getting at. Oh, your suitcase isn't in my bag. I didn't take it. My bag's full of sweets. Pretty big bag. You got big sweets. No, just a lot of them. The man looks like he'd be a buttoned up, timid individual, but he seems remarkably unperturbed. 
Well, let's see, M. Lemon half stands and reaches up to the rack for the bag. The man doesn't show any signs of anger or concern. He just turns back to his book. There even seems to be the glimmer of a placid smile on his face. His composure is unsettling to Lemon. Once you check inside, I'd appreciate it if you put the bag back where it was. Lemon brings the bag down to the seat and opens it. Inside are a whole lot of sweets, probably purchased at Tokyo Station. These all gifts for people or what? You sure bought enough. It was hard to decide so I got a lot of different ones. Nobody cares that much what you bring them. Sorry, I can't be of any more help. The man smiles gently. Will you put the bag back now? Lemon stands and tosses the bag carelessly back onto the rack. Then he sits down again, this time in the middle seat right next to the man. He rocks back and forth in agitation. You sure you don't know where my suitcase is? The man looks at Lemon but says nothing. You know, usually most people would get either scared or pissed off from someone showing up suddenly and going through their bags. But you're just sitting there all calm. It's like you were expecting me. You're like a criminal with an alibi who doesn't get nervous when the cops are questioning him. Oh no, detective, I was at so and so bar at that time. Same thing. You knew exactly what to say when I came. Right? Don't be absurd. Now the man's eyes narrow into a piercing gaze. At that moment Lemon notices what the man is reading, hotel buffets, with photos of food underneath. That's like in a witch trial when they said that. The woman denying she was a witch was proof she was a witch. You think there's something suspicious about me because I'm not afraid of you. He closes his book. I certainly was surprised. You sit down next to me out of nowhere and demand to look inside my bag. I was so surprised I didn't know how to react. Sure don't look surprised, Lemon thinks, and then says as much. What do you do, anyway? I'm an instructor at an exam preparation school. A small one. A teacher, huh? I never got along with teachers. But also, every teacher I ever had was afraid of me. None of them were as relaxed as you. What, are you used to dealing with juvenile delinquents or something? Do you want me to be afraid of you? I mean, no, not really. I'm just trying to be a normal human being. It's not like I'm trying specifically not to be afraid. The man sounds slightly bewildered. But if I'm not afraid, he continues, it might be because of some rough stuff I got. Wrapped up in some time ago. Ever since then I've felt a little reckless. Maybe I'm desensitized. Rough stuff. Lemon furrows his brow. One of your bad students beat you up. The man narrows his eyes again, his face creasing, followed by a broad smile. It makes him look like a little boy. My wife died, I met some scary people, a lot happened. But hey, he says, his voice suddenly back to how it sounded before, crying about it won't do any good. I'm just trying to live like I'm alive. Live like you're alive. What's that supposed to mean? How could you live any other way? Actually, most people live pretty aimlessly, wouldn't you say? Sure, they talk and have fun, but there's got to be something more, I don't know, what, like howling at the moon. The man beams at this, nods vigorously. Exactly. Howling at the moon would definitely make you feel alive. And eating lots of good food. He opens the book and shows Lemon a photo spread of a hotel buffet. Lemon doesn't know what to say, and realizes that he doesn't have time to sit here talking to this man. He stands up and steps into the aisle. You know, teach, you remind me of Edward. Who's Edward? One of Thomas the Tank Engine's friends. Engine number two. Lemon launches automatically into the character description he'd memorized. A very friendly engine, kind to everyone. He once helped push Gordon up a hill and another time saved Trevor from almost being scrapped. 
Everyone on the island of Sodier knows they can count on Edward. Wow. Did you learn all that by heart? If Thomas was on the college entrance exams, I'd have got into Tokyo U with that lemon walks on, exiting car number four. He checks the luggage rack in the gangway. Nothing. In the middle of car six he meets the kid. He didn't even see him, the kid just seemed to show up out of nowhere, and suddenly they were standing facing each other in the aisle. Looks like he's thirteen or fourteen, one of these pretty looking kids you see nowadays. Clear eyes, well-proportioned nose, like a little doll that you can't quite tell if it's supposed to be a boy or a girl. What do you want? Lemon isn't sure of how he should act to make this kid think he's tough. The kid feels too wholesome, reminds him of Percy the Green Engine. Are you looking for something? I saw you peeking in the bathroom. The kid gives off a vibe like he's a grade A student, which makes Lemon feel uncomfortable. He's never been able to get along with eggheads. A suitcase. Black, about this big. You seen it? Probably not, I guess. Oh, actually, I did. Lemon gets right in the kid's face. Oh yeah. You saw it. The kid leans back a little, but he isn't scared. I saw someone carrying a bag that size, he says, miming the dimensions with his hands. A black bag. He pokes his finger towards the front of the train, which picks up speed just at that moment, causing Lemon to stagger slightly. What did he look like? Um, the kid says, touching his fingers to his chin and cocking his head, looking upward and making a show of trying to remember. The performance looks like something a teenage girl might do. Um, let's see, he wore dark colored trousers and had a denim jacket on. A jean jacket. Huh. How old? Late twenties or early thirties, I'd say. Oh, and he had black glasses on. Kind of handsome. Thanks for the tip. The kid waves off the thanks, no, it was nothing, and flashes a smile so dazzling it lights up the whole car. Lemon smiles too, Riley. You grinning like that because you've got a heart of pure gold or because you're making fun of a grown-up? Neither one, the kid answers without hesitation. It's just the way I smile. You trying to get the other kids on the Shinkansen to smile like you, innocent and sparkly-eyed? Do you like the Shinkansen, sir? Who doesn't like the Shinkansen? I mean I like the 500 series best. But I think the Hyade's great too. But if you want to know what train I like best, it's the Duke of Boxford's personal train. The kid makes a puzzled face. What, you don't know Spencer? Don't you watch Thomas and Friends? I think I used to when I was little. Lemon snorts. You're still little, damn it. Got a face like Percy. Then he starts to make his way towards the next car to look for the person the kid described but stops when he sees the digital ticker on the wall above the cabin door. The letters on the display flow to the left, spelling out top stories. Distracted, Lemon pauses to watch. The first item tells him that a snake was stolen from a Tokyo pet shop. Apparently a rare breed of snake. There was no known motive, but Lemon mutters to himself that someone was probably looking to sell the snake. Then comes the next story, 13 dead in the Fujisawa Kangocho killing. Security cameras at the scene had been sabotaged. Was it 13? The thought doesn't trigger any particular feelings one way or the other. It had been dark in the underground room, and he had shot down one armed man after another, so he wasn't clear on the numbers. All that spraying blood and torn flesh, but seeing it written out like that makes it seem so dull. Rough stuff, says the kid. He's standing behind Lemon, apparently also reading the news. Thirteen people. I did at least six, probably more. Tangerine did the rest. It's more than a couple, but it's not that much. What? Lemon immediately regrets thinking out loud. He tries to change the subject. Hey, know what that thing's called? Officially? A traveler. 
Information Broadcast Device. Did you know that? Sorry. That thing with the news on it. Oh. The kid nods. Yeah, I wonder where they get the news from. Lemon feels himself smile. I shall tell you, he says with a flare of the nostrils. There are two kinds of information. One is whatever they write in the conductor's cabin, and the other comes from the central depot in Tokyo. The kind from inside the train is like, you know, we will soon be passing by so-and-so station, that kind of thing. Everything else, advertisements, news, all that, that gets beamed in from the central depot. Like when there's an accident somewhere and it messes with the timetables. That kind of real-time info gets typed up back in Tokyo and shows up on our train. And the news too. News from the six major newspapers comes in rotation, which is pretty cool. And that's not all, um, I think we're in the way, says the kid firmly, bringing Lemon back to himself. The snack trolley is right behind them. The attendant recoils when she sees Lemon, as if alarmed that this man keeps showing up everywhere she goes. But I had lots of other cool stuff to tell you. Cool stuff. It's clear that the kid has doubts. You didn't think it was cool. About the traveler information broadcast device. It didn't move you. Lemon is utterly sincere. Well, anyway, thanks for the help. If I find my suitcase it'll be because of you. Next time I see you I'll buy you some sweets. No no. A passenger is walking Ian Nanao's direction, a smallish kid in a blazer. Nanao closes his flip phone and puts it away in the rear pocket of his cargo pants, working all the while on calming himself down. He's propping the wolf's body up against the window, if he doesn't support it properly the head will flop around unsettlingly. Is everything all right? The kid stops next to Nanao to ask. His teachers at school must have taught him to check in with people who look like they might be having trouble. Which is the last thing Nanao needs. Oh, yeah, everything's fine, he just had a bit too much to drink and his head was spinning. Nanao makes sure not to speak too quickly. He nudges the body slightly. Hey, wake up. You're scaring the children. Do you want some help getting him back to his seat? No, no, it's fine. Having a great time. Who's having a great time? Me. Hugging a corpse and taking in the scenery. Um, looks like someone dropped something. The kid looks down. It's a Shinkansen ticket. Probably the wolf's, which fell on the floor. Sorry, could you get that for me? Nanao asks because it would be tough for him to lean down while holding up the body and also because he has the sense it would be good to satisfy this kid's apparent urge to be kind to people. The kid scoops the ticket right up. Thanks a lot, Nanao says with a head bob. Alcohol sure is scary. The man I'm traveling with today can't stop drinking either. He causes all kinds of trouble, the kid says cheerily. See you later and he turns towards the entrance to car 6. But then he notices the lone suitcase standing by the opposite door. Is this yours too, sir? What school does this kid go to anyway? Nanao wants him gone as soon as possible, but the kid seems determined to stick around and help as much as he can. Where do they teach kids to be so helpful? Even as Nanao's frustration grows he thinks that if the day ever comes where he has children of his own he'd try to send them to this kid's school. But at the moment it's just more bad luck. In this particular situation, a chance encounter with a kid brimming with charity and benevolence is an unfortunate turn of events. Yes, it's mine, but you can just leave it there. I'll get it later. He feels his. Tone getting a shade harder and tries to regulate it. But if you leave it there someone might take it. The kid's persistent. If you leave yourself open people will walk all over you. Well, that's unexpected. Nanao speaks his thought out loud. And here I was thinking your school taught you to have faith in people. The doctrine of inherent human goodness. Why would you think that? 
The smiling kid seems familiar with the doctrine of inherent human goodness, which makes Nanao feel slightly embarrassed. I only just learned about the idea, from Maria. It's hard to say why, exactly. Because it seemed like your school might be full of well-behaved students, I guess. I don't believe that people are born inherently good or bad. They just become one or the other, is that it? No, I think good and bad depend on your point of view. This is some kid. Nanao is taken aback. Do teenagers really talk this way? The kid offers again to help with the suitcase. It's all right, really. If the kid keeps pressing, Nanao might lose his temper. I'll take care of it. Um, what's inside it? I'm not actually sure. An honest answer in a careless moment, but the kid laughs, apparently thinking it's a joke. His teeth gleam in a perfect white row. The kid seems to want to say something else, but after a moment gives a bouncy goodbye and heads into car number six. With a rush of relief, Nanao hugs the wolf's body to himself and steps over to the suitcase. He has to figure out what to do with the body first and then the bag, and fast. The bag's owner in car 3 may not yet have realized that it's missing, but if they do they're sure to search the train. Nanao knows that if he's carrying the bag around in the open chances are he'll be found out. With one arm around the corpse and the other hand gripping the suitcase handle, he looks left and right, at a loss. First the body, which should probably go in a seat. His eyes fall on the trash receptacle in the wall. There's a hole for bottles and cans, a narrow slot for magazines and paper waste. And a large flap for the rest. Then he notices a small protrusion on the wall, right next to the magazine slot. It looks like a keyhole, but there's no opening, just a little circular bump. Before he knows what he's doing he reaches out and pushes it. A small metal fitting pops out with a click. What do we have here? He twists it. What he thought was a wall is actually a panel that now swings open. There's a large space inside, like a locker. A shelf divides the space into two levels. The bottom part has a heavy-duty plastic bag hanging there, where the trash collects when people deposit it. Opening the panel like this must be how the cleaning staff collects the trash. But of greatest interest to Nanao is the fact that the top shelf is empty. Without stopping to think he tightens his hold on the body and hoists the bag up one-handed, using muscle and momentum to swing it crashing onto the shelf. In the next instant he closes the panel. Nanao feels his worried mind ease ever so slightly at unexpectedly finding a hiding place. Then, turning his thoughts back to the body in his arms, he checks the ticket that the kid picked up for him. Car 6, Row 1. That is, the closest row in the closest car to him. Perfect for putting the body down without raising suspicion. It's happening. Things are going my way. And then he thinks, but are they really? Two lucky breaks for a guy usually mired in bad luck, one, finding the trash box panel to hide the bag, and two, the wolf's seat being so close. One part of him is ringing alarm bells, shrieking that the other shoe's going to drop any minute, and another part of him is lamenting that these two windfalls are as far as his luck will go. The scenery flies by out the window. Cranes on the roofs of buildings under construction, rows of linked apartment buildings, jet contrails in the sky, all disappearing at a uniform speed. He adjusts the body against his own. Carrying a grown man over his shoulders is sure to attract attention, so he stands the wolf up next to him, shoulder to shoulder like they're practicing for a three-legged race. He takes a few awkward steps. This doesn't look very natural either, but there's no other way he can think of. The door to car six slides open. Nanao enters and spills himself and the body into the two-seater directly to his left, wanting to get down and out of sight. He sets the wolf up by the window and settles into the aisle seat. Luckily, there's no one in the seats across the aisle either. He allows himself a sigh of relief. 
Then the wolf sways and comes lurching towards him. He hastily pushes the body back up against the window, arranging the arms and legs as best he can for balance. He has never quite got used to the sight of lifeless bodies. He tries to stabilize it so it will stop flopping around. First he attempts to prop the elbow on the windowsill, but the wolf is a bit too short because it doesn't look at all natural. After several minutes of trial and error, he finds a position that seems like it might work, but only a few moments later the body starts to sag and collapse like an avalanche in slow motion. Nanal fights down his rising temper and once more tries fastidiously to arrange the body. He leans him up against the window and tries to make it look like the wolf is sleeping. Then he pulls the flat cap down low for good measure. A call comes in from Maria. Nanao gets up and returns to the gangway. He stands next to the window and puts his phone to his ear. Make absolutely sure you get off at Omiya. Nanao smiles acidly. There was no need to tell him that. Well? Are you enjoying your ride on the Shinkansen? I haven't had any time to enjoy it. I'm scrambling here. I finally got the wolf into his seat. Looks like he's sleeping. I hid the bag, too. Well look at you. You don't know anything about the bag's owner. Only that he's in car number three. Nothing else more specific. If I knew what kind of person to watch out for it would be a big help. If I knew anything I would tell you. But that's all I've got, really. Mother Maria, help me. Standing by the door, he can feel the vibrations of the train on the tracks. The phone is pressed to his ear, his forehead is pressed to the window. It's cold. He watches the buildings flow by. The door from the rear of the train opens and someone enters the gangway. Nanao can hear the toilet door open, then whoever went in comes out again right away. There's an exasperated click of the tongue. Someone looking for something in the toilet. He risks a glance. A man, long and lanky. Wearing a jacket, a gray shirt underneath. His hair sticks up randomly, like he just got out of bed. An aggressive look in the eyes, like he's ready to pick a fight with anyone he meets. Nanao recognizes him. Hey, that reminds me, he says into his phone, trying to keep his voice natural, like he's just a regular passenger having a conversation and looking out the window. He keeps his back turned to the man. Something wrong. Maria doesn't miss the sudden change in Nanao's voice. I mean, you know, it's like. He stalls for time until the man enters car 6 and the door closes behind him. Then Nanao's voice returns to normal. Saw someone I know. Who? Someone famous. One of those twins. You know who I'm talking about. Twins in the same line of work as us. Not lemon and lime. Maria's voice gets tight. Lemon and tangerine. They're not twins. They kind of seem similar so everyone assumes they're twins, but actually they're totally different. One of them just passed by. Lemon is the one that likes Thomas the Tank Engine, and tangerine is the serious one that likes reading novels. Lemon's a classic B blood type and Tangerine's a classic A. If they ever got married it'd definitely end in divorce. Hmm. I couldn't tell his blood type just by looking at him. Nanao says it lightly, to cover his nerves. It would have been easy to tell which one it was if the guy had been wearing a t-shirt with a train on it. Then he gives voice to his growing sense of foreboding, you think the suitcase is theirs? Could be. Could also be that they aren't here together. Used to be that. They worked individually. Someone once told me that those two are the most dangerous operators in the business. It was a while back, when he was meeting in an all-night cafe with a well-known go-between, a decidedly chunky man. This man used to do all kinds of work, contract kills and other dangerous jobs, but when he began to put on weight he slowed down the pace, got tired of working, and got into the go-between business. When he started it was still a newish thing, 
and since he was persistent and kept up good relations with people he was able to carve out a solid niche for himself. He kept growing plumper into his middle age, so getting out of the field was probably the right move. I was always best at making connections, he told Nanao with self-satisfaction. I think I was meant to be a go-between. It didn't make much sense to Nanao. Then the man made him a proposition. Would you take on work that didn't come from Maria? Because I've got a job for you. There's good news. And bad news. This guy was always talking about good news and bad news. What's the good news? It pays extremely well. And the bad news? You'd be up against some tough customers. Tangerine and Lemon. I'd say that right now, they're the people in the business most guaranteed to get a job done. Most violent, for sure the most dangerous. Nanao turned it down without thinking twice. It wasn't that he had a problem working with someone besides Maria. It was this man's repeated use of the word, most. He had no intention of going up against that. I really don't want to get involved with those two, Nanao wails into the phone. You may not want to, but that won't stop them. If it is their suitcase, that is. Maria sounds calm. Anyway, declaring someone the most dangerous in the business is pretty much the same as picking the favorites for this year's Academy Awards, people just say whatever they want to. There are a lot of candidates to choose from, after all. Like the pusher. You've heard about him, right? The one who pushes his victims in front of cars or trains and makes their deaths look like an accident. Some people say he's the best in the biz. And for a while everyone was talking about the Hornet. Nanao knows the name. Six years ago, the Hornet made a name for himself overnight by sneaking into the offices of Terahara, the big wheel in the underworld, and killing the boss. He used a poison needle to prick people in the neck or the fingertip. Some rumors said the Hornet was actually two people working together. But no one ever mentions the Hornet anymore, do they? Flash in the pan. A one-hit wonder. Just like a bee, I suppose, only one good sting. I wonder. Most of what you hear about the old professionals is just a bunch of tall tales. This reminds Nanao of something else the rotund go-between had said. I always get excited when I watch old movies. I think, how did they make it look so good when they didn't have any CGI or special effects? Like the German movies from the silent era, they're so old but they've got such a glow. Don't you think the glow is because they're so old? Like with an antique. The go-between shook his head with theatrical flair. No, no. It's despite the fact that they're so old. Look at Metropolis. In the same way, professionals in the old days were seriously tough. I want to say they were more solid, harder. They were on a different level. He spoke with passion. And you know the reason why those old-timers never lose. Why's that? Because they're already dead or retired. Either way, they'll never lose again. Guess you could say that. The go-between nodded grandly, then launched into tales about his friends among the legends. Maybe if I retire now, Nanao says into his phone, I'll become a legend too. Oh sure, Maria shoots back, you'll go down in history as the man who couldn't get off the train at Weno Station. I'll be getting off at Omiya. Good idea. That way they won't call you the man who couldn't get off. The train at Omiya. Nanao hangs up and goes back to his original seat in. Car 4. The Prince. H.E.Y., Mr. Kimura, the Prince says conspiratorially, things might be getting a little interesting. Interesting. No such thing. Kimura has long since been feeling reckless. He lifts his bound hands to his face and scratches his nose with his thumb. What, you had a divine revelation. You realized that you're a sinful boy. That's an eventful trip to the toilet. There's actually a bathroom right next to our car, 
but I went in the wrong direction, so I had to go through car 6 to the bathroom in the gangway between 6 and 5. So even His Highness the Prince makes mistakes. But things always go my way. As the words leave his mouth, the prince wonders why it is that everything always goes his way. Even if I mess up, it ends up working out for me. It turns out to have been a good thing that I went to the further bathroom. Before I got there, I saw two men in the gangway. I didn't pay them much attention, just went to the bathroom. But when I came out they were still there. One of them had his arms around the other one. Kimura guffaws. Somebody being held up by their friend is usually a very drunk somebody. Exactly. And the one holding the other up said the same thing. This guy had too much, he said. But it didn't look that way to me. What do you mean? He wasn't moving, but he didn't smell of alcohol. But mostly, the angle of the head didn't look right. The angle of the head? The one guy, with the black glasses, he was trying his best to cover it up, but I'm pretty sure the other guy had a broken neck. Okay, Kimura says with a long sigh. There's no way that's what was going on. Why not? The prince looks past Kimura, out the window, working out his next move. Because if someone was dead there'd be a big fuss right about now. The guy didn't want there to be a fuss, so he was making up all kinds of excuses. He lied right to my face. He pictures the man with the black glasses. Kind looking, but the offer to help carry the supposedly drunk man had flustered him. It was obvious he was trying to keep a cool facade but inside was frantic. The prince almost felt sorry for him. And this guy had a suitcase. So, what, you think he was trying to put the body inside the suitcase? Kimura sounds flippant. Oh, that would have been a good idea, actually. But it probably wouldn't have fitted. The guy in his arms was pretty small, but I don't think it would have worked. Go and tell one of the conductors. There's a passenger with a broken neck, tell him, is that typical? Is there a discount ticket if you have a broken neck? Go and find out. No thanks, the prince answers flatly. If I did that, they'd stop the train. And he pauses for a moment. It'd be boring. Well, we certainly wouldn't want His Majesty to be bored. There's more. The prince grins. I was on my way back here, but I couldn't stop thinking about it so I turned back again. When I was in car 6 I saw a different man. He was looking for that suitcase. So. He was checking the aisle, the seats, searching for something. And this was a different guy from the one with the black glasses and the drunk friend. Yes. Tall and slim, with kind of crazy eyes. He seemed pretty rough around the edges, didn't exactly look like a productive member of society. And then he asked one of the passengers, hey, what's in your bag? Weird, right? He seemed desperate, and it was pretty easy to see he was looking for a bag. Kimura makes a show of yawning. This old man's desperate too, the prince thinks coldly. Unable to grasp what the prince is getting at, unsure why he would be sharing all this, the man's getting anxious. He doesn't want his much younger antagonist to notice his anxiety, so he fakes a yawn to cover taking a deep breath. Just a little more. Kimura is on the brink of accepting his powerlessness, the futility of his situation. Just a tiny bit more. People need to find a way to justify themselves. A person can't live without being able to tell themselves that they're right, that they're strong, that they have value. So when their words and actions diverge from their view of themselves, they start looking for excuses, to help reconcile the contradiction. Parents who abuse their children, clergy who engage in illicit affairs, politicians who suffer disgrace, they all come up with excuses. Being forced to submit to someone else's will is the same. It makes people try to justify themselves. In order to avoid acknowledging one's impotence, one's abject weakness, people try to find some reason. They think, 
this person must be something really special to beat me so thoroughly. Or, anyone would be powerless in this situation. This gives some small satisfaction. The more confidence and self-regard someone has, the more they need to tell themselves something like this. And once they do, the power relations are set in stone. Then all you have to do is say two or three things that stroke the person's ego and they'll do whatever you tell them. The prince has done it many times with his schoolmates. I see it works just as well on adults as it does on kids. Basically, one man is looking for a suitcase, and the other one has it. So you should tell him. That guy with the black glasses has the bag you're looking for. The prince glances at the carriage door. Actually I lied to him. The man with the black glasses and the bag is behind us, but I told the man looking for the bag that he was further up the train. What are you trying to do? It's just a hunch, but I bet the bag is pretty valuable. I mean there's someone doing everything they can to find it, so it has to be worth something. As he's talking, something occurs to the prince, if the man looking for the bag was coming in this direction, wouldn't he have encountered the black glasses man? It wasn't a suitcase that could be folded up and hidden somewhere, so if they crossed paths then the man looking for it should have discovered it immediately. Could he have overlooked it? Or maybe the man with the black glasses hid inside the toilet with the suitcase. I'll share something with you. It was back when I was seven, the prince. Says to Kimura with a smile. He smiles so broadly it scrunches up his cheeks. Whenever he does this, adults make the mistake of assuming he's an innocent kid, totally harmless, and they let down their guard. He relies on it. And sure enough, Kimura's face seems to soften a bit at the prince's smile. Robot cards were really popular. All my classmates were collecting them. You could buy packs at the supermarket for a hundred yen, but I didn't see what everyone was getting so excited about. My Wataru can't buy cards so he makes his own. He's adorable. I don't see what's adorable about that. No need to lie. But I can understand it. Rather than buying some generic card that somebody else made for commercial reasons, it seems a whole lot more worthwhile to make your one for free. Is your kid good at drawing? Not at all. It's really cute. He's not. Lame. Kimura stares blankly for a second, and then has a delayed flash of anger at the insult to his son. The prince always chooses his words carefully. Whether the words are violent or easygoing, he never says them without considering their effect. He always wants to be in control of exactly what he says and how he says it. He knows that the casual seeming use of impolite words with his friends, words like lame, worthless, trashy, establishes a kind of power relation. Even if there's zero basis for calling something lame or trashy, it has an effect. Saying things like your dad's so lame, or you've got such crappy taste, these function as a vague denial of someone's foundation, and it's effective. There are not that many people who have a solid set of personal values, who have real confidence. And the younger someone is, the more their values shift around. They can't help but be influenced by their surroundings. That's why the prince frequently displays his own certainty, using words of derision and contempt. More often than not his subjective opinion takes on objective force, reinforcing his superior status. People think, that guy's got a way of looking at the world, he knows what. He's talking about. He gets that sort of deference without even having to ask. For it. If you take the position in a group of the one who sets the values, the rest is easy. In the prince's circle of friends, there are no clearly laid out rules like in football or baseball, but they all follow his orders as if he were the referee. One day I found a pack of cards in the car park of a store. It was unopened, so I'm guessing it fell when a shipment was being delivered. It turned out to have a really rare card inside. Lucky you. Exactly. That was lucky for me. When I brought the card into school, all those young aficionados lit up. Can I have it? They all said. 
I didn't need it, and I was just going to give it to someone. But too many people wanted it. I didn't know who to give it to, and then suddenly, and this is true, I really wasn't planning anything, but without thinking about it too much I said, well, I can't just give it away for free. So what do you think happened then? What, you sold it to the highest bidder? You're so simple, Mr. Kimura. It's cute. The prince chooses these words. Intentionally. It didn't matter whether or not what Kimura said was cute. What mattered was that the prince had made a judgment. He guessed that Kimura would now feel like he was being treated like a child. Now he'll be wondering what about him exactly is childish, he won't be able to escape the fact that his thoughts might be juvenile. Of course, there's no way for him to answer this, because nothing he said was actually cute. So then he'll start to think that the prince knows the answer, and he'll start to pay attention to the prince's values and standards. Anyway, it looked like there would be an auction, people started naming prices. But somebody said, hey, prince, what about something besides money? I'll do whatever you want. That's when the whole situation changed. That kid must have thought that it would be easier to do something for me than to pay. Probably didn't have any money. So then everyone else starts saying the same thing, I'll do whatever you want. That's when I realized. I could use the situation to control the class. Sure. Why not? To make people compete with each other, to make them suspicious of each other. So that's when His Majesty the Prince started thinking he was hot shit. That was when I realized that people want things and that I could benefit if I had the things they wanted. You must have been so proud of yourself. Not at all. Just that I started wanting to see how much I could affect other people's lives. Like I said before, it's the lever principle, I can push just a little and make someone depressed, I can ruin their lives with minimum effort. It's kind of amazing. I can't say I've ever felt the same way. And so, what, that led you to start killing people? Even if I don't kill anyone, hmm, okay, say I'm at the tail end of a cold, still coughing, right? And I happen to pass a mother in the street pushing her baby in a buggy, and when the mum isn't looking I lean in and cough in the baby's face. Doesn't sound like such a big deal. Maybe the baby hasn't been vaccinated yet and gets a virus. With my little cough it could mess up the baby's life, and the parents too. Did you actually do that? Maybe. Or say I go to a funeral home and bump into the bereaved when they're transporting their family members' ashes. Pretend I tripped and fell. The ashes spill everywhere, it's a huge mess. Such a simple little thing, but it puts a blot on someone's memory. No one thinks kids have any malice in them, so no one would be that harsh with me. And I'm too young to be punished by the law. Which means that the family who dropped the ashes is even more sad and frustrated. Did you do that? I'll be right back. The prince stands up. Where are you going? I want to see if I can find the suitcase. Walking through car 6 to the back of the train, he glances around. The man with the black glasses isn't there. Up on the luggage rack there are large backpacks and paper bags and small suitcases. None are the same shape or color as the one he saw before. He's fairly certain that the black glasses. Man isn't further up the train than car 7 where he and Kimura have been sitting. He had been on the lookout and hadn't seen the man come through. Which means that the man is further back on the train, somewhere between cars 5 and 1. He exits car 6, his mind working. No one in the gangway. There are two toilets. The closer one is locked. Someone else must be using the sink area because the curtain is pulled. The man with the black glasses might be hiding in the toilet with the bag, maybe planning to hole up in there until the train reaches Omiya. Wouldn't be a bad idea. It's possible someone could complain that the bathroom has been occupied for a long while, but the train isn't that crowded so it probably wouldn't turn into anything big. The man could very well be in there. The prince decides to wait for a while and see. 
If whoever's inside doesn't come out soon he can ask the train staff to open it. He would just do his. Honor student routine, full of kindness and respect for the rules, oh. Excuse me, the toilet has been in use for a while now, do you think there might be something wrong? The train attendant likely wouldn't think twice before opening it up. As he's thinking this the curtain by the sink snaps open, startling him. A woman emerges, who looks at him mildly and apologizes. The prince almost apologizes back reflexively, but he holds it in. Apologies create obligation and hierarchy, so he never makes them when he doesn't have to. He watches the woman walk away. She's wearing a jacket over a dress, medium height and build, looks to be late twenties. He suddenly thinks of his class teacher from three years ago. Her name was Sakura or Sato, he can't remember. Of course he knew her name at the time, but once he graduated he didn't feel the need to hold on to it so he just let it go. Teachers are just that, a teacher at school, occupying a role. It's like how baseball. Players wouldn't bother learning the names of the other team's fielders and just refer to them by position. He used to say, the teacher's name and personality don't matter. Their beliefs and goals are all basically the same. When it comes to personalities and mindsets, at the end of the day there are really only a handful of patterns. The teachers are all looking for ways to get on our good side. We might as well have a chart, we do this and they move like that, we act like that and they react like this. They're just like mechanical equipment. Equipment doesn't need a proper noun. When he would say that, most of his classmates would stare uncomprehendingly. At best they would agree, yeah, I guess the teachers' names don't matter. They should have been asking the prince if he thought that they were just equipment too, or at least wondering, but no one did. That teacher always thought he was a smart, capable boy who could help her bridge the gap between teacher and students. She even once told him appreciatively, if it weren't for you, Satoshi, I would never have known there was bullying in the class. He actually felt a little sorry for her for thinking he was her innocent little ally. One time he gave her a hint that he wasn't what she thought. It was in a report he wrote about a book on the Rwandan genocide. The Prince Preferred books on history and world affairs over novels. His teachers were surprised that he would read a book like that at his age. They were impressed, how precocious, they said. The prince thought that if there was one thing he was especially gifted at it was reading. He would read a book, digest the contents, his vocabulary would improve, his knowledge would increase, and he would go on to read something more difficult. Reading helped him put words to human emotion and abstract concepts, enabled him to think objectively about complex subjects. From there it was an easy step to helping someone express their fears and anxieties and frustrations, which made them feel indebted to him, come to rely on him. He learned all sorts of things from the Rwandan genocide. In Rwanda there were two ethnic groups, the Hutu and the Tutsi. Physically they were more or less the same, and there was no shortage of marriages between people from the different groups. The Distinction between Hutu and Tutsi was completely man-made and artificial. In 1994, when the Rwandan president's plane was shot down, the Hutu began their genocide of the Tutsi. Over the next hundred days some 800,000 people were killed, many of them cut down by machete-wielding neighbors who they had lived beside for many years. A rough breakdown of the numbers puts it at 8,000 people killed every day, which is five or six every minute. This unmitigated slaughter of man and woman, young and old, wasn't some ancient happening divorced from any sense of reality, no, it happened less than twenty years ago, and this is what most fascinated the prince. It was hard to believe something so horrible could happen, he wrote in his book report, and I thought that we can't ever forget this tragedy. It was not just something that happened in a far-off country. I learned that we all have to face up to our weakness and fragility. He knew that it was the sort of vague but palatable statement that worked best for these reports. All surface, ultimately meaningless, sure to win the grown-up's approval. 
but he also hit some truth in the last sentence. He did learn something, just how easily people can be whipped up into a frenzy. He came to recognize the mechanism that makes atrocities difficult to stop once they've started, the mechanism that makes genocide possible. For example, America was reluctant to acknowledge that there was genocide taking place in Rwanda. That's what the book said. Rather, they were frantically trying to find reasons why it wasn't a genocide, without paying heed to the facts on the ground. Even though there was reporting on the ever-increasing numbers of slain Tutsi, America took an evasive position, claiming that it was difficult to determine what exactly constitutes a genocide. Why? Because if they recognized a genocide, the UN would call on them to take some sort of action. And the UN acted the same way. They basically did nothing. It wasn't just the Rwandans who expected the Americans to act a certain way. Most Japanese people think that if there's ever a major problem, America or the UN will deal with it. A feeling like the police are on the job. And will take care of everything. When in reality, the US and UN determine their course of action based not on any sense of mission or moral obligation, but on a calculation of profit and loss. The prince knew instinctively that none of this was unique to the story of a small African country. It could easily be transplanted into his school. If a problem occurs among the student body, say, an epidemic of violent bullying, then that stands in for the genocide, and the teachers are the US and the UN. In the same way that the Americans resisted the notion of genocide, the teachers don't want to recognize the bullying problem. Once they do, they'll have to take action, which would lead to all sorts of mental and logistical strain for them. He thought it would be interesting to try to turn this around on the teachers, to make them recognize that there was bullying but not treat it as a problem worth addressing. He got the idea from a section in the book about a mass killing that took place in a Rwandan technical school. When he first read about the episode, his body trembled with excitement. UN peacekeeping troops were stationed at the school, and people started to say that the UN would keep people safe from the genocide. Some 2,000 Tutsi took refuge in the school, believing they'd be protected. Unfortunately for them, the UN troops didn't have orders to protect the Tutsi, but rather to help foreigners in Rwanda evacuate. By extension, the troops were being told that they had no obligation to save the Tutsi. This came as a great relief to the UN troops. They didn't have to get involved. If they tried to protect the Tutsi, chances were that they themselves would face mortal danger. When the Hutu surrounded the school, the UN troops claimed that their mission didn't include direct engagement, and they retreated. The 2,000 Tutsi in the school were immediately butchered. The presence of a peacekeeping force had led to even more victims. Utterly fascinating. Regardless of how the students acted on the surface, somewhere deep down they all believed that the teacher would maintain order in the classroom. Their parents thought the same thing. They trusted the teachers, invested them with responsibility, and so they felt secure. The prince knew that if he could control the teacher he could make life miserable for the rest of the students. He devised a plan. First he tried to sow the seeds of anxiety about what would happen if the teachers took action against bullying. He gave his class teacher reason to fear that she herself could be in danger. Then she started to form justifications for her decisions, telling herself that she was doing what was best for the students even though she wasn't taking direct action. He addressed this in his book report too, touching on the foolishness and self-serving logic of the US and the UN. He thought that the teacher might realize what he was doing, that he was really writing about her, that he was a dangerous boy. He gave her clues. But of course she didn't pick up on them. You really read this hard book, Satoshi. That's so impressive, she fawned. Tragedies like this really are terrible. It's hard to believe that human beings could do this to one another. Isn't it? The prince was disappointed. It was easy for the prince to understand how a genocide could occur. It was because people make decisions based on feeling. 
but those feelings are extremely susceptible to outside influence. He read in a different book about a famous experiment. Groups of people were gathered and given problems to solve, questions with easy answers. They answered one by one, and everyone heard how everyone else answered. But actually, there was only one real test subject in each group, and everyone else was instructed to give the wrong answers on purpose. Amazingly, the individual answering according to their own free will chose the incorrect answer that everyone else was giving one out of three times. In total, 75% of test subjects gave at least one answer that they knew to be wrong. Human beings are creatures of conformity. There have been other similar experiments. One of them isolated the optimum pattern for conformist behavior, when the stakes are high but the question is difficult and the right answer isn't obvious. When this happens, people are much more likely to adopt someone else's opinion as their own. When the question is easy to answer people tend to have more faith in their own decision. It's also relatively easy as long as the stakes are low. People feel no hesitation with giving their own answer. The prince understood it like this, when people have a difficult decision to make, one that may go against their code of ethics, they conform to the group, and even come to believe that the answer is correct. When he thought about it in those terms, it became easy to see the mechanism by which the genocide not only was difficult to stop but by which it fueled itself. The people doing the killing didn't trust their own judgment, but rather went along with the group, believing that was right. He hears a noise in the bathroom, the sound of the toilet flushing. The door opens, but the person who comes out is a middle-aged man in a suit, who heads over to the sink. The prince swiftly opens the door and pokes his head inside. Just a drab toilet, nothing else. Nowhere the suitcase might be hidden. Next he checks the other bathroom. It's a lady's room, but that doesn't stop him. No suitcase. He cocks his head. Where could it be? It's too big to fit under any of the seats in the train. It isn't on any of the luggage racks, nor is it in the bathrooms. He doesn't have any particular reason for drifting over towards the trash receptacles, other than that he's checked everywhere else. He inspects the openings for bottles and cans and the slot for disposing of magazines, bringing his face closer, even though he knows there's no way the bag would fit inside. He peers in the hole. All he can see are discarded containers. Then, he notices the little protrusion. There, right next to the slot for paper waste. I wonder. He pushes it and a handle clicks out. He twists it without hesitation. The panel swings open before him, making his heart flutter in his chest. He had no idea there was a panel there. Inside is a shelf with the garbage bag on the bottom, and a suitcase on top. No doubt about it, it's the suitcase he saw when he met the man with the black glasses. I found it. He closes the panel and resets the handle. Then he exhales slowly. There's no need to be hasty. The man with the black glasses isn't likely to move the bag any time soon. He probably thinks he can leave it here until he gets where he's going and no one will find it. How can I make this even more interesting? Relishing the sense of accomplishment from finding the suitcase, he starts back towards car number 7. I really am lucky. Kimura Kimura can't stop going through all the memories he has related to the prince. The first time he met him in the mall, he thought he'd never see this school kid again. But within two weeks he found himself involved with the prince once more, as if there was an invisible force pulling him in. That time, too, Wataru was with him. It was on the way back from seeing his parents off at the train station. They had come to Tokyo a day earlier for a class reunion and stayed at a small hotel near Kimura's apartment. After Wataru was back from kindergarten for the day, they took him to a toy shop, offering to buy him whatever he wanted. It wasn't like Wataru to ask for things, and he was clearly a little overwhelmed by his grandfather urging him to pick something, pick something. He seemed satisfied enough with the balloon that the shopkeeper gave him. 
Kimura found himself on the receiving end of another overblown scolding from his father, he's afraid to ask for something because you never buy him anything. Poor kid, oh, poor little guy. Wataru's always been that way, Kimura explained, but his father wouldn't listen. Instead he brought up Kimura's ex-wife. When she was around the boy was more interested in toys, like a little kid should be, he said unkindly. She left because you're such a mess. That's not true. I told you. She racked up a ton of debt and ran off. She just couldn't stand living with you and your drinking. I wasn't drinking so much then. It wasn't a lie. He had always been on the lazy side, but when his wife was still around he could live without alcohol just fine. If he had been drinking as much back then there's no way he would have got custody of Wataru. Well, now all you do is drink. You're just saying that, you don't know. At which his father's face grew hard. I can tell by looking at you. I can tell by smelling you. It had been his line since Kimura was a boy. He would puff up and declare that you can tell just by looking at someone, the bad parts always show. Kimura had never liked it, wrote it off as the prejudices of the old. His father's old friend Shigeru once laughed and said, Mr. Kimura's. Always saying, this guy stinks, that guy stinks. To which Kimura's mother responded, but he's always the one farting. After they found a toy for Wataru they went to a park with a large playground. Kimura sat on a bench watching his mother scramble breathlessly after Wataru as the little boy ran for the tall slide. He was glad for a moment's break from being his son's main playmate. He reached into his pocket for his flask, but his father grabbed his hand. He hadn't even noticed his old man sit down next to him. The hell you think you're doing? Kimura said, his voice thick with anger, but his father was unmoved. Despite the white hair, the old man was still solid and strong. He tightened his grip until it hurt. Kimura let go and his father took the flask. Do you know what the definition of alcoholism is? You're gonna say it's me and my life, right? You're still on the cusp, but if you continue like you are then you'll be a full alcoholic, no doubt about it. I'm asking, do you know what alcoholism actually means? He handed back the flask, which Kimura snatched up. It means you like drinking and you drink a lot. That's putting it roughly, yes, but it means addiction, which means it's a disease. It's different from someone who appreciates a drink or who can hold their alcohol. It means that if you take one sip, you just keep drinking. Then it's no longer a question of resilience or restraint. Alcoholism means you can't stop. It has to do with your physiology. When someone like that takes a drink, it's all over. It's hereditary, so I'd guess you're the same as me. Or maybe I got it from mum. Neither one of us drinks. And why is that? Because we both know that there's no recovery from being an alcoholic. Of course you can recover. There's a cluster of nerve cells in the brain, the A10 cluster. Oh God, Dad, a science lecture. Kimura started rooting around in his ear to show his lack of interest. They did an experiment, with a machine, and if you pushed a lever it would stimulate the A10 cells. And what do you think happened? I give up. People kept on pushing the lever. So. When the A10 cluster is stimulated, the brain releases pleasure signals. If someone pushes the lever, they get an easy buzz. So they keep doing it, over and over. Like how monkeys won't stop masturbating, same idea. Apparently this good feeling is similar to the one we get from eating something delicious, or from completing a job well done. So what? Drinking alcohol stimulates the A10 cells. So what? When you drink you get a feeling of having done something worthwhile, even though you haven't done anything at all. This is easy, you say. It's easy, and it feels good. So then what do you suppose happens? You just keep drinking, like the people who keep pushing the lever. 
And as you go on like that, eventually, your brain starts to change shape. What do you mean, your brain changes shape? Once that happens, there's no changing it back. It develops a switch that flips the moment alcohol enters the system. Say there's an alcoholic who hasn't had a drink for a long time. The symptoms of addiction have vanished, he's able to lead a normal life again. But if he takes even one sip, he'll go right back to being unable to stop. Because his brain is still wired that way. It has nothing to do with his willpower or resolve. It's just the way his brain works. Like how a man's pupils will dilate reflexively when he sees a naked woman. There's nothing he can do to help it. That's the mechanism of dependence. Mechanism of dependence. Real fancy talk, dad. Anyway, what about the fact that brandy dates back to Mesopotamian culture? We don't even know if that's actually true. Don't believe everything you hear, it'll make a fool of you. Listen, there's only one way to beat alcoholism. And that's to give up drinking entirely. One sip and it's all over. You shouldn't. Be looking to alcohol or drugs for a sense of accomplishment. What you should be doing is good, honest work. Taking your satisfaction the easy way leads the human body to form dependencies. Again with the fancy talk. You should do like I do and work a proper job, the old man said forcefully. That'd give you a healthier sense of accomplishment. A proper job? You've worked a supermarket stockroom my whole life. As long as Kimura could remember his parents had lived humbly. They worked at a supermarket near where they lived, basically glorified part-time jobs. They worked meekly, earned meekly. Kimura had always looked down on them for it. The stockroom is important work. I have to manage stock, place orders. His father exhaled sharply through rounded nostrils. What about you? You've never held an honest job in your life. Uh, you mean except for the job I have now with the security company. Oh, well, yes. That's a good job. Sorry. The apology sounded sincere. But you never worked before that. Forget about the past. I mean, what, are you gonna accuse me of not having a job when I was in school? No one did. Anyway, I had a job before I was a security guard. What kind of job? His father peered into his face and Kimura looked away. What kind of job? Someone would hire him, he would get his gun, he would mess with other people's lives. Not exactly humanitarian work. But if he told his father that, the old man would feel like he had failed as a parent. He almost told him, just to make his father feel as bad as he himself was feeling, but he hesitated. It didn't seem worth it to burden his father with that kind of hurtful information on top of the natural challenges of getting older. I guess the kind of job you can't talk about in polite company, is that it? What, you can tell just by looking. That's right. You'd have a fit if I told you, Dad, so I'll spare you the pain. Hey, I got into my share of trouble when I was young. I think mine was on a different level, Kimura said with a bitter smile. Nothing's as boring as when old folks brag about how hard things used to be or how much hell they used to raise. Forget all that. Just stop drinking, that's all. I appreciate you worrying about my health. It's not you I'm worried about, it's Wataru. You're tough enough, if a giant shoe stomped on you you'd probably survive. What am I, a cockroach? He chuckled. If a giant shoe stomped on me I'd die like anybody else. Listen, if you care at all about Wataru you'll stop drinking. Hey, I've thought about quitting, you know, for Wataru's sake. Even as he said it he was unscrewing the cap on the flask. But you just said, and now you're, wailed his father. I'll tell you again, the only way to overcome dependency is to cut yourself off completely. Guess I'm just a no good lush. The old man stared at him. If you were just a lush that might be okay. But if you're no good as a person, then there's no hope for you. His lips trembled slightly. 
Yeah, yeah. Kimura opened the flask and brought it up to his mouth. With his father's warning echoing in his head he felt some shame, and only took a small sip. He could feel the alcohol hit him, could feel his brain changing shape like a sponge being twisted. He shuddered. Later that day, after dropping his parents off at the train station, Kimura led Wataru back the way they came, through the old shopping arcade and into the residential neighborhood. Daddy, someone's crying. Wataru tugged on Kimura's hand as they were passing by an alley alongside a closed-down gas station. Kimura was in a bit of a daze, holding his son's hand but not really there, haunted by his father's words. He kept hearing it over and over again, there's no cure for alcohol. Dependency Up until then he had thought that even if you had a dependency you could get treatment, get better and still drink. Like if you get gonorrhea, your dick gets inflamed, and until you take care of it you can't have sex, but once you get it cleared up you can do it again. He was sure that alcoholism worked the same way. But if what his father said was true, then alcoholism was different from gonorrhea. There's no cure, and you can never drink again. Look, daddy. He heard his son calling him again, looked down at the boy's face, then followed his gaze. Between the shuttered gas station and the next building over was a group of kids in school uniform, for in all. Two of them had another one pinned by the arm so that he couldn't go anywhere. The fourth one stood facing the others. The one being held looked desperate. Come on, stop. He was crying. What's happening, daddy? Don't worry about it. It's just some big boys doing their big boy thing. Kimura wanted to keep walking. When he thought back to his own. School days, there was always someone pushing someone else around, getting up to something bad. Kimura was usually among those doing the pushing, so he knew that most of the time it happened for no particular reason. People just feel better when they can put themselves above other people. By grinding someone else down, you prop yourself up. That's the way people work. Wait. Wait. It's just as much your fault as it is mine. The kid being held was almost shrieking. How come I'm the only one who's getting it? Kimura stopped walking and looked again. The kid had short hair dyed brown and a uniform that was too small. He looked fit and strong, this wasn't picking on the weak, it seemed to be more like friends kicking someone out of their group. Kimura's interest was piqued a little. What did you expect, man? He jumped because you overdid it, said the kid holding brown hair's right arm. This one had a round face and a broad brow, looked a bit like a boulder, but still with the innocence of youth. I guess teenagers are still basically kids, thought Kimura. Seeing kids so young acting so hard felt surreal somehow. But we were all in on it. And anyway, even before I put the video online. He was all, I wish I were dead, I wanna die. We were supposed to get him up to the point of suicide, but not actually have him do it. The prince is really pissed off, said the one on Brownhair's left arm. The prince. The name rang a bell. But more than that, why were they talking about death and suicide? Once you've had your shock it'll all be over, so just deal with it. I don't want it. Think about it, said the fourth one, the tallest. What'll happen if you don't take it now? Then we all get shocked. That's what. So it'll happen to you either way. But if we get it too then we'll all be angry with you. If you just take what's coming to you now then we'll be thankful. If you're gonna get it either way, which way would you rather have it? You want us to be angry with you or to thank you? Well, what if we just pretended you did it? We'll tell the prince I got the shock. You think he'll fall for that? The tall one gave a pained smile. You think? You can trick the prince. Excuse me, young men. Kimura put on a phony formal tone as he entered the alley, leading Wataru by the hand. Did your bullying cause the death of a classmate? He nodded encouragingly. I certainly am impressed. The schoolboys looked at one another. 
Their three against one formation dissolved and they hastily became a foursome once again, eyeing Kimura warily. Can we help you, said the tall one darkly. His face was red, either from anxiety or anger, Kimura couldn't tell which, but it was obvious they were trying to look tough. You lost something. Did I lose something? I can see that something's going down here, Kimura said, pointing to the kid being restrained. What do you mean, shock? Electric shock. What are you up to? What are you talking about? You were being really loud, I heard everything. You guys bullied a classmate until he killed himself. Well, that's kind of fucked up. So, what? Now you're having a review meeting. As Kimura was talking, Wataru started to tug on his hand. He whispered that he wanted to go home. Shut up, old man. Take your kid and get out of here. Who's the prince? As soon as he said that all four boys went white. It was like someone had invoked a terrible curse. Their reaction made Kimura even more curious. At the same moment he recalled meeting that student in the department store. Ah, right, now I remember the prince. And you guys, too, I saw you in the toilets. You were having a secret meeting. You were all worried, oh no, the prince will be angry, what are we gonna do? As he ribbed them, he thought back to the kid he met who called himself the prince. You're actually scared of that little goody two-shoes. All four of them were silent. The tall one held a plastic bag from a convenience store. Kimura took a quick step closer and plucked it out of his hand. The boy was taken completely unawares, suddenly becoming frantic, clawing at the bag to get it back. Kimura dodged easily, then grabbed the kid's outstretched hand and twisted hard on the pinky. The kid yelped. Don't think you can mess with me, buddy, I'll break your finger. I've been around a whole lot longer than any of you. I've toughed it out through many more boring hours of life than you have. Know how many times I've broken someone's fingers. Despite what he was saying he spoke nonchalantly. He handed the bag over to Wataru. What's in it? The school kids buzzed in protest. One move and I'll break this one's pinky. Just try me. Daddy, what is this? Wataru took some sort of appliance out of the bag. It was fairly low-tech, like the remote control for a toy car, with wires and switches on it. Yeah, what is this thing? Kimura let go of the kid's hand and took the device. Looks like the power pack for a train set. One of Kimura's school friends, a kid with a rich dad, had lots of model train sets that he loved to show off. This thing looked like the power pack that channeled electricity to the train tracks. Or maybe that's exactly what. It was. It had a few wires coming out of it and one end was taped up. A. Power cord dangled from the other end. What's this for? The kids left his question hanging in the air unanswered. Kimura stared at the device. Then he looked around and noticed an outlet low on the wall of the gas station. Probably for when the station attendants had to use some power tool. It had a cover over it to protect it from the rain. Wait, you were gonna plug this in and then, like, press the wires on his body and give him an electric shock. Is that it? As he pieced it together Kimura started to feel a little unsettled. When he was in school he had hurt people too, but it was only ever just hitting them. He never even thought of using electricity. And this device looked like it had been specially modified for exactly that purpose. He got the feeling that it was used on a fairly regular basis. You guys do this often. Using electrical appliances seemed to him like next-level bullying, verging on torture. This is, what, the prince's idea. How do you know about the prince, the brown-haired one who had been held by the others asked with a quaver in his voice. I met him in the department store after I first saw you guys. When you were all scared and crying in the toilets about the prince being angry with you. I was there, remember. 
Oh wait, recognition dawned on the tall one as he looked at Kimura's face. Then it seemed to hit the others, this was the booze-reeking man who butted in on their deliberations. That time it was Takuya whose turn it was to get punished. Somehow the name he'd heard in the toilets popped into Kimura's head. Takuya was scared because he didn't follow His Majesty the Prince's orders and the Prince was mad. You are all, oh no, oh no, what'll we do, right? The kids looked at each other again, exchanging some silent message. Then the round-faced one spoke quietly. Takuya's dead. The other three whipped round to glare at him for revealing this to a stranger, their faces drained of color. What do you mean, dead? Is that a metaphor? Kimura spoke tauntingly. So he wouldn't have to admit to himself that he was starting to get scared. You mean like how rock and roll is dead? Pro baseball's dead, Takuya's dead. Strained, sickly smiles spread on the Skulkids' faces, not because they were making fun of Kimura, but because they both identified with and were disheartened by how shaken the man looked. You mean he's actually dead? So the person you mentioned before, who jumped, that was Takuya. Kimura sighed. He didn't expect things to take such a dark turn. You know when someone dies, that's it, they're gone. Wataru kept tugging on his hand, and Kimura himself began to think it wasn't such a good idea to have gotten involved. He turned to leave. But then he heard one of the kids shout behind him, Wait, sir, help us. He turned back round. The four boys all looked pale. Their cheeks were quivering. Please, said the tall one, and at the same moment the one with the round face said, Do something, and the other two both said, Help us. Of course they hadn't planned this chorus, as if it were a rehearsal for the Student Arts Festival. They all just broke at the same time, finally realizing. They had to reach out for help, their voices layering over one another, making their pain seem all the more poignant. First you try to act tough and now you're asking for help. Which is it? By that point they were nothing more than frightened little boys. Their entreaties came pouring out as if a dam had burst. You don't look like you're some dumb salary man, mister. You gotta do something about the prince. He's gonna kill us all. It's like everything's gone crazy, our whole school's crazy, all because of him. Kimura couldn't believe this was happening. He waved his hand, leave me alone, what do you expect me to do? He felt like a fisherman who casually throws in a line and hooks a monster fish that may well pull him into the water. He felt afraid. All right, fine, I'll get rid of the prince for you, he said, half in desperation, not meaning it. The kids lit up, like a beam of light shone down on them. This upset Kimura even more. He looked around. It was a narrow alley, but it was clearly visible from the street. To anyone passing by it would have looked like nothing so much as a man and his child being mugged by some teenagers. Or maybe a man with child in tow giving a sermon to some students. I'll do it if each of you pays me a million yen. He threw that in to make it clear it would never happen, but amazingly the schoolboys seemed willing to take him up on it, beginning to discuss how they could get the money together. Come on, guys, Kimura said frantically, I was obviously joking. Talk to your parents. If you're having so much trouble with the prince, go cry to mummy and daddy. Or to your teachers. They were all mumbling and whimpering, on the verge of tears. Look at you. You guys are too much. Leave me out of it. Kimura looked down and saw Wataru staring back at him. But the boy wasn't looking at his face, his eyes were locked on the flask in Kimura's hand. When did I? He screwed the cap shut. Which meant that he must have opened it. He hadn't even realized it. He had taken the flask out, unscrewed the cap and had a drink all without noticing. He tried to keep himself from clicking his tongue in frustration. There was concern in Wataru's eyes, and also sadness. Well, these school kids were leaning on me so heavy. 
Kimura cast around for his excuse. Of course I'm going to want to have a little drink, they got me all stressed out. He needed a drink to keep his wits about him, so he could take care of Wataru. The moment the alcohol hit him was like rain falling on parched earth, nourishing all the nerves in his whole body, making his head clear and sharp. See, what's so bad about alcohol? He even started to feel a touch of pride. Whether it's poison or medicine it all comes down to how you use it, and I know how to use it right. Takuya, croaked one of the kids. Last month his dad was fired. Ha. Huh. Kimura's brows knitted together at the sudden change in direction. You mean Takuya who died? It was before he died. His dad was arrested for touching one of the girls. In our school. When the story got out he was fired. Well, if he was involved with a teenage girl then he got what he deserved. Kimura's nostrils flared as he spoke, but then he noticed the kids looking uncertain, searching for what to say next. Wait a minute. He felt a doubt worming around. Did you guys have something to do with it? Are you telling me you set up Takuya's dad? They didn't deny it, which made Kimura think it was true. Was his dad innocent? Again, they said nothing. How would you even do something like that? How does that work? We just did what the prince told us to, muttered the round-faced one. Same with the girl. It was because Takuya's dad was trying to find stuff out about the prince. So the prince had you guys cook up a sexual misconduct case. He would do that. Smart kid. Ruthless. Kimura was half-joking, but the four schoolboys nodded vigorously. They were all too familiar with the prince's ruthlessness. He's got rid of three teachers too, said one of them darkly. One got depressed and quit, one was caught groping a student, one had. An accident. Don't tell me you guys did those too. No answer. You know, you shouldn't be so afraid of him. Just gang up on him and kick the shit out of him. I bet you'd have no problem if you worked together. Right? The prince didn't look particularly strong. And even if he happened to be a martial arts prodigy or something they could still overwhelm him with numbers. Their reaction was peculiar. Their eyes all popped open, like this man had suggested something unthinkable. Like they couldn't even process what he was saying. The thoughts never even occurred to them. It was clear that they had never once considered trying to topple the prince. Kimura thought back to a job he once did. He was assigned to guard a man who had been kidnapped and was being kept half-naked in a dingy old apartment. The man said nothing, just lolled about in a daze. Kimura sat in the next room watching TV, drinking, passing the time. But there was something about it that he just couldn't wrap his head around. The man wasn't tied up and the door wasn't locked. The man could have left if he wanted to. So why didn't he? Kimura got an answer from the next guard who came to take over for him. Ever heard about learned helplessness? Asked the guy. Learned. They did an experiment where they shocked a dog, right? And it had this setup where if the dog jumped it wouldn't get a shock. So you'd think the dog would jump, right? But before that they put the dog in a situation where it got a shock no matter what it did. So then it didn't even try to jump to escape the shock. It gave up, huh? Basically they taught it that it was helpless. So it stopped trying, even when it could have avoided pain by just trying a little. It's the same with humans. Same with like domestic violence. The wife just keeps taking the beating. Because that sense of helplessness takes root, you know. So that's why, Kimura had said, looking at the man being kept in the room. Yup. He won't run away. He thinks he can't. Human beings don't operate on logic. Deep down we're built just like animals. This situation with the school kids was the same. They had long since decided that there was no way they could beat the prince. Or had they been taught that? They had seen all the suffering that both their classmates and adults had met at the hands of the prince, time and again. 
It must have built up to the point where they were convinced that they were powerless. The electric shocks were probably part of it. Kimura didn't know how the shocks were delivered, or what kind of orders the prince gave exactly, but he could see that the shocks were getting to these kids on a deep level. He took another good look at them. They really were young. They might have spent time on their hairstyles, they might have tried to look cool and tough, but they were like frightened puppies. Carving out their status in. Their little world was, to them, a matter of life and death. It probably isn't that hard to control these kids, Kimura thought. And then he reflected that he shouldn't get involved. When a stray dog slinks towards you with sad, moist eyes, it's best to ignore it. Figure it out for yourselves. Sir, please, said Round Face, you gotta help us. Wataru squeezed his hand anxiously, pulling him away from the alley, back towards home. Not my problem. Kimura realized with a start that at some point he had drained his flask. I'm sure you'll grow up into fine, upstanding adults. Then he walked away. Hey, Mr. Kimura. Kimura opens his eyes at the voice. It takes him a few moments to register that he's on the Shinkansen. He hadn't been fully asleep, but neither was he fully awake, and the sudden appearance of the prince's face right next to him seems like a phantom swirling up out of memory. Mr. Kimura, now's not the time for your beauty sleep. Aren't you at least? A little worried about what's going to happen to you? Even if I were worried I couldn't do anything about it all tied up like this. So, you know. Still, you should have some kind of sense that you're in danger. I was waiting for you to meet me on the train, but it sure wasn't so that we could take a fun trip together. Oh no. But why not? Let's do it. We can go for cold noodles in Moriaka. My treat. The prince doesn't crack a smile. There's something I want to ask you to do. No thanks. Don't say that. I'd be so sad if anything happened to your little son in the hospital. Kimura feels a leaden weight in his stomach and a boiling rage in his blood. What do you want me to do? I'll tell you when we get closer to Moriaka. For now you just want me to stew. I'm guessing if I asked you to kill someone you wouldn't want to hear about it. Kimura bites his lip. Such casual talk about killing seems at the same time childish and adult. Who? Who do you want me to do? I'll just let you savor the anticipation. As the prince says this he bends. Down and starts to loosen the ties on Kimura's legs. You're letting me go. If you try anything funny your son's going to be in trouble, okay? Just because I'm taking these off doesn't mean you're free. Don't you forget it. If my guy can't get in touch with me it'll be bye bye baby boy. Kimura's body quakes with fury. Hey, are you even checking your phone? Sorry. His face twists up. You said it'll go badly for me if you don't answer your phone. Oh, that's right. If it rings ten times and I don't pick up then yes, it'll go very badly for you indeed. I don't want to hear that you just missed a call because you weren't paying attention. Then it'll fucking go badly for you. Don't worry about that, mister. The prince seems utterly unconcerned. In the meantime there's something else I want your help with. What, you want a back rub? He points towards the rear of the train. I want you to go with me to get a suitcase. Morning Glory The light is green at the main intersection in Fujisawa Kangocho. Cars flow by one after the other. People crowd by the curb, waiting for the pedestrian crossing signal. Morning Glory stands 30 meters away in front of a chain bookstore. He watches the light. He watches the people. Male, tall, thin, thirties, no. Male, heavy set, twenties, no. Female, no. Male, short, twenties, no. Female, no. Male, school uniform, no. He waits for his target. The light changes. The mass of people move into the crossing. 
They go in all directions, straight, to the side, diagonal. Before long the walk signal starts to flash, then turns red. The traffic light turns green again. He memorizes the timing. The key is when the light turns yellow, and when it's about to turn red. Cars go faster on a yellow than they do on a green. They abandon caution, they come charging in. I think the pusher is like one of those weasel spirits from the stories, you. No, the Kamitashi. A woman had said that to him once. She was looking. To hire for a job. Morning Glory met with her, saying he was the pusher's representative. Someone suddenly gets a cut on their arm or their leg, said the woman, and they scream, a Kamitashi got me. But really it was just a sharp wind. I think the pusher must be the same sort of thing. Someone gets hit by a car or jumps in front of a train and people say it was the pusher that did it. Couldn't it just be a made-up story? People often make that mistake about the Kemitashi. But the cuts don't come from any wind. Blaming it on the wind, that's the made-up story. Morning Glory told the woman that, and she didn't like it. She could have gone home then, but she pressed even harder, asking all sorts of questions about the pusher, digging for scraps. Morning Glory decided he disliked her, turned down the job, and walked off. But she stubbornly came after him, so he pushed her into the road, just as the light was about to turn red in the night. A pickup truck barreling through the intersection smashed into her. The only regret Morning Glory felt was that he had done it for no fee. Male, short, forties, no. Female, no. Male, heavy set, twenties, no. Female, no. Female, no. Male, heavy set, forties. His eyes lock onto the passing man. Pinstriped gray suit. Short hair, broad shoulders. Morning glory starts to follow. The man heads for the intersection. He steps into the crowd of people waiting for the walk sign. Morning Glory follows. He's fully aware. And in the moment, but it doesn't quite feel like he's guiding his own movements. The traffic light turns from green to yellow. The man stops on the edge of the crossing. Cars come from the right. Black minivan, female driver, short hair, child seat in the back. The timing's off. The next car is coincidentally the same type of minivan. The light changes. The car surges forward. Morning Glory casually moves his hand, touches the man's back. There is the sound of impact, then the screech of the tires clawing at the road. No one screams yet. The people's shock is like a silent, transparent explosion. Morning Glory is already gone. He walks fluidly back the way he came, like floating on a current. Behind him he hears cries of ambulance. But his heart is calm, like the surface of a lake where no pebble has been cast. His only thought is the vague recollection that he had once done a job at this same intersection, a long time ago. Fruit Hey, Tangerine. Try to name some characters from Thomas and Friends. Lemon came back from searching for the suitcase empty-handed, but instead of offering an explanation he just sat down casually in the aisle seat. And now he asks this. Tangerine looks over at Little Manejishi's body in the window seat. Lemon is acting so relaxed that it seems he doesn't want to acknowledge the gravity of their situation. They still have a corpse on their hands, and they haven't got any closer to figuring anything out. But Lemon insists on starting a nonsense conversation. Did you find the bag? Which of the Thomas characters do you know? Name me the most obscure character you can think of. How does that have anything to do with the bag? It doesn't. Lemon juts out his chin, looking slightly peeved. Why are we even worrying about the damn bag? Guess he didn't find it. It's been five years since Tangerine teamed up with. Lemon. He was an ideal partner for their sort of rough trade from there.
Standpoint of physical ability and the fact that no matter what kind of trouble they got into he never panicked, always kept his cool, you could almost say he was emotionless, but on the other hand he was terrible with details, was irresponsible and sloppy. And even worse, when he made a mistake he was quick to spout excuses, he never wanted to own up to his own failures. Like now, when they're facing a situation that's getting steadily more serious, his attitude is hey, why worry about it? He ignores the facts, actually tries to forget them. Tangerine knows all too well that it'll always be his job to clean up Lemon's mess. Trying to change that would be like pissing in the wind. Gordon, says Tangerine with a sigh. He's a character, right? Gordon. One of Thomas's trained friends. Oh come on. Gordon's one of the most well-known characters. Like basically a main character. The challenge is to try to name an obscure character. What do you mean, the challenge? Tangerine looks up at the ceiling. Dealing with Lemon is harder than doing a job. Fine, whatever. You tell me. Give me a sample answer. Lemon's nostrils twitch as he struggles to control his pride. Well, I suppose I'm looking for an answer like Sir Handel, formerly known as Falcon. Is that one of the characters? Ned would work too. There sure are a lot of trains. Tangerine has no choice but to play along. He's not a train, he's a construction vehicle. Who's not a train? You're losing me. Tangerine looks past the body out the window at the scenery. A mammoth apartment building flies by. Hey, he says firmly to his partner, who is now humming a little tune as he flips through a magazine. You don't want to own up to your mistake. I get it. But now's not the time to relax. You hear me? Menegishi's son is no longer breathing. His body's getting cold. And the suitcase has disappeared. We, we're like good for nothing kids someone sent to the grocery store, but we didn't get the vegetables and we lost the wallet. The grocery store. I can never follow your explanations. Basically, we are fucked. Yeah, I know, three words that describe our current situation. It doesn't look like you know. That's why I'm reminding you. We should be more worried, alright? Or no, I'm plenty worried, it's you who should be more worried. I'll ask you again. You didn't find the bag, did you? Nope. For some reason Lemon seems pleased with himself. Tangerine is about to berate him again when Lemon adds, that little punk lied to me and sent me on a wild goose chase. A little punk lied to you? What are you talking about? The man with the bag you're looking for went that way, he said, and he seemed like a good kid, so I believed him, I walked all the way to the end of the hay aid looking for this guy. Maybe the kid didn't lie to you. Someone's definitely got the bag, and maybe the kid really did see the guy. Could be that you just didn't find him. It's weird though, I don't know how a bag that size could just disappear. Did you check in all the bathrooms? Basically. Basically. What do you mean, basically? Tangerine can't help raising his voice. When he realizes Lemon isn't kidding it only makes him matter. It doesn't count unless you check all of them. Whoever has the bag could be hiding in one. If the toilet's occupied I can't check inside, now can I? Tangerine can't even bring himself to heave a sigh. There's no point in checking if you don't check them all. I'll go myself. He looks at his watch. Five minutes until the train pulls into Omiya. Station. Shit. What's wrong? Why shit? We're almost at Omiya. Minejishi's man will be waiting for us. Minejishi was suspicious of everyone, didn't trust anyone, probably because he had been running an underworld organization for so long. He firmly believed that when someone has a chance to betray you, they will, guaranteed. That's why even when he hires someone to do a job he makes sure he can keep tabs on them so they don't stab him in the back. With this job, he was concerned that Tangerine and Lemon would turn on him, that they'd take the money and run. 
or that they might re-kidnap his son and take him somewhere to re-ransom him. I'll be keeping a close eye on you too, he said at their last meeting, telling them to their faces that he didn't trust them. He'll have one of his underlings waiting for them at station stops along the way, to make sure that Tangerine and Lemon are actually on the train to Moriaka with his son, that it doesn't look like they're up to anything funny. Of course when he told Tangerine and Lemon this, they had zero intention of betraying him, they planned to simply get the job done as ordered, so they had no problem with it. By all means keep an eye on us, they said genially. I never thought things would go like this. Accidents happen. There's even a song about it in Thomas and Friends. It goes, accidents happen, just don't take it all to heart. You should take it to heart at least a bit. But Lemon seems not to have heard Tangerine, because he starts singing the song happily, adding snippets of commentary, it's so true, Thomas and Friends is really pretty deep. Hey, wait a minute. He finally looks up at Tangerine. Menegishi's guy is waiting for us on the platform. Think he's gonna get on the train? I wonder. They didn't get any details. Could be he's just going to stay on the platform and check on us through the window. If that's how it is, Lemon says, leaning forward and pointing to the corpse. By the window, we just make it look like this one's asleep, we wave and smile, and the guy never knows the difference. Tangerine is instinctively reluctant about Lemon's optimistic proposal, but he can see how it might work. It actually could work, as long as Menegishi's man doesn't get on the train. I mean, if the kid's sitting right here they'd have no reason to guess he was dead, right? You could be right. I wouldn't guess that either. Right. So, there you go, he'll never know the difference. But if for some reason he suspects something, he might get on the train. The train only stops at Omiya for like a minute. He won't have time to make a leisurely inspection. Hmm, Tangerine tries to imagine what sort of orders he would give if he were Menegishi. I bet the guy is supposed to stay on the platform, check up on us through the window, and if he thinks something's up he'll give Menegishi a call. Boss, your boy looked like shit. Passed out, must have got pretty drunk. Ha. Huh. And then what do you think will happen? Menegishi would work out that his son isn't drunk and start to wonder if something funny was going on. You think he'd figure that out? Big shots like him have a sixth sense with these kinds of things. Then I guess he'd have a whole gang of his men waiting for us when we make the next stop at Sendai. They'd have no problem piling on the train and nabbing us. What if we steal the phone from the guy who's supposed to call in to report? If he doesn't get in touch with Menegishi then Menegishi won't be angry with us. This kid isn't dead until it gets out that he is. Someone like Menegishi will have more ways to get in touch with his men than just a phone. Like foot messengers. For some reason Lemon seems taken with the idea and repeats it a few times, yeah, he'll have foot messengers, he's gotta have those. Like you know those digital billboards. Maybe his guy could write a message on one of those. It could say, your son has been killed. Lemon. Blinks several times that tangerine. You serious? I'm joking. Your jokes are dumb. But he seems pretty excited by the idea. We should try that though, next time we finish a job let's use the big screen at a baseball stadium to make our report to the client, job done, great success. I don't see why we would ever do that. Because it'd be funny. Lemon grins like a little kid. Then he pulls a piece of paper from his pocket and starts to write on it with a pen that he's produced from somewhere. Here, take this. He holds it out to Tangerine, who takes it. It's the supermarket giveaway ticket. No, look at the back, says Lemon, so Tangerine flips it over to find a drawing of a train with a round face. It's hard to say whether the picture is well done or not. What the hell's this? It's Arthur. I mean, I wrote his name down too. A shy maroon-colored train. Very diligent in his work, he's proud of the fact that he's never had a single accident. 
you know, zero accidents, perfect record. He's trying hard to keep it up. I didn't have a sticker of him, so I drew him for you. And why are you giving me this? Because he's never had an accident. It'll be like a good luck charm. Not even a child would put their faith in something so flimsy, but Tangerine is too exasperated to fight about it, so he just folds it in half and shoves it into his rear pocket. Although, eventually Thomas tricks Arthur and he does have an accident. Then what good is he? But Thomas says something smart. And what's that? Records are made to be broken. Not a very nice thing to say to someone whose personal record you've just broken. Thomas sounds like a real jerk. Nanao. Nanao is back in the first row of car four. According to what Maria told him, the owner of the bag is in car three. He didn't like being so close, but he felt that anywhere on the train was too close, so the simplest thing to do would be to sit in his ticketed seat. He thinks about lemon and tangerine. Are they the ones looking for the bag? He has a feeling of his seat sinking into the floor and the ceiling collapsing down on him. The two of them are cold and ruthless, violent in both outlook and method. He remembers the portly go-between telling him that. He had considered moving the suitcase somewhere closer to his seat, like to the trash receptacle panel in the gangway between cars 4 and 3, but decided against it. If he were to move it there was a good chance someone might spot him. It seemed best to keep it where it was. It'll be all right, it'll work out fine. He keeps telling himself this. No more unforeseen. Developments. Oh really? The other self inside him whispers tauntingly. Whenever you do anything, there are always twists and turns you never imagined, it says. Hasn't it always been that way, your whole life? Ever since you were kidnapped on the way home from junior school. The snack trolley rolls by and he signals to the attendant. I'd like an orange juice. Sold out. We usually have it, but just now we ran out. Nanao is impassive. I should have guessed, he almost says to her. He's used to this kind of low-grade bad luck. Every time he goes to buy shoes they're always sold out of his size and the color he likes. When he gets in line to pay, the next line over always moves much faster. When he kindly lets an elderly person get on a lift before him, he steps on and then the overweight alarm goes off. It's part of his daily routine. He asks for a sparkling water and pays. You're always so jumpy and paranoid, it's like you bring bad luck on yourself, Maria once said to him. You need to relax. When you think you might get worked up, have some tea, take some deep breaths, practice tracing Chinese characters with your finger on your palm. Do something to calm yourself down. I'm not jumpy because I have a nervous nature or because I get stuck in my own head or anything. It's purely from experience. I've had rotten luck my whole life, he replied. He opens the can of sparkling water and takes a gulp. The tingling bite shoots through his mouth, making him swallow quickly and sending the fluid down the wrong pipe. I hid the bag. We'll be at Omiya soon. If I just keep calm it'll be done soon, and basically according to plan, other than the fact that I'll have got off at Omiya instead of Weno. I'll meet up with Maria, complain to her about how the job turned out not to be so simple, and that'll be that. The more he tells himself this, the more anxious he becomes. Nanao reclines his seat and tries to relax. He takes a breath, opens his left hand and starts to practice tracing Chinese characters with his right finger. But it's unexpectedly ticklish, and his hand reflexively jerks away. Which knocks his can of sparkling water over. The can rolls with a cheerful clatter across the floor to the other end of the car, propelled by the movement of the train. Nanao springs up and chases after it. He wasn't so optimistic as to hope that the can would come to a stop, but even he is surprised by how it skitters erratically left and right. He scrambles around, bending over to grab at it, apologizing to the other passengers, generally making a scene. It finally slows down, and Nanao swoops in and seizes it. Sighing, 
he starts to stand when he feels a sharp pain in his ribs. A groan escapes his lips. That's it, they got me. Probably the owner of the bag. A cold sweat wells up. But then he hears an old woman's voice, pardon me, young man, and he knows it's not an assassin. Just a diminutive granny. It looks like she was trying to get up and thrust out her cane for support, not noticing Nanao crouched down in front of her and catching him in the ribs with the end. It must have hit a particularly vulnerable spot because it's surprisingly painful. Excuse me, she says, making a mighty effort to hoist herself into the aisle, paying very little attention to Nanao other than to make sure he knows she wants to get by. If I could just pass. She hobbles off. He leans on a nearby seat for support, massaging his rib and trying to catch his breath. It hurts too much for him to just push past it and he writhes uncomfortably. As he squirms he notices the man in the seat behind the one he's holding. Same age as him, or maybe a little older, wearing a suit that makes Nanao think he's a straight-laced company employee. He can imagine the guy being good at numbers, accounting or finance or something like that. Are you alright? The man looks concerned. I'm fine. Nanao tries to stand up straight to show that he is indeed fine, but a stabbing pain jolts him and he crumples over, crashing down into the seat next to the man. I guess it hurts a little. I had a little collision with that woman was trying to get this can. That was bad luck. Well, I'm used to bad luck. You always have bad luck. Nanao glances at the book the man's holding. Must be a travel guide, since there are lots of pictures of hotels and food. The pain finally starts to subside and Nanao is about to get up when he has the urge to talk more. For example, he says to the man, when I was eight I was kidnapped. The man raises his eyebrows in surprise at the sudden revelation, but he also smiles slightly. Is your family rich? I wish. Nanao shakes his head. We were about as far from rich as you can get. The only clothes my parents bought for me were my school uniform, and I was always jealous of the toys that my friends' parents bought for them. I was so frustrated I would chew on my fingers. There was another kid in my class, a rich kid who had the exact opposite situation as me. He had all the toys, what seemed like an unlimited allowance, tons of manga and action figures. He was what you'd call a lucky guy. My lucky friend. One time my lucky friend said to me, your family's poor, so you should try to be either a football star or a criminal. I see, the man murmurs. He looks like he's really feeling sympathy for the young Nanao. There are definitely kids for whom that's true. I was one of them. Pretty limited range of options, become a pro footballer or choose a life of crime, but I was an obedient kid and I thought he was smart, so I did both. Both? Football, and. The man raises his eyebrows again and cocks his head. And crime. My first crime was stealing a football. I practiced football and stealing all the time and got pretty good at both. It ended up shaping the course of my life, so in a way I owe that lucky friend a debt of gratitude. Nanao is surprised at himself for opening up to a stranger when he's normally cagey, but there's something about this man, kind-seeming but somehow inert, that makes him seem like he'd be a willing listener. What was I going to tell you about? Nanao searches for a moment, then remembers. That's right, my kidnapping. Am I really going to talk about this? Your lucky friend seems like a much more likely candidate for being kidnapped, says the man. Yes. Nanao's voice goes up in pitch. That's exactly right. They took me by accident. They thought I was him. I mean the kidnappers. I was walking home together with my rich friend. But I lost at rock paper scissors so I was carrying his bag for him. He had a different bag from the rest of us. A special bag? Yeah, something like that. Custom made for rich folks. 
Nanao chuckles. And I was carrying it, so they took me. What a mess. I kept telling them I wasn't the rich one, they had the wrong kid, but they didn't believe me. But eventually you were rescued. I escaped. The kidnappers demanded a ransom from the parents of Nanao's lucky. Friend, but the parents didn't take it seriously. Which makes sense, because. Their son was safe at home with them. The kidnappers were furious, and started to treat Nanao more and more cruelly. He kept insisting he wasn't the kid they were looking for, until they eventually listened to him. They called his parents, figuring that as long as they got at least some money it didn't matter where it came from. My father gave the kidnappers a piece of unassailable logic. What was that? A man cannot give what he hasn't got. Aha! That upset the kidnappers, they told my father he was a terrible parent, but I understood what he was saying. A man really can't give what he hasn't got. He may have wanted to save his son, but he didn't have the money to do it. There was nothing he could do. I realized that I would have to save myself. So I escaped. The compartments of the storage cabinet in his mind start swinging open, thwack, then closing again, thwack. The scenes from the past that he glimpses inside may have been covered in dust but they maintain a vividness, scenes from his childhood that nevertheless seem immediate and tangible. The carelessness of the kidnappers, his youthful energy and determination, the well-timed lowering of a railway crossing arm and arrival of a bus. He remembers feeling a wash of relief when the bus pulled away coupled with fear about not having any money to pay the fare. But he did it, he escaped all on his own, Nanao the eight-year-old. Thwack, thwack, more cabinet doors fly open inside his mind. By the time he warns himself that there may be memories he doesn't want to dredge up, it's too late, a door that should have stayed closed is already open. He catches sight of another little boy, eyes pleading, saying help me. What's wrong? The man in the suit picks up on the change in Nanao. Just some trauma, Nanao answers, using the word Maria had teased him with. There was another boy who was kidnapped, too. He didn't get out though. Who was he? I never knew. It was true. All he knew was that the other boy was being held with him. It was like some sort of storehouse for kidnapped children. The unfamiliar boy with the buzz cut realized Nanao was going to escape on his own. Help me, he had said. But Nanao didn't help him. Thought he might slow you down. I don't remember why I didn't do it. Might have just been an instinctive thing. I don't even think I thought about it. What happened to him? No idea, Nanao answers honestly. He became my personal trauma. I don't really want to think about it. I wonder why I did, he muses, closing the cabinet of memory. If he could, he would lock it shut and throw away the key. What about the kidnappers? They were never caught. My father never even filed a report with the police. Said it would be more trouble than it was worth, and I didn't particularly care. I was just proud that I escaped. That was how I learned I could do things for myself. What made me tell you this story in the first place? He finds it truly bizarre that he felt moved to talk on and on like this. Like a robot that had its talk button pushed. Oh, ever since I was kidnapped, my whole life's just been one mishap after another. When I was taking my high school entrance exam, even though I studied so hard, the kid in the next seat kept sneezing, and I ended up failing. He disturbed your concentration. No, no. On one huge sneeze a huge gob of his snot or phlegm or whatever came flying at me and landed on my answer sheet. I freaked out and tried to wipe it off, which smeared all the answers I had worked so hard to fill in. Even my name was illegible. Nanao's family couldn't afford to pay for his school so he needed to get a good enough score to win a scholarship, but thanks to some random kid's runny nose his chances were ruined. Nanao's parents never got too emotional about anything, though, so they weren't particularly angry or distraught. 
you really do have bad luck. Wash your car and it rains. Except for when you wash your car in the hope of bringing rain. What's that mean? It's that Murphy's Law they used to talk about on TV. Story of my life. Oh, right, Murphy's Law. I remember when the book came out. If you ever see me in line for a cash register, go to the next line over. Whichever one I'm not in will move much faster. I'll remember that. Nanao's phone buzzes. He checks the caller ID, Maria. He has a mixed feeling of relief and irritation at the interruption to this unusual conversation. That hit I took in the ribs feels a little better now. Thanks for listening. I didn't do anything special, the man says politely. There's nothing the least perturbed about his expression, but it's not quite relaxed either. It's as if the plug was pulled on a key emotional circuit. I think you might just be good at getting people to talk, Nanao opines. Anyone ever tell you that? But, the man seems to think he's being criticized. But I didn't do. Anything. Kind of like a priest who gets you talking just by being there. You're like a walking confessional booth, or maybe a walking priest. I think most priests walk. Anyway, I'm just a plain old instructor at an exam prep school. The words follow Nanao as he walks off into the gangway. He puts the phone to his ear and immediately hears Maria snap, took you long enough to answer. I was in the toilet, he says loudly. Well, aren't you just having a grand old time? Although with your luck the toilet was probably out of paper or you got piss all over your hands. I won't deny it. What's up? He hears what he thinks is Maria's annoyed breathing, though it could also be the thrum of the Shinkansen. He stands atop the coupling that connects the cars. The layered plates move like the joint of a living creature. Oh, what's up, he says. You seem awfully relaxed. The train's almost at Omiya. Make sure you get off this time. What did you do with the big bad wolf's body? Don't remind me about him. His legs sway with the train but he manages to keep his balance. Well, even if the body's discovered, I don't imagine anyone could connect his death with you. Exactly, thinks Nanao. Nobody knows much about the wolf, including his real name. He guesses the police will have a tough time even identifying the body. So, what, make sure I get off at Omiya, right? Got it. It'll be fine, there'll be no problem. I just wanted to put a little pressure on you, just in case. Pressure. I just spoke to our client. I told him my star player has the bag but wasn't able to get off at Weno. I mean, I don't think it's a major problem that you're getting off at Omiya, but I figured I should keep him in the loop. It's just good business. Like how they teach new employees to report any problems or cock-ups to their supervisors. Was he angry? He went as white as a sheet. I couldn't see his face, but I could tell the blood was draining from his face. Why would he go white? Nanao could at least understand it if the client was angry. Whereas this reaction gives him a sense of foreboding, a premonition that this is much more than just a simple job. Our client is taking his orders from another client. That is to say, we're subcontractors for a subcontractor. That happens often enough. Indeed it does. But the main client who first ordered the job is a man in Moriaka, name of Manejishi. The train lurches from side to side. Nanao loses his footing and has to grab onto a nearby handhold. He puts the phone back to his ear. Who did you say? I missed that. As soon as he asks, the train enters a tunnel. The view. Out the windows goes dark. A rush of noise envelopes the train, low and loud, like an animal growling. When he was little, Nanao was petrified any time he was on a train that went into a tunnel. He felt like there was a giant monster snuffling around in the dark, bringing its face up to the train, inspecting the passengers for the choicest morsels. He would feel it turn towards him, leering lasciviously, any naughty children, any children ripe for the plucking, 
so he would curl up into a ball and try to remain perfectly still. Now he realizes it was probably residual fear from being mistakenly kidnapped. Back then he thought that if there was any unlucky passenger likely to be taken by the monster it was him. Minejishi. You've heard of him, yes. You must at least know the name. For a moment Nanao doesn't follow what Maria is saying, but then it clicks, and the moment it does his stomach tightens. Minejishi. You mean that Minejishi? I don't know what you mean by that. The one who maybe cut off a girl's arm for being late. Five minutes. Just five minutes late. He's one of those characters who's always popping up in stories we tell to scare young criminals. I've heard rumors. They say he hates it when people don't do their jobs properly. As the words leave his lips Nanao feels a wave of dizziness. Together with the swaying in his legs from the train and it's almost enough to make him topple over. See, says Maria. See what I mean. We're in trouble. We didn't do our job properly. This feels like it isn't really happening. Are you sure the main client is Minejishi? Not a hundred percent, but it definitely feels that way. If it just feels that way, then we don't know for certain. That's true. But our client sounds terrified, like he's worried what Minejishi will do to him. I told him that if you get off at Omiya it won't be that big of a problem, that he should keep calm, nothing to cry about. Do you think Minejishi knows what happened? I mean that I didn't get. Off at Weno. That I didn't do the job right. I don't know. I guess it all depends on how our client handles it. Whether he's too scared to make a report, or if he runs off to confess because he's worried what'll happen if he doesn't. Hey, wasn't there someone who called you with the intel on where the bag was? The detail comes back to Nanao. Right after the Shinkansen left Tokyo Station Maria got word that the suitcase was in the storage area between cars 3 and 4. Which means that the person who gave you the information might still be on the train. Could be. So what? So that person is on my side, on team steal the bag. Right? The thought of having an ally on the train is heartening to Nanao. I wouldn't count on it. That person's job was just to confirm the location of the bag and call me. They probably got off at Weno. He has to admit she's probably right. Well, are you feeling a little nervous? Like you'll be in trouble if you don't do the job right? It was always my intention to do the job right. As he says it Nanao nods. Resolutely. I can't think of anyone else who tries as hard as me to do things right. I mean, depends on your definition of doing things right, but I never had my head in the clouds, I always put one foot in front of the other, I never complained about how poor my parents were, I never gave in to despair, I just stole that football and tried to get better and better at kicking it. I wouldn't be surprised if other people look up to me. You do do the job right. But you're unlucky. I never know what's going to happen. It'll be fine. Of course, he isn't responding to Maria so much as telling himself, insisting on how things are supposed to go. I hid the bag. We're almost at Omiya. When I get off there, the job's over. Minejishi will have no reason to be mad. I hope you're right. But I've learned an important lesson since we started working together, life is full of bad luck, just lying in wait. A job that feels. Like it's impossible to mess up can go unexpectedly wrong. Or even if the job doesn't go wrong, something else terrible can happen. Every time you go out, I discover a new way for things to fall apart. But every time you still say it's a simple job. Which is always true. It's not my fault that trouble follows you around. You could be about to cross a footbridge and try stomping on it just to make extra sure it was stable and you'd end up hitting a bee that was resting on the bridge and it would sting you and you'd fall into the river. It's always like that with you. I bet you've never played golf, right? What? Uh, no, don't. You'd get the ball in the hole, and then you'd reach in to get the ball back, and a rat would pop out and bite your finger. 
That's ridiculous. Why would a rat live in a golf hole? Because you played golf there. I'm telling you. You're a genius at finding ways to mess things up. You should get me a job where the mission is to mess up the job. It would probably go well, Nanao jokes. But Maria doesn't laugh. No, because then you wouldn't mess up. Murphy's Law. Are you talking about Eddie Murphy? But anxiety suddenly clutches at Nanao. I should go and check on the bag. He looks towards the front of the train. Good idea. With you involved, the hidden bag going missing sounds like a distinct possibility. Don't make this any worse, please. Careful. I bet you going to check if the bag is still there will mess something up. Then what the hell am I supposed to do? Nanao wants to scream, but he has to admit that Maria's probably right. The Prince He takes the duct tape off of Kimura's wrists and ankles, setting the man free, but he isn't at all concerned. If Kimura lets his feelings get the better of him, turns violent, it'll put his son in danger. The man knows this by now. He doesn't think the prince is bluffing. He knows that the prince isn't one to lie about something like that. And now the prince is asking for Kimura's help, which suggests that if he does a good job his son might escape danger. There are lots of things Kimura could do to get himself out of his current situation, but the chances that he would willingly put his son's life in danger are extremely slim. As long as a person believes things could still work out, they tend not to try anything desperate. What do you want me to do? Kimura asks sullenly, rubbing his ankles where they had been taped up. It has to be humiliating for him to ask orders from someone he hates, but he's working to suppress his emotions. The prince finds it extremely amusing. We're going to go together to one of the gangways a little further back. You know how there's a trash bin in the wall? The suitcase is in there. It fits in the trash bin. No, I didn't know this either but the wall with the trash is actually a panel and it opens up. And that's where the guy with the black glasses hit it, huh? Okay, so we get the bag, and then what? It's a suitcase, right, so it's not exactly small. We bring it here and keep it by our seats, it'll be seen. The prince nods. The bag isn't that large, but they wouldn't be able to hide it anywhere near the seats. There are two things we could do, he says as they move from their car into the gangway. Then he steps over to the window and turns to face Kimura. The first is to have the conductor hold it. The conductor. Yes. Take the bag to the conductor, explain the situation, and have him hold on to it. I imagine there's a crew room or something where he could store it. If it's in there the owner will never find it. What, you'd say you found a random bag? Or that it fell off the rack? They just make an announcement on the PA and everyone on the train. Would know. You'd have the people who want this suitcase lining up in front of the crew room. I'd come up with a better story than that. Like this is my suitcase, but the man sitting next to me keeps eyeing it and I'm afraid he wants to steal it, so could you please hold on to it until I get off the train, something like that. When he mentions the man sitting next to him, he points at Kimura. Oh, no, that doesn't sound suspicious at all. Not if it comes from an honest-looking school kid like me. Kimura snorts, making a show of disdain for the plan. But it's plain to see that he's realizing the prince probably could con the conductor without too much trouble. Still, if you give the bag to the conductor then you won't have it. I can get it back when we get to Moriaka, and if that seems problematic I can just leave it there. I want to know what's in it, but it's more important that it's hidden. That way I can have influence over the people who want it. What, like with your classmates and the robot cards? Exactly. But I also thought of another thing I could do with it. Which would be to just take the contents. The bag that the man with the black glasses seemed so concerned about has a four digit combination lock. Keep trying different combinations and eventually it'll open. You're gonna try every single possible combination. 
Do you have any idea how many there are? Good luck, kid. Kimura clearly thinks it's a stupid idea cooked up by a child. The prince feels sorry for the man and his inability to escape his prejudices. It won't be me doing it, it'll be you. You'll take it into the bathroom and start trying combinations. Like how I will. Do that in the toilet? No way. The prince bites back his laughter at how easily Kimura loses his cool. Mr. Kimura, I'm getting tired of telling you this over and over again, but if you don't do as I say your son will be in trouble. It'll be much better for you to just take the suitcase into the bathroom and play with the combination lock. Much, much better. If I'm in the toilet for that long the conductor will notice. I'll come by and check the scene every once in a while. If people are lining up I'll let you know. You can come out, wait until it clears, and then go back. In. It's not like you're doing anything wrong by turning the dials on a combination lock. There's all sorts of workable excuses. I'll be turning dials till I die. I got no intention of sitting turning dials until I'm old and gray. The prince starts walking again. He enters the next car, makes his way down the aisle, imagining what Kimura must be thinking as he follows. The man is close behind, staring at the back of the very person who pushed his son off a roof. No doubt he wants to pounce. His desire to do violence is palpable. If the setting allowed for it, he would grab the prince by the arm, pull him close, strangle him to death. But Kimura can't do any of that. It's far too public here in the Shinkansen, but more than that, his son's life hangs in the balance. Just picturing Kimura's teeth-grinding frustration fills the prince with warmth and well-being. Mr. Kimura, he says, glancing back over his shoulder as they pass through. Car number 6. Sure enough, Kimura's face is twisted into an ugly mask at. Having to keep his rage in check. The prince finds the sight delectable. It won't take as long as you think to find the combination. It'll be something between 0099.99, so that's 10,000 possible combinations. Say you try one combination per second, that's 10,000 seconds. About 167 minutes. Less than 2 hours and 50 minutes. And I bet it won't even take that long. You'll probably be able to do more than one per second, and also, you do all that maths in your head? What a clever boy. Kimura says it mockingly, but this just makes him sound even more stupid to the prince. And also, you'd be surprised at how lucky I am. Even when I act more or less randomly, usually it works out for me. I win raffles and things like that all the time. It's always been like that for me, my whole life. It's almost bizarre. So I bet you'll find the right combination relatively quickly. Maybe. Even in the first 30 minutes, somewhere between 0000 and 1800. They emerge into the next gangway. It's deserted. The prince walks right up to the trash bin in the wall. What, here? Kimura steps up beside him. Look. He points at the round protrusion. Push that, then give it a pull and a twist. Kimura does as he's told, extends his hand, pushes, pulls, twists. The panel swings open. He makes a little noise of surprise. The prince leans closer and they look inside together. There it is on the top shelf, the black suitcase. That's it. Go ahead, grab it. Kimura is slightly dazed by the revelation of the secret compartment, but the prince's words snap him back to attention. He reaches in and lifts the bag out. As he lowers it to the floor the prince shuts the panel neatly. Okay, Mr. Kimura, get in there and get opening. The prince points to the toilet door. We should set a signal. If there's a problem, I'll knock. Some other passenger might try knocking, so ours has to be a special one. So, if people are waiting in line and you should come out for a little, I'll knock five times, knock 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 knock. I doubt anyone else would knock. Five times. 
And if someone who looks like trouble is nearby, I'll go. Knock knock, knock. Three times, with a pause. Who do you think might look like trouble? Maybe the man with the black glasses. As he says it the prince pictures the worried looking man. Then he thinks that even if this man accuses him of stealing the bag, he could almost certainly talk his way out of it. Some people are tough to handle, but others are simple. It has a little to do with their smarts and abilities, but it's mostly based on their fundamental character and psychology. People who let themselves get pushed around don't get any savvier as they get older. That's why there will always be opportunities for scammers and con artists. Or the other taller man who was looking for the suitcase. That man seemed more dangerous, like he could get violent at a moment's notice. If someone like that comes along, I'll knock twice, then again. Knock knock, knock. And then what do I do? The prince can't stop himself from smiling. Kimura's already relying on him, looking to him to make the decisions. He almost wants to encourage the man to think for himself. It'll depend on the situation. Just wait inside and stay alert. When the person goes away I'll knock again, just once. And what about if they don't look like they're gonna go away? I'll figure something out. Anyway, I don't think anyone would guess that you're inside trying to figure out the combination, so I doubt they would wait around too long. I gotta say, I didn't expect such a vague plan from you. Kimura intends it as a jab, but the prince doesn't take it to heart. He doesn't see any need for a complex plan. It's more important to be flexible, to keep calm when something happens and choose the next move. All right, Mr. Kimura, you're on. Find that number. Open the case. Ready, set, go. The prince tugs Kimura's sleeve in the direction of the toilet. Hey, don't get all high and mighty with the orders. You think I'm just gonna do whatever you say? I do. If I come back and you're not in the toilet, if you try to run off. Somewhere, I'll just make a phone call. You know, to my friend at the hospital. And that'll be the end of your boy. Aren't phones dangerous? You can do all sorts of things with a phone. Kimura glares with fury but the prince pays him no mind. He just opens the door to the bathroom. Kimura enters grumbling. The lock clicks into place. The prince checks his watch. Almost at Omiya, but still a fair amount of time until Moriaka. He has a feeling they'll have the case open before then. As the prince waits there in the gangway, the door to car 5 towards the rear of the train opens with a sound like a gust of wind. The man with the black glasses steps through. He looks smart in his jean jacket and cargo pants. He has creases next to his eyes that make him look kind, like he smiles often. The prince is careful to look natural as he steps over to the toilet door and knocks twice, then a third time. He tries to make it seem as if he's been waiting a bit to use the toilet but is finally giving up. Then he turns, as if just noticing the man with the black glasses. Oh, hey, he says. Is your friend who drank too much okay? Oh, you again. A trace of irritation creeps onto the man's face, barely noticeable, but the prince doesn't miss it. He thinks I'm a pain, he notes. It's not an uncommon reaction. Some adults are impressed by an honor student, but to some there's nothing in the world as annoying as a high-achieving kid. He passed out. Still sleeping. Drunks sure are trouble, huh? He comes to a stop, scratching his temple. Then he turns towards the bin in the wall, glancing back at the prince as he does. Something wrong, the prince asks solicitously, though he knows exactly what the man wants to do next, check that the bag is still there. He only hid it a short while ago, the prince would have guessed it might be a bit longer before the man came to check on it. He's more nervous than I thought. The prince adjusts his appraisal of the man. Probably the type who starts worrying as soon as he leaves the house about whether he locked the door and turned off the gas. Uh, it's nothing. 
The man clearly wants the prince to leave him alone and go somewhere else. He doesn't lose his temper, but he's agitated. The prince makes a show of looking at his mobile phone, as if a call was coming in. Excuse me, he says, pretending to start talking on the phone, and steps away towards the door. He reasons the man will try to open the panel if he thinks he's not being watched. Sure enough, he registers in his peripheral vision the man's nervous movements in front of the bin. There's a slight clang, probably the panel swinging open. He forces himself not to look, but he can picture the man's shocked face upon discovering that the suitcase is gone. He fights back a smile. You've gotta be kidding me, wails the man. The prince ends his fake phone call and ambles back to the toilet door. When he innocently asks the man again if something's wrong, the man just stands there going pale and gaping at the open panel, not having bothered to close it. Oh wow, the wall opens, the prince says airily. The man pulls at his hair, then takes his glasses off and rubs his eyes. The Gesture is such a cliched pantomime of consternation that the prince wouldn't even expect to see a character in a manga do it, but the man clearly isn't trying to be funny. He's utterly bewildered. The only thing that the prince doesn't understand is what the man says next, I knew it. You knew it? Knew what? Apparently overcome with shock, the man doesn't bother to dissemble. There was a bag in here, the bag you saw me with before, my, my bag, I put it in here. Why would you put it in there? The prince assumes the role of the naive, well-intentioned student. It's a long story. And now it's gone. So what did you mean when you said you knew it? I knew this would happen. He knew it would be stolen. The thought makes the prince a bit uncomfortable. Is he saying he knew I would steal it? The possibility that the man might have seen through his plan seems so unbelievable that he almost accuses the man of lying, but he checks himself. You knew the bag would go missing. Not specifically that, no. If I knew that then I wouldn't have put it in here. Just that something like this always happens. Everything I do ends up going. Wrong. As soon as I think, wow, it would be terrible if that happened, I really. Hope that doesn't happen, it happens. I was thinking I would be in trouble if the bag disappeared, so I came to check on it, and of course it's gone. As he speaks the man seems to edge closer and closer to bursting into tears. Aha, so that's it. The prince is relieved. That sounds tough, he says kindly. You said you'll be in trouble if you lose the bag. Big trouble. Really big trouble. I was supposed to get off at Omiya. Can you not get off if you don't have the bag? The man looks straight at the prince, blinking rapidly. Apparently the possibility had never occurred to him. Then he seems to be imagining what might happen if that was the move he made. I guess I could, if I wanted to live the rest of my life on the run. Whatever's in the bag must be really important. The prince touches his fingers to his mouth in a gesture he knows is hammy, but he calculates it will reinforce the image that he's just a harmless kid. Oh, he says. Pitching his voice up and drawing the syllable out, now that you mention. It, I saw it just a little while ago. Your bag, I mean. What? The man's eyes pop, wh where? When I was on my way to the bathroom. There was a man with a black suitcase. He was tall, wearing a jacket. His hair was kind of long. The man with the black glasses listens with a suspicious air, but after a moment his face turns into a scowl. Lemon or tangerine? It's not clear why the man is naming fruits. Which way did he go? I didn't see. Oh. The man looks back and forth towards the front and back of the train, trying to decide where he should begin his search. Which way do you think he went? Your gut instinct. Ha. Huh. Why would he care about my gut instinct? Everything I do goes wrong. If I go towards car 6, then whoever has the bag will probably have gone the other way, and if I start in car 5, 
then they'll be in the other direction. Whatever I choose, it'll get turned around. Turned around by whom? The man swallows, at a momentary loss. Then he snaps, by someone. Okay. Like maybe there's someone looking down on us, pulling the strings on all our lives. I don't believe that, says the prince. No one's pulling any strings. There's no god of fate, and if by some chance there is a god, I feel like he just tossed all us humans into a display case and forgot about us. So you're saying my bad luck isn't God's fault? It's hard to explain. Say you have a board resting at an angle, and you drop some BBs or pebbles on it. Each one will roll in its own direction, find its own course down, but that's not because anyone set the course for it or changed its direction partway down. Where it falls depends on the speed and shape, so that it would naturally go that way on its own. So what you're saying is I'm just unlucky by nature, it'll never change, no matter what I do, no matter how hard I struggle. The prince was hoping his words would needle the man, make him lose. His temper, but he didn't expect his reaction to be so completely dejected. What's your favorite number? Why? The man seems thrown off by the question. But despite his confusion he answers clearly, seven. It's the nana in my name, Nanao, seven tails. Although you'd think seven would be a lucky number. Then why not try car number seven? The prince points to the front of the train. I feel like that'll end up being the wrong way, the man says. I'll go in the other direction. He starts towards the rear. The train will arrive at Omiya any moment. I hope you find it. The prince steps closer to the toilet door and knocks once. The bag you're looking for was in here all along, but you just walked on by. You really are unlucky. Fruit The melody signaling the train's imminent arrival at Omiya starts to play in the carriage, followed by a station announcement. In the next seat over, Lemon is grinning. Feeling nervous? A little, yeah. Aren't you? Menegishi's man will be waiting for them at Omiya. Nope. Not really. Tangerine sighs. I'm jealous. It must be great to be so simple-minded. You know, it's your fault we're in this mess. Sure, why not, Lemon says, munching on some crackers though it's not all my fault. I mean, yeah, it's definitely probably my fault we lost the bag, but the fact that this kid is dead isn't on you or me, it's on him. Him. Tangerine looks at the corpse by the window. You mean it's his fault he's dead? Yeah. He shouldn't have just gone and died. Selfish. You don't think so? He didn't even leave any clues. The Shinkansen starts to drop speed. Tangerine stands up. Hey, where are you going? Lemon sounds worried. We're pulling into Omiya. I have to report to Menegishi's guy, tell him everything's going smoothly. I'm going to wait by the door. You're not gonna get off and make a run for it, right? I hadn't thought of that, realizes Tangerine. Running would probably just make things worse. If you run, I'll call Menegishi, I'll tell him it's all your fault, I'll offer to bring you in. You know, I'll lick his boots, I'll wag my tail, oh, Mr. Menegishi, I'll get that bastard tangerine, just please forgive me, spare me my life. Like that. Somehow I can't picture it. He squeezes past the still-seated lemon and steps into the aisle. The train's brakes are kicking in. Tangerine sees a stadium out the left-hand window. It looks like a fortress, overwhelmingly large and somehow unreal. To the right a department store slides by. Don't be too confident, Lemon says from behind, having followed. That's in the Thomas song too. Your best plans can go wrong if you get too confident, he sings, if you don't concentrate on what you're doing, accidents happen, just like that. Sounds like a load of sunny crap to me, Tangerine says. Anyway, you're the one who needs to listen to the message of that song. I'm never overconfident. My confidence is exactly where it should be, no more, no less. 
I mean the part about concentrating on what you're doing. You do everything sloppily, everything's a chore to you. No powers of concentration, no attention span, hey, don't tell me I've got no attention span. I'll give you an example. Take Thomas and friends. For fuck's sake. There are two characters named Oliver, did you know that? There's the tank engine that Douglas rescued, and then there's the shovel car. Most people only think of the tank engine when they say Oliver, but strictly speaking there are two Olivers. So what? So, I'm saying that I pay attention to things like that. My attention's great. Yeah, yeah. Tangerine waves him away. He wants to point out that if that's the kind of thing Lemon cares about, there are three characters named Nikolai in Anna Karenina, but he knows all too well that Lemon will just spout some nonsense, like there's no Anna in Thomas but there is an Annie and do you realize that Karenina sounds like a combination of Car and Nina but there's no Nina in Thomas either. The train pulls into Omiya station. As Tangerine enters the gangway an announcement says that the doors on the left side will open. He positions himself accordingly. The platform slides by on the left. A scattering of people await the train's arrival. Tangerine doesn't know what Menegishi's man will look like, or even if it's just one man. Am I even gonna find this guy? He wonders uncertainly, but... At that very moment, just as the train is easing to a stop, he glimpses a man. Through the window, a man who obviously has nothing to do with the society of law-abiding, workaday people, clearly someone whose world is the back streets and dark alleys. There he is. The man is tall with slick back hair. He wears a black suit and a loud blue shirt, no tie. He's only visible for a moment as the train floats along its last few meters, so Tangerine doesn't get a clear look at the man's face. With a sound like an exhalation, the door trembles, then opens. Tangerine steps onto the platform without any hesitation. He turns and sees the man in the suit and blue shirt step up to the Shinkansen and bring his face up to the window, his hands framing his eyes to make a shade. He peers inside the train, ignoring the two young women who seem scandalized by his peeping. He must be checking up on Menegishi's kid, seated across the aisle by the opposite window. Yo, Tangerine calls out. The man turns, scowling. Tangerine sees now. That this guy isn't some flashy punk. He has a dignified bearing, in his forties. If he were a normal working citizen he'd probably be in management. Actually kind of handsome. Sharp look in the eyes, no visible paunch. He electrifies the air around him just by standing there, making Tangerine's nerve stand on end. What can I do for you, buddy? The man resumes looking through the train window, tossing a few more glances towards Tangerine. I'm Tangerine. I guess you're the fellow Menegishi sent to make sure my partner and I have his son. Blue shirt scowl eases with recognition, but a moment later his face turns grave again. Everything going smoothly. More or less. You know, three men squeezed in together isn't the most comfortable. He points at the window and looks in. Lemon, still in his seat, notices them and waves his hand with childish enthusiasm. All Tangerine can do is pray, don't mess this up. Is he sleeping? Blue Shirt jerks his thumb towards the window. Who, the kid? Yeah, when we found him he was tied to a chair and hadn't had any sleep. He must be worn out. Tangerine tries his utmost to keep his. Voice sounding natural. The train won't be stopping at the station much. Longer. He needs to get back on. That tired, huh? Blue Shirt crosses his arms, a dubious look on his face as he peers back in once more. The young women make pained faces and contort their bodies to avoid his gaze. Lemon just keeps waving. Hey, I was wondering something about Menegishi, Tangerine says. He doesn't want this guy to look too hard at the dead rich kid. You mean Mr. Menegishi? Blue Shirt is basically pressing his nose against the window. 
His mild tone carries an undeniable authority. Sure, Mr. Manejishi. Is Mr. Manejishi as rough as they say? I mean I've heard all kinds of rumors, but I don't know what's really what. He's not rough if people do their jobs properly. People who don't do their jobs properly tend to find his treatment rough. Which is perfectly fair, wouldn't you say? The melody signaling the train's departure starts to play on the platform. Tangerine tries to hide his relief. Guess that's my signal. Stay cool now. Sounds like it. Blue Shirt steps away from the window and looks straight. At Tangerine. Tell Manejishi we're on top of it. Mr. Manejishi. Tangerine turns on his heel and heads back to the Shinkansen door. Bought ourselves a little time, at least until we get to Sendai, he reassures himself, but he feels Blue Shirt's eyes boring a hole in his back. Keep it together. His hand floats to his rear pocket, where he feels the giveaway entry Lemon gave him, the one with the drawing of the train that's never had an accident. Wonder if this thing works. Oh, hey, Blue Shirt calls from behind. Tangerine halts in mid-stride, with one foot already on the train. Trying to act natural, he steps his other foot into the train and turns round. What's up? You've got the suitcase, right? Blue Shirt's expression doesn't show any doubt or suspicion. He just seems to be doing his administrative duty, checking an item off his list. Tangerine attempts to keep his breathing steady. Of course. And you didn't do anything stupid like store it somewhere you couldn't. Keep an eye on it. No, it's right there by our seats. Tangerine turns slowly and steps further into the train, just as the door slides shut. He re-enters car number three and returns to his seat. His eyes meet Lemon's. No sweat, Lemon says, giving a playful thumbs up. Cut it out, Tangerine hisses. He's probably still watching. Lemon turns reflexively to the window, but his movements are jerky, making him look nervous. Before Tangerine can scold him again he follows Lemon and looks towards the window. Blue shirt is just on the other side, staring in at them. Lemon waves again. Tangerine can't tell if he's just being paranoid but it seems that Blue Shirt looks more skeptical than before. Come on, man, don't push it. He suspects something's up. Tangerine tries to move his lips as little as possible. Relax. The train's leaving. Once a train starts moving no one can stop it. Unless you're Sir Topham Hat, forget about it. As the train inches forward, Blue Shirt stares penetratingly in at them. Tangerine gives a brief wave, like you would to a co-worker. Blue Shirt opens one hand and twitches it as if to say see you later, following along as the train departs. Then his face goes rigid and his eyes widen, which makes Tangerine's brow furrow in consternation. What happened? He wonders, then turns his head and sees something he doesn't quite believe, Lemon lifting up little Manejishi's dead hand and waving it, like he was playing with a giant doll. With the kid's head against the window and his body slumped on the wall the angle of the waving hand looks completely bizarre. What the fuck are you doing? Tangerine wrenches Lemon's arm away. Which makes the body lurch towards Lemon. The head flops forward, chin to chest. It does not look at all like someone sleeping peacefully. Frantic, Tangerine tries to prop the body up. Oh shit. Even Lemon seems concerned. The Shinkansen picks up speed and Tangerine looks back at the receding platform. Blue Shirt's face is deadly serious as he lifts his phone to his ear. They somehow manage to get the body upright and stable. Tangerine and Lemon collapse back into their seats simultaneously. We're fucked. Tangerine can't help stating the obvious. Lemon just starts to sing quietly, accidents happen, don't take it a all so hr No no. A.S. Nanao watches Omiya Station disappear into the distance, he wonders vaguely what the hell is going on. There's a smokescreen swirling around inside his head, preventing his thoughts from circulating. It seems like he should be doing something besides going back to his seat, 
so he stays in the gangway and stares at his phone. He knows he should call. Maria, but he can't quite work himself up to it. But he also knows that it'll only be a matter of time before she calls him. He makes up his mind and dials. She answers before it even rings, like she was hovering over her phone waiting to pounce. It gives Nanao a heavy feeling. Even Maria, usually so optimistic and flexible, is apparently on edge. Probably because she knows how dangerous Manejishi is. What train did you catch back to Tokyo? There's a forced casualness in her voice though she's dying to confirm his homeward status. Same train as before. I'm on the Hay 8. He says it so matter-of-factly that it almost sounds flippant. He also has to speak louder than usual due to the noise of the tracks in the gangway. Maria's voice is difficult to make out. What do you mean? You haven't got to Omiya yet. We passed Omiya. I'm still on the Hay 8. Maria falls silent in momentary confusion. But then she heaves a sigh. Guessing from her previous experiences with Nanao that something's gone. Wrong. Yeah, I thought that might happen, but I didn't really think it would happen. Guess I shouldn't underestimate you. The bag's gone. So I couldn't get off. Didn't you hide the bag? Yeah. Now it's gone missing. Time for you to get married. Sorry. To the god of bad luck. You two should really get married at this point, since you're so cozy. I should be pleased, but I'm just too pissed off. Why should you be pleased? Because I was right that you wouldn't be able to get off at Omiya. It's satisfying to be right, you know. But in this case I'm just depressed. Nanao doesn't appreciate her mockery, and he considers jabbing back, but he doesn't want to waste the time and energy. Most important is figuring out how to handle their immediate predicament. Next question. I get that you don't know where the bag is. I'm not happy about it, but I accept the facts of the situation. But why didn't you get off at Omiya? If the bag's missing that means somebody probably took it. Now the Shinkansen stopped at Omiya, so I'd say there are two possibilities. One, that the person who took it is still on the train, or two, that they took the bag and got off. Right. Nanao had considered this in the moments before the train pulled into Omiya, as if he was scrambling to put together a rush construction job, should he get off the train, or stay on and keep looking for the bag. So why did you decide not to get off at Omiya? Two options, and I had to pick one. I went with the option that seemed to have better odds, even if only a little. He had tried to anticipate which option would give him a higher chance of getting the suitcase back. If he had got off at Omiya and tried searching. For whoever had it, he wasn't sure he'd be able to find them. If whoever it. Was got on a different train or slipped off into the streets, there wouldn't be much he could do. On the other hand, if he stayed on the train, and the person with the bag was also on board, there was at least some chance he could get it back. The thief wouldn't be able to get off for a while, so if Nanao went through the train with a fine-tooth comb he might very well be able to catch them. Based on these calculations, Nanao decided it would be better to stay on the train. In no small part it was also the fact that as long as he remained on the train he could reasonably say he was still on the job. If Manejishi got in touch to check on the status, Maria would be able to say that Nanao was on the train, fighting the good fight. At least he hoped that was the case. He did get off for a minute, though. He thought he should at least scan the platform to make sure no one was running off with the bag. If someone looked like a likely suspect he would have chased them. Given how long the train was and the curve of the platform he couldn't see all the way to the front, but he was resolved to do what he could, and he stood there swiveling his head back and forth, watching. A few cars back, maybe car three or four, two people caught his eye. The taller one wore black clothes and had long hair for a man. Tangerine, or maybe lemon. Whichever one it was, the tall man stood with his back to Nanao, facing someone else who was apparently waiting on the platform. 
an older guy, with a vivid blue shirt. His hair was pulled back in a way that made Nanao think of an old lady's hairstyle in a foreign film. Kind of endearing. The taller man got back on the train. Nanao glimpsed his profile and couldn't tell if it was Lemon or Tangerine or even someone else entirely. The man in the blue shirt stayed on the platform and leaned towards the train, peering in at the window. It didn't look like he was seeing the taller man off. In fact it wasn't at all clear what the blue shirt man was doing. All Nanao could say for sure was that it was car 3 and not 4. He had counted. You said the bag's owner was in car 3, right? Nanao checks with. Maria after recounting what he had seen on the platform at Omiya. Yeah. At least that's what I was told. And you're saying you spotted tangerine or lemon in car 3? Someone who looks like he could be one of the two of them. Which gives more strength to the theory that they were the bag's original owners. I think it's a little more certain than a theory. Sorry, what was that? He's paying attention, but it's difficult to hear her. The Shinkansen is known for being a smooth ride, but the swaying can be intense in the gangway, he has to focus on keeping steady, and he's distracted by the incessant racket of the tracks. It's as if the train is trying to prevent him from connecting with Maria, his only ally either way, I decided that staying on the train gave me a better chance to get the bag back. Well, you're probably right about that. So you think that the fruit twins stole it back from you? I stole it from them first. Then they stole it back from me. That seems the... Most likely. If there were a third party involved things would start to get complicated. I really hope that isn't the case. If that's what you hope, then it probably is the case. Come on, stop trying to freak me out, please. His hopes and dreams never come true, but everything he fears always does. I'm not trying to freak you out. This is just the story of your life. The god of bad luck is totally in love with you. Or the goddess, I guess. Nanao tries to steady himself against the swaying. Is the goddess of bad luck good looking? Do you really want to know? I guess I'll pass. Okay, but really, what are we going to do? He can hear her anxiety plainly enough. What indeed? How about this? As she says this the train bucks and he loses his balance, then catches himself. For starters, you steal the bag back from the two fruits. How? Doesn't matter how. You just have to do it, no matter what. Get that bag. That's the first order of business. Meanwhile, I'll make something up to tell our client. Like what? Like we have the bag, but you missed getting off at Omiya, and the... Shinkansen doesn't stop again until Sendai so he'll just have to sit tight until... Then. That's what I'll tell him. The important part is that we have the bag. I mean I'll be casual, but I'll make it clear that you're doing your job. You just weren't able to get off the train, unfortunately. That'll probably be good enough. Good enough for what? Good enough to keep Manejishi from flipping out. Makes sense, thinks Nanao. Rather than being the kids sent to the grocery store who don't buy any vegetables, it's better to be the kids who bought the vegetables but got held up on the way home due to roadworks. They'd still seem reliable enough, and probably get in less trouble. By the way, do you think Tangerine and Lemon would recognize you? Maria's voice is tight. She's no doubt starting to imagine a confrontation. Nanao thinks back. I don't think so. We've never worked together. Once I was in a bar and someone pointed them out to me. That's Tangerine and Lemon, baddest guys in the business, he said. I remember thinking they looked dangerous, and actually they ended up tearing the place apart. It was pretty hectic. Well then, the opposite could be true too. Meaning what? Maybe somebody once pointed you out to them. That guy in the black glasses, he's still young but he's by far the unluckiest guy in the biz. So they might recognize your face too. I, that's, but Nanao swallows his words. 
he can't say for sure that it wouldn't have happened. Maria seems to sense what he's thinking. Right? That's exactly the kind of thing that would happen to you. Because you're her favorite, she says knowingly, the dog-faced goddess of bad luck is madly in love with you. Now she's dog-faced. Beggars can't be choosers. Okay, go on, get over to car three. Then Maria lets out a cry of dismay. Maria? What happened? No way. Are you kidding me? Nanao presses his ear against the phone. What happened? I am just so over this, she groans. He hangs up in consternation. Kimura. Why do they gotta make train toilets so nasty? Kimura grimaces as he hunches over the suitcase and fiddles with the lock. The toilet gets cleaned regularly, and isn't particularly dirty, but the whole situation feels repugnant. He's working on the combination lock. Rotates one dial by one digit, tries to open it. It doesn't budge. Next, he flips the dial again, one more digit, tries to open it. Tries again, but it still doesn't cooperate. The Shinkansen sways back and forth rhythmically. The walls of the tiny room start to press in, make him feel like his spirit is being crushed. He thinks back to how he was not too long ago. Couldn't stop drinking, and if he went even a little while without a drink he would get anxious and crabby. More than once Wataru hid all the alcohol in the apartment on his grandparents' instructions, but Kimura just ransacked the place looking for it, and if he didn't find it he'd get desperate, almost ready to drink his hair tonic. He's just glad that he never got violent with Wataru. He knows that if he ever hit his son his remorse would fester in him until it filled his whole body up, killing him dead. And now that he's finally stopped drinking, now that he's clawed his way out of the dark forest of alcoholism, his son's lying in the hospital in a coma. It makes him want to scream. How come now that I beat this thing Wataru? Isn't around to see it? He feels like his new beginning has been robbed of. Meaning. The bucking train tosses his body around. His finger scrapes the dial. He puts pressure on the handle to open the suitcase. But it doesn't open. He's got from 0000 to 0261 and he's already sick of the tedious task. How come I gotta do this bullshit job for that fucking prince? His humiliation and rage mix and mount until he explodes, savagely kicking the toilet bowl. It happens three more times. Each time, he manages to get a hold of himself, telling himself he has to stay calm. Keep calm, make a show of following the prince's orders, wait for my chance. Sooner or later I'll get my chance to punish that little son of a bitch. But before long his nerves start to twist and fray, and he wants to lash out again. Rinse, wash, repeat. A bit earlier the prince gave him a signal. Two knocks, then a third, knock knock, knock. They agreed that meant someone looking for the bag was just outside, maybe the guy in the black glasses. He tried to make out. What was going on outside the door, but all he could really do was keep. Trying combinations. Eventually there was another knock, just one, meaning the guy had left. When he gets the dials to 0500 he reflexively reads it as 5 o'clock, which makes him think of that one evening when he remembered looking at the time just when it displayed 5 o'clock. He was home with Wataru, who was watching a kid's show on TV. Kimura lay sprawled on the couch behind his son, pulling from a bottle of booze. It was a Monday but he was off work so he spent the whole day loafing around drinking. Then at 5 p.m. the doorbell rang. Probably a newspaper subscription guy, he guessed. He usually had Wataru get the door, since most people preferred being greeted by a friendly little kid than by a middle-aged drunk. But that time Kimura went to see who it was. Wataru was into his show, and Kimura felt like he should be getting up soon anyway. There was a kid at the door in school uniform. Kimura couldn't figure out why a schoolboy might be ringing his doorbell and for some reason he thought it might be a pitch for a religious group. We're already saved, thanks. Sir. 
The boy's tone was familiar, definitely not how you would talk to someone you're just meeting for the first time, but it wasn't a rude familiar. It was vulnerable. The kid looked like he was on the verge of tears. What do you want? The alcohol in Kimura's system made it feel like he was seeing something that wasn't really there, a mirage of a schoolboy. But then he remembered, he had seen this kid before, it was coming back to him. This was one of the boys he had crossed paths with twice before. The kid was gangly with a pale face and an oblong head that made Kimura think of a cucumber. His nose jutted out crookedly. What the hell are you doing here? Sir, I need your help. Oh come on, seriously. Kimura wanted to close the door, wanted nothing to do with this, but it also bothered him enough to want to know what was going on. He stepped outside and grabbed the kid's collar roughly. Jerked him forward and threw him down. The cucumber-headed kid toppled. Over and sat on the ground sniveling. Kimura didn't feel sorry for him. How'd you know where I live? You're one of those kids I've seen around. How'd you find me here? I followed you, he wailed, but it was a resolute wail. You followed me. When I go for exam prep lessons I ride by here on my bike. I saw you walking one time and I followed you back. That's how I know where you live. How come sexy chicks never follow me? Or maybe that's what you're after. You like older guys or something? Kimura cracked a dumb joke to cover his fear, his sense that this kid was an ill omen, bringing something dark to his door. No way. I just, there's no one else that can help but you. The prince again. Kimura exhaled roughly, down in the kid's direction. He didn't know if there was booze on his breath, but the kid's expression made him think he must smell pretty foul. Gonna die. No one's gonna die from inhaling alcohol breath. It's not like it's cigarette smoke. No, Takashi's gonna die. Who's Takashi? Another one of your classmates? Kimura sounded fed. Up. Last time it was someone who committed suicide. What kind of school? Do you go to, anyway? I'm definitely not sending my kid there. This time it isn't suicide, Cucumberhead said urgently. I don't care what the hell you kids do. He was about to aim a kick at the kid and shout at him to get lost, but the boy spoke up quickly. He's not a person, he's a dog. Takashi is Tomoyasu's dog. This hit Kimura differently. Wah. What do you mean, he's a dog? You kids keep it confusing, he said, but now he was interested. He called back into the apartment, Wataru, I'm going out. You just watch TV like a good boy, okay? Wataru answered back obediently. All right, kid, tell me what's going on. Kimura often went to the park at the edge of the neighborhood. There was a playground and a sandpit for the kids in front of a small wood of mixed trees. It was a nice park, uncommonly large for a residential neighborhood. The kid filled Kimura in on the situation as they walked to the park. It started when one of their classmates whose father was a doctor and ran a private clinic said that they had a medical device that administered electric shocks. It was like an AED, for shocking a stopped heart back to life, but it was a prototype, stronger than the typical defibrillator. It was as straightforward to use as a normal AED. It had two electrode pads that were pressed on the chest to either side of the heart, and the pads fed data to an electrocardiogram. If the device determined that the heart needed a shock, you just pushed a button and let the current flow. As soon as the prince heard that, he was like, let's see how strong it is. Kimura made a sour face, like he'd swallowed an insect. Your prince sure is a noble guy to come up with an idea like that. So what happened? The kid with the doctor dad said the machine's automatic, so it wouldn't work on a human who was healthy. That how it works. Cucumberhead frowned and shook his head. He thought that saying that would make the prince give up. But that's just the kind of thing the prince would want to try, huh? The kid gave a pained nod. 
That day the prince made the doctor's kid steal the shock device. So they're gonna do it in the park. Everyone's there. The machines for restarting a stopped heart, right? Yeah. So what would happen if you used it on a healthy person? The kid's face crumpled. I asked the doctor's kid that, you know, secretly. He said his dad said that it'd kill the person. Hmm, AEDs are automatic, so it wouldn't work, but this one's a prototype, and it's stronger. Kimura grimaced at the thought. And now the prince wants to use Takashi the dog as a test subject. Makes sense. I guess the prince doesn't have the balls to go ahead and try it on a human first. Cucumberhead shook his head slowly. It wasn't a gesture of denial, but one of disappointment that Kimura was underestimating the prince. A gesture of despair at the realization that this man probably couldn't help after all. No. At first the prince was gonna try it out on Tomoyasu. What, Tomoyasu messed up? It wasn't hard to imagine. He thought back to his own experiences with gangs and criminal organizations. Usually when the higher-ups got violent with members of their own group it was to make an example of them. Doing that served to tighten up the group through fear. It was a good way to force obedience. The prince, who won his position over his classmates through fear, probably relied on the same tactics. He used electric shocks to dole out punishments and remind everyone that he was the one with the power. Tomoyasu's kind of slow. You know, he moves slow. The other day we were stealing manga from the bookstore and he fell behind and almost got caught. He explained that the clerk had chased Tomoyasu down and grabbed him, but the others ran back and kicked the clerk to the ground, giving their classmate a chance to get away. Even after the guy was down we kept kicking him until he was knocked out. I think he was hurt pretty bad. If you're that worried about getting caught you shouldn't bother shoplifting. It's always something like that with Tomoyasu, but he also talks kind of big. Moves slow and talks big. No wonder the prince is annoyed with him. What, does he brag about his dad being a hotshot lawyer or something? Kimura just hit on the idea of a lawyer randomly. Cucumberhead looked surprised. Actually, yeah. His dad is a lawyer. Yeah, well, lawyers aren't such a big deal. And something tells me laws don't much matter to the prince. But Tomoyasu's dad has some scary friends, or at least that's what Tomoyasu always says. Ah, uh, now that is annoying. Nobody likes to hear someone brag, but bragging about who you know is the worst. People who do that deserve to be taken down a peg or two. Tomoyasu was picked to be the test subject for the shock thing, but of course he didn't want to do it. He cried and begged and kissed the prince's shoes right here in the park. And what did his majesty do? He said he'd spare him but Tomoyasu had to go and get his dog instead. His dog Takashi. I've known Tomoyasu since we were little and he's had that dog his whole life. He really loves him. Kimura chuckled. Now he could see what the prince was up to. At this point testing out the defibrillator was secondary. It was more about savoring Tomoyasu's sacrifice of his beloved dog just to save his own skin. And by doing that he could grind Tomoyasu down, break his spirit. It was clear enough what the prince was after. But even though he understood it. Kimura was also unsettled by the thought that the prince would actually do. It. His highness really is something else. You know, if he's that rotten it actually makes him kind of predictable. Sir, I wouldn't start thinking the prince is predictable if I were you. As he said this the park entrance came into view. Uh, I shouldn't go with you any further. I'll split off and go home from here. If the prince thinks I snitched I'll be in trouble. Kimura couldn't bring himself to make fun of the kid, call him a chicken. He could tell the kid was desperate. And if his friends found out that he went for help, who knows what would happen to him. At the very least he'd become the new test subject for the defibrillator. Yeah, alright, get out of here. I'll make it look like I was just walking by. 
He waved the kid away. Cucumberhead nodded like a frightened child and started to leave. Hey, wait, Kimura called to him. The kid turned, right into Kimura's fist, slamming. Full force into his jaw. He staggered, went down, his eyes rolling wildly. You've done your fair share of bad stuff too, right? Consider this your punishment. Just be thankful that's all you get, Kimura snarled. But why me? How come you came to me for help? You don't know any other. Grown-ups. Looking for help from a drunk with a kid didn't seem like the best of choices. No one else, the kid said, rubbing his jaw and checking for blood. He didn't look angry. He actually seemed relieved at the thought that he could get off with just a solid punch to the jaw. There's no one else who could do it. Who could stop the prince? Try the police. The police. The kid hesitates. No, that'll never work. They need like proof to do anything. The police only go after people who are obviously bad. What does that mean, obviously bad? But Kimura knew what it meant. Laws work for people who steal things and beat people up. The authorities can cite legal verse and administer the appropriate penalty. But when things aren't so clear-cut, when dealing with a vaguer sort of evil, laws don't work as well. I guess laws don't apply to princes. Princes make their own laws. Yeah, exactly. The kid started to move away again, still rubbing his jaw. But you don't seem like laws matter to you, sir. You mean cause I'm a drunk? The kid didn't answer, just melted away into the twilight. Kimura made his way into the park. I can walk straight. At least that's what he thought, but he wasn't sure if he was actually walking straight or not. He imagined his parents berating him, telling him he had never walked a straight line in his life. He breathed into his palm to check for alcohol, but he wasn't sure he could smell that either. He came to the trees and began picking his way through them in the settling gloom. Further in, he could hear something, not quite voices or identifiable noises, just a dark murmur. The ground sloped gently downward to a depression in the wood where fallen leaves collected. Shadowy figures stood in a huddle. The black school uniforms made them seem like members of a cult conducting a ritual. Kimura hid behind a tree. His shoes on the leaves made a sound like crumpling paper, but was still a little way off from the group and no one noticed his approach. He peeked his head out once more and watched the school kids. About ten of them were tying up a dog. At first he couldn't tell what they were tying it to, but after a moment he realized they were tying it to another boy. Probably the dog's owner, Tamoyasu. The kid was hugging the mutt to himself and the others were wrapping them both in duct tape. Kimura could hear Tomoyasu trying to calm the dog, it's all right, Takashi, everything's all right. The sight of the kid trying to ease his dog's fear made something tighten in Kimura's chest. He ducked back behind the tree. The other students surrounding Tomoyasu and the dog were all silent. Air charged with breathless anxiety. Kimura thought it was odd that the dog wasn't barking, and he poked his head out again. He saw that the dog was muzzled with a tightly wrapped length of fabric. Hurry up and put them on, one of the students said. They were sticking on the defibrillator pads. They're on, look. Is this thing really gonna work? Of course it's gonna work. You calling me a liar? What's your problem? When we were beating up Tomoyasu before I heard you saying sorry. You don't even want to be doing this. I'm gonna tell the prince. I didn't say sorry. Don't make shit up. The prince really has these kids under his thumb. They're completely powerless. Kimura was impressed. When you lead a group by fear the rank and file lose trust in one another. The stronger the fear, the weaker the trust. The anger and resentment at the despot is turned on people who should be allies, making the spark of rebellion less likely. Everyone just wants to keep themselves safe, their only goal is to avoid being punished, 
and they start watching one another. When Kimura used to carry a gun and do his illegal work, he often heard about the man named Terahara, and how the members of Terahara's organization were all suspicious of one another. They tried to avoid mistakes in the hope that Terahara's wrath would be directed at someone else. It eventually led to them all turning on each other, looking for someone to serve as a sacrificial offering. Sounds exactly like what we've got here. Kimura scowled. The school kids crunching around in the fallen leaves as they prepared their sinister experiment didn't seem to be having any of the fun Kimura remembered from when he was younger and pushing other kids around. All he sensed from them was terror. They were torturing someone just to protect themselves. He looked down at his feet and noticed for the first time that he was wearing sandals. Given what he could imagine might happen once he confronted the kids, his preparation seemed to be sorely lacking. Should I lose the sandals? No, if I'm barefoot that makes it harder to get around. Should I go and get my gun? That'd wrap this up quick, but it'll be a pain in the ass to go back. As he ran through his options, Tomoyasu cried out. Wait, guys, stop. You can't do this. I don't want Takashi to die. The vegetation in the wood seemed to absorb his pleas, but Kimura heard them clearly enough. Rather than giving the others pause, Tomoyasu's wailing only goaded them on. Hearing a sacrifice beg must have finally given them a flash of sadistic thrill. Kimura stepped out from behind the tree and ambled down the slope towards the group. Hey, it's you, one of the students said, recognizing him immediately. Kimura couldn't recall the kid's face but he figured it was one he had met before, like Cucumber Head. He edged closer, sandals crunching leaves. Hey now, what do you think you're doing to that dog? Don't worry, doggy, I'll save you. Kimura glared at the group. The medical device lay on the ground. Two cords ran from it and attached to pads, which were taped to the dog. Poor doggy, look at you. This just isn't right. Well, don't worry, a drunk old man is here to rescue you. Taking advantage of the fact that the kids were standing around at a loss. Kimura strode in among them and pulled the pads off the dog. Then he ripped off the tape that was binding the dog to his master. The adhesive was strong and it pulled at the fur, making the dog thrash around, but Kimura somehow managed to get it off. This is bad, he heard someone say behind him. We gotta stop this guy. There you go, get mad, kid. I'm messing with your mission, if you don't do something quick his highness the prince will be angry. Kimura smiled viciously. Hey, where is the prince anyway? A calm, clear voice rang out. Wow, sir, you sure seem pleased with yourself. Kimura looked up. A short distance away was the prince's dazzling smile. Then a rock came hurtling out of the darkness. Click, goes the lock, and the suitcase opens, interrupting Kimura's recollection. The dials read 0600. Guess his majesty really is lucky. Considering how many possible combinations there were, he's arrived at the correct one quickly. He hoists the bag up onto the toilet and opens it all the way. It's filled with neatly stacked sheaves of 10,000 yen notes. Kimura isn't all. That impressed. The notes aren't new, they're used and wrinkled, and though there's a fair amount of money in there it isn't enough to move him especially. He had transported far larger sums in the past. He's about to close the bag when he notices several cards in the webbing. When he pulls them out he sees their debit cards, five of them, each from a different bank. They all have pin numbers written on the back in permanent marker. Some kind of bonus, like use whatever's in these accounts. It seemed like a fancy touch on top of a pile of cash. Guess this is how the criminals do it nowadays. He has a sudden urge, and he peels off one 10,000 yen note. Doubt anyone will miss this. Then he tears it to pieces. He has always wanted to try that. He closes the suitcase, moves it off the toilet, 
and tosses the shreds of money into the bowl. A wave of the hand in front of the censer lets loose a hearty gush of water. He exits the bathroom. The prince is there waiting. Kimura doesn't even. Realize that somewhere in his mind he's hoping the prince will praise him for a job well done. Fruit. Well, my dear tangerine, what shall we do now? Lemon is sitting in the middle, squeezed between the body by the window and tangerine in the aisle seat. Hey, switch with me. I don't like the middle. What the hell was that back there? Tangerine looks angry, and he clearly has no intention of switching seats. What do you mean? Lemon, you knew that Minejishi's guy was there on the platform. Sure I knew. I'm not stupid. That's why I waved. You waving would have been fine, Tangerine says in a spitting whisper, doing his best to contain his rage. Why did you wave his hand too? He points at little Minejishi, eyes closed by the window. Lemon sniggers uncontrollably. You're talking like that thing on TV where they sneak into people's bedrooms while they're still sleeping. You know, whispering like that. Saying this reminds Lemon of something he heard once. Hey, speaking of sneaking into bedrooms, you ever heard about the professional who hated being woken up? Tangerine doesn't seem like he's in the mood for idle chatter, but he answers curtly, yeah. When someone woke him up, he'd flip out and shoot the person who woke him. They say he got pissed off just watching someone wake someone else up. Yeah, yeah, he even got angry at his partners and clients when they tried to wake him. Soon everyone started contacting him indirectly, without actually going to his place. I've heard the damn stories. They'd leave messages for him on the train station blackboard. What, like Rio Siba? Lemon doesn't think Tangerine will get the reference to the old manga. Sure enough, Tangerine asks who that is, and Lemon responds, another badass from back in the day. Speaking of back in the day, do train station blackboards even exist anymore? The point, since you always miss the point, is that communication can be the trickiest thing in our line of work. Figuring out how to get information to someone securely and without leaving any evidence. If things get too complicated it usually doesn't work. I guess so. Like what we were talking about before, communicating using digital billboards. Say we wanted to try something like that, either we'd need to plant someone in the operation that programs the billboards, or we'd need to lean on whoever's in charge of programming them. Yeah, but when you put it that way, all we have to do is get control of the place that programs the billboards, and it'd work out. That's what I mean. Way more trouble than it's worth. Anyway, that guy who hated being woken up, he was supposed to be pretty awesome. That's what I heard. They say he was tough as nails. A legend. Legends start because someone makes them up. He probably never even existed. Saying someone's a legend is basically the same as saying they're a myth. Probably some guys thought too hard about how to pass messages and one of them ended up dreaming about this killer who didn't like to be woken up. I'm telling you, the guy never gets woken up because there's no such guy. As he talks Tangerine's voice gradually gets louder. I never wake you up, because I'm such a nice guy. No, it's because you always sleep later than I do. Listen, I thought it would be a good idea to make this kid move so that he didn't look like he was dead. When someone looks like they're sleeping and suddenly they wave their hand, they're either a giant puppet or a dead body that's waving because someone else is moving their hand. Oh, come on. I bet you it worked pretty well. Lemon starts jiggling his legs nervously. That guy with the slick back hair probably called Minejishi and summed up the situation in three words, everything's A-OK. -okay. A-OK -okay counts as two words. He definitely called him. Mr. Manejishi, there was something strange looking about your son. I think there might be something wrong. Wait, I couldn't count how many words that was. That doesn't matter. Lemon looks at Tangerine's profile and notes the severe expression. Why is he always so stressed out? Fine, whatever. 
Give me your take on the situation. Tangerine checks his watch. If I were Manejishi, I'd send my men to the next station. Dangerous men, armed to the teeth. I'd have them wait on the platform and make sure the two on the train who he hired don't try to make a run for it. And if those two stayed on the train, I'd have my men board. Luckily this Shinkansen has lots of empty seats. Right about now I'd be buying up every single one. I feel bad for the two guys on the train. Yeah, I wonder who they could be. So you think when the train gets to Sendai, a bunch of lowlifes are gonna swarm the train. That could be bad. Lemon imagines the train filling up with bearded men wielding guns and knives. He finds the image annoying. You don't think Manejishi has any girls working for him? Who could attack us in bikinis? It doesn't matter who they are if they've got guns. While you're busy admiring their tits they'd shoot you dead. The door at the front of the train car slides open. A young man enters, coming from the direction of car 4. Mr. Lemon. Tangerine says it quietly, which makes Lemon take notice. What is it, my good Tangerine? Would you like to hear a funny story? No thanks. When a serious guy like you says he's got a funny story, 90% of the time it's a dud. Tangerine continues undeterred. The other day I bumped into someone I know from the neighborhood. Now Lemon knows what his partner is getting at. He forces himself not to smile. Ah. Yeah, I know him too. Do you now? And the conversation ends there. The scenery flows by outside the window. Lemon watches a driving range and an apartment building slide past and recede into the distance. He starts thinking of Thomas. Hey, in Thomas and Friends, the head of the Sodia Railway, Sir Topham Hatt, tells Thomas and Percy in Everyone, you are very useful trains. That's what he says. Who's that? Sir Topham Hatt. I've told you before, the fat controller. How many times are you gonna make me say it? The director of the Sodia Railway, who always wears a black silk hat. He praises trains who work hard and scolds those who don't. He is widely respected by the trains. You know, he's like the boss of all the trains. On Sodier. So that's a pretty great thing to hear from a guy like him. What? Is? You are very useful trains. Anyone would be happy if someone told them they were useful. I'd love for someone to tell me that, hey, you're a great train. Then you should make yourself more useful. I mean, you and I, today, we're about as far from being useful trains as can be. That's because we're not trains. You're the one who brought up trains in the first place. Tangerine exhales sharply. Let me see those stickers I gave you before. I already gave them back to you. Oh, right. Lemon takes the folded sheet of stickers from his pocket. Which one's Percy? Don't know, don't care. How many years we've been working together? A long time. Do me a favor and try to remember who's who in Thomas and Friends. At least their names. What about you? Have you read any of the books I recommended? Forbidden Colors? How about Demons? I told you, I'm not interested. The books you recommend have no pictures. And everything you recommend is just a bunch of steam locomotives. There are diesel engines too. Anyway. More important. I got a flash of inspiration. And what's that? A plan. When a sloppy guy like you says he's got a plan, 90% of the time it's a dud. But I'm listening. Okay, it's like this. You're saying that we need to find whoever killed little Manejishi. Or else we need to find the missing bag. Because Manejishi's pissed off with us. That's right. And we haven't found either. But we're barking up the wrong tree. Or no, not the wrong tree, we're. Just doing it wrong. But that's no reason to get upset. Everyone messes up. Once in a while. 
Is there actually a plan here? Yes indeed. Lemon's lips twitch with the hint of a smile. Meanwhile, Tangerine's face hardens. Hey, don't let our friend from the neighborhood hear. I know, Lemon replies. Pop quiz. Here's a famous quote, don't look for a culprit. Create one. Know who said it. Uh, I'm guessing Thomas or one of his friends. Not everything I say has to do with Thomas. It was me. I said it. That's my quote. Don't look for a culprit. Create one. And what does that mean, exactly? We pick someone on the Shinkansen, anyone really, and we make them the culprit. A change comes over Tangerine's face. Lemon doesn't fail to notice. Well, well, look who likes my plan. Not bad, Tangerine mutters. Right? That doesn't mean Manejishi will buy it. Who knows? But it's better than sitting around doing nothing. Me and you, I mean you and me, we messed up our job. We let the kid get killed, and we lost the bag. Of course Manejishi'll be mad. But if we can get the killer for him that oughta mean something. And what about the bag? I guess we'd say that the killer got rid of it or something. I mean, I don't think this'll solve everything, but if we can make it look like someone else was the cause of all of this, it'll, you know, what do you call it? Quell Manejishi's fury. Yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say. Who do we use? Lemon is happy that Tangerine is willing to go along with his plan and wants to get started right away, but at the same time he's annoyed at. Actually having to go through with it. Wait, we're really gonna do this? It's your idea. You know, Lemon, if all you're willing to do is screw around then eventually I'm gonna get mad. There's a passage in a book I like. I despise that man. For even as the earth splits beneath his feet and rocks tumble down on his head he shows his teeth in a smile. He checks to see his pancake makeup is undisturbed. My scorn becomes a storm, and I devastate this place, because of him. Okay, okay. Lemon waves his hand back and forth. Don't get angry. Lemon knows all too well how dangerous Tangerine can be when he's angry. Usually Tangerine is content to read his novels and keep violence to an absolute minimum, but once he loses his temper he becomes ruthless and nearly unstoppable. It's impossible to tell from his demeanor whether he's angry or not, which makes him even more dangerous. He erupts all at once, without any warning, terrible to behold. But Lemon knows that when Tangerine starts quoting books and movies, it's time to be wary. It's as if in his frenzied state the box of memories inside his head gets tipped over and the contents spill out, making him start quoting his favorite lines. It's the surest sign he's about to get violent. I get it. I'll be serious. Lemon lifts his hand slightly. I know just the guy we can pin this on. Who? You know. A guy who probably knows who Manejishi is. Our friend from the neighborhood. Exactly. The guy we know from around the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Tangerine stands up. I have to go to the toilet. Hey, wait. What's up? I have to take a leak. What do I do if I see an opening before you come back? You know, an opening to talk to our friend from the neighborhood. What if you aren't here? Then it's up to you. You're okay on your own, right? It'll probably be quieter if there's just one of us anyway. Lemon is a little tickled that Tangerine's trusting him with this. Yeah, okay. Don't make a scene. Tangerine exits the car and Lemon follows him with his eyes. Then he leans into little Manejishi's corpse and takes hold of the back of the head, nodding it up and down like he's operating a puppet. Lemon, you are a useful train, he says, doing his best ventriloquist act. No no. I no time to lose worrying, Maria had said. But Nanao is worried. He heads towards car 3, worrying all the way. 
he thinks about tangerine and lemon. Immediately his stomach starts to hurt. He's used to dangerous work, but he also knows how scary high-level professionals can be. The second the door to car 3 slides open Nanao shores up his resolve. They're in here. Act natural, he tells himself. Like I'm just a normal passenger on the way back from the toilet, nothing suspicious about me. He tries his best to be nonchalant. There are plenty of empty seats, perfect for him to calmly choose where he wants to sit, but less than ideal for blending in. He looks around, keeping his face composed. There they are. On the left side as he's looking in, a three-seater halfway down the car with three men together. The man in the window seat leans against the window, sleeping like the dead, but the other two are awake. The one in the aisle seat looks serious as he talks to the man in the middle, seeming to pepper him with. Questions. They're the same height and they look alike. Long hair, lanky. Their legs barely able to fold into the seats. Nanao can't tell which one is tangerine and which one is lemon. He makes a split-second decision to sit near them. The row right behind them is open. So is the row behind that. Sitting further from them would help him stay safe, but keeping close will let him get a handle on the situation more quickly. Maria had thrown him off with talk of Menegishi, and he's feeling unsteady from his streak of mishaps. For a moment he pictures a footballer who makes a risky play, the sort he would never normally try, in the hope of making up for mistakes earlier in the game. A desperate gambit to regain good standing. Nanao realizes he's never seen it work. Failure only begets failure. But a player in the hole has to try. He sits in the row behind them. He's encouraged by the fact that when he entered the car he briefly locked eyes with Tangerine, or Lemon, and they didn't seem to recognize him. Good, they don't know me, he thought with relief. He also knows from experience that people tend not to pay much attention to the seats behind them. Holding his breath, doing his best not to draw any attention, he pulls a magazine out of the seat back pocket and opens it. It's a mail-order catalog with a range of products. As he flips through it, he tries to listen in on the conversation between the pair in front of him. Nanao leans forward slightly. Though he can't quite make out everything, he can hear well enough. The man in the middle seat is saying something about Thomas and trains. Maria had said she thinks Lemon is the one who likes Thomas and friends, which would make the man sitting next to him tangerine, who likes literature. His nerves buzzing as he tries to maintain a low profile, Nanao turns the page of the catalog to see a selection of suitcases. If they were selling Menegishi's bag I'd buy it right now. Okay, it's like this. You're saying that we need to find whoever killed little Menegishi. Or else we need to find the missing bag. Because Menegishi's pissed off with us. Nanao almost jumps up when he hears what Lemon's saying. They don't have the bag either. And he doesn't miss the name Menegishi. But not Menegishi, Lemon said little Menegishi. So who's that? Sounds like it might be Menegishi's son. Does Menegishi have a son? Did Maria say anything? About that? He can't remember. But he definitely heard Lemon say that. Little Menegishi had been killed. Which meant that someone killed Menegishi's son. A chill crawls down Nanao's spine. Who did it? Who could have done something so crazy? He recalls one time when he was in an izakaya and the bartender said to the patrons at the bar, there are two types of people in this world. Nanao smiled wryly, as that sort of setup always seems so tired, but he politely took the bait. What are the two types? People who've never heard of Menegishi, and people who are terrified of him. Everyone at the bar fell silent. Seeing that, the bartender continued. And then there's Menegishi himself. That's three types, the customers all pointed out. Even as Nanao laughed at the other patrons making fun of the bartender, he reflected that everyone he knew seemed terrified of Menegishi, that fearing the man seemed to be the safest thing to do. 
There in the bar, he felt more certain than ever that he should keep his distance. Pop quiz, Lemon says, raising a finger and sounding self-important. Nanao can't quite make out the next words, but he catches the word culprit, and then, create one. After a bit more discussion that's too low to hear, Tangerine suddenly stands up, startling Nanao. I have to go to the toilet. Tangerine starts towards the front of the car, in the direction of the bathroom in the gangway between cars 3 and 4. Lemon stops him. Hey, wait. What's up? I have to take a leak, answers Tangerine. What do I do if I see an opening before you come back? You know, an opening to talk to our friend from the neighborhood. What if you aren't here? Then it's up to you. You're okay on your own, right? It'll probably be quieter if there's just one of us anyway. Yeah, okay. Don't make a scene. With that, Tangerine turns away and exits car 3. The car is plunged into silence. At least that's how it seems to Nanao. Of course the train is still swaying and the wheels are clacking on the tracks as. The scenery glides by, but Nanao has the weird sensation that the moment. Tangerine and Lemon's conversation ended the train car became deathly still and time stopped. He flips a page in the catalog. He runs his eyes across the words, but doesn't comprehend them. Now or never, he thinks as his eyes slide over the page. Lemon's alone. If I'm going to talk to him, now's my chance. And what will talking to him do, asks a voice inside his head. You have to find the bag, and they obviously don't have it, so what's the point? But there's no one else who can help me. You really think they'll help you? If I bring up Manejishi, they might listen. What's that saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? He doesn't know everything that's going on, but it's clear that Tangerine and Lemon were transporting the suitcase for Manejishi. And Manejishi hired Nanao to steal the same suitcase. Which means that they're both working for the same client. It isn't hard to imagine that Manejishi has some sort of plan. Nanao's betting that if he tells Lemon he's also working for Manejishi, even if Lemon is wary of him and doesn't want to believe him, they might be able to strike a deal. They both have the same goal, to find the bag. If Lemon and Tangerine are willing to overlook the fact that Nanao stole it from them in the first place, they could conceivably join forces. They could form a team, like a couple that works past a one-off infidelity and manages to make it work. At least that's what he wants to propose. Nanao closes the catalog and reaches out to put it back in the seat pocket. It doesn't quite slide in at first but he manages to force it. He steadies himself. If he can get the drop on Lemon he'll have a good chance of immobilizing him. Then he'll explain the situation. Here goes, he thinks, and stands up. To find Lemon, looking right at him. Well, hello there. Nanao isn't immediately able to process what's happening. Well, hello there, how've you been? Lemon sounds like he's talking to a long-time acquaintance. He stands in the aisle next to Nanao's seat, blocking the way. Before Nanao can address the question mark in his brain his body starts moving. First he ducks, and not a moment too soon, because Lemon's fist smashes air where his head just was. If he had hesitated at all he would have taken the hook straight on the jaw. Nanao stands upright and snakes his hand out to grab Lemon's right wrist. He wrenches it around behind Lemon's back, all the while trying to contain his movements as much as possible so as not to call attention to himself. Causing a commotion won't do him any good. If the police or reporters get involved it would make it harder to hide his failure from Manejishi. He still needs to buy himself more time. Luckily, Lemon also seems to want to avoid making a scene. Keeping his movements compact, he makes his hand tremble like he's having a spasm. Causing Nanao to lose his grip. Nanao knows that he can't afford to give his opponent any openings, but he's so concerned about being noticed that he risks a glance around the train car. Most of the passengers are asleep or looking at their phones or magazines, 
but at the back of the car is a toddler standing on the seat, staring at them with great interest. Not good. He pops his elbow into Lemon's chest, not to do damage but to disrupt his balance. While Lemon staggers slightly Nanao slips backwards and down into the window seat. If they stay standing, sooner or later someone will notice them. Lemon sits too, in the aisle seat, and they start throwing punches over the empty middle seat. The middle seat in front of them is reclined a fair amount, making it hard to aim a clean strike, but they do the best they can. Neither one has ever had a sit-down fistfight before. They twist their bodies and throw punches at each other, leaning and blocking. Lemon fires a vicious uppercut at Nanao's ribs, but Nanao slams the raised armrest down and Lemon's fist crashes into it with a dull thud. He makes a frustrated noise. Nanao's spirits rally, but only for a moment, because he notices that Lemon has a knife in his other hand. It's a small knife, but it gleams cold as it slices through the air. Nanao grabs a magazine from the seat back pocket and spreads it open in the blade's path. The knife slashes through photographs of lush rice patties. He tries to fold the magazine around the blade but Lemon yanks it back. I'm just glad he didn't pull a gun. It could be that Lemon thinks a knife is better than a gun for this kind of close-in fighting, or maybe he's not even carrying one. Nanao isn't that concerned with the reason. The blade comes once more. Nanao tries to catch it in the magazine again but he mistimes it and takes a slash on the left arm. There's a flash of pain. Nanao's eyes drop to his arm for a moment. It's not deep. He looks back at Lemon and makes a quick grab, getting him by the wrist of his knife hand. He jerks the hand towards himself and drops a heavy elbow strike on it with his free arm. Lemon groans and the knife clatters to the floor. Nanao presses his advantage, thrusting two fingers at Lemon's eyes. Past the point of holding back, he fully intends to blind his opponent, but Lemon flinches at the last moment and the fingers just miss, catching him on the sides of the eyes instead of dead center. He screws up his face in pain and Nanao is about to try again, readying his fingers for another strike, when Lemon's hand flies towards his own chest and into his jacket. Nanao blinks, and in the split second his eyes are closed a gun appears. Lemon holds it low, but it's aimed right at Nanao. I didn't want to have to use this, but I've just about had enough, he says quietly. If you shoot you'll give yourself away. Got no choice. Emergency measures. Tangerine will understand. Anyway, it's pretty hard to fight without getting noticed. How did you know who I am? I clocked you the second you walked into the car all nervous. You were basically screaming, here I am, the sacrificial lamb. Sacrificial lamb? What do you mean, sacrificial lamb? You're the guy who works with Maria, right? You know Maria? As he speaks, Nanao looks between Lemon's face and the gun at his hip. He knows he could be shot at any moment. We're all in the same line of work. McDonald's knows all about Moe's Burger. Big Camera knows about Yodabashi Camera. Same thing. And our world is pretty small. There aren't too many people who'll take on any job. Someone needs doing. I heard about you and Maria from that old fat. Go between. Who, Mr. Good News Bad News? Yeah, that's right. Although most of the time with him it's bad news. But I hear about Maria all the time. And I heard that for the past couple of years she's been Glasses Guy's manager. What do people say about Glasses Guy? Nanao doesn't want to let his guard down for even an instant, but he tries to make it look like he's unconcerned. They say he isn't bad. To put it in terms of Thomas and friends, I guess I'd say he's like Murdoch. Is that one of the characters? Yeah. He's pretty cool, Murdoch. Lemon pauses for a moment, then, a very large engine with ten wheels. Quiet by nature, he likes peaceful places. 
but he also enjoys chatting with his friends back at the depot. Sorry. That's Murdoch's character description. Nanao is thrown off by the sudden recitation, but he also smiles to himself. It's true that I like peaceful places. All I want is some peace and quiet. But, he reflects with a touch of bitterness, here I am. I've seen a photo of you before, glasses guy. But I didn't expect you to come wandering in here. Just a coincidence. It's a kind of coincidence, but also not. Oh, wait, I get it. Realization dawns on Lemon. You're the one who stole the bag. Well, good. Now I don't even need to frame you, since you actually did it. First hear me out. Minejishi hired you to bring him the bag, right? So you are involved. You know what's going on. I'm also working for Minejishi. He hired me to steal the bag. What are you talking about? I don't know why, but Minejishi hired me without telling you guys. You sure about that? Lemon doesn't offer any counterarguments other than that simple. Question, but it's enough to unsettle Nanao. After all, Nanao doesn't know. For certain that it's even Minejishi he's working for. Why would Minejishi want you to steal the bag from us? We're supposed to be bringing it to him. I know, it's weird, right? Nanao wants to emphasize that something doesn't add up. So, say Thomas has some freight to carry, but he gets another train to haul it for him. Way I see it, there would only be two reasons, either Thomas is broken down, or someone doesn't trust him. And are you and your partner broken down? I don't think so. So that's not the reason. Lemon clicks his tongue. You're saying Minejishi doesn't trust us. The barrel of the gun twitches slightly. Lemon is obviously displeased, and his displeasure is making his finger tighten on the trigger. You better give us the bag back, and fast. Where is it? I'll shoot you, get it? And while you're wriggling around I'll go through your pockets and find your ticket. When I go. To your seat, I'll find the bag. Right? So just give me the bag before I shoot your ass. Wait, you don't understand. I'm looking for the bag too. It's not at my seat. Looks like you want to get shot. I'm telling you the truth. If I had the bag, I wouldn't come looking for you guys. I thought you definitely had it. That's why I came to this car, even though I knew it would be dangerous. And it turned out to be really dangerous. Nanao keeps his voice low and tells himself over and over to stay calm. Showing any fear or agitation will just encourage Lemon. And though he's still coming to terms with his lifelong bad luck, he's used to looking down the barrel of a gun. Guns don't scare him all that much. It's clear enough that Lemon doesn't believe him, but he appears to be thinking. Okay, then who has it? If I knew that I wouldn't be here talking to you. But the simplest answer is that there's someone else or some other group that wants it. Some other group. Besides me and the two of you. And now that other party has it. And do they work for Minejishi too? What the fuck's he thinking? I'll say it again, I don't know exactly what's going on. I'm not the smartest. I'm just good at football and dangerous work. How come you wear glasses if you're not smart? Aren't there any trains who wear glasses? Yeah, Whiff does. A tank engine with glasses, a nice guy who doesn't get mad even when people gossip about him. But yeah, I suppose he isn't so smart either. My guess is that Minejishi doesn't trust contract workers like us. Nanao is sharing these thoughts as they occur to him. He figures that as long as he's talking there's less of a chance he'll be shot. So maybe he hired a few different people to make sure the bag gets back to him. Why would he go to all that trouble? When I was a kid there was a man in my neighborhood who used to ask me to go shopping for him. What does that have to do with this? He told me if I went to the station to get his newspaper and magazines for him he'd give me a little cash, so I ran off to do it. When I got back, he said, look at this magazine, it's bent, 
I'm not giving you anything. So. He never had any intention of giving me a tip, so he had an excuse ready. I bet Manejishi has the same thing in mind for you guys. What happened to the bag, he'll want to know. And then he'll say, you messed up, and now you're going to pay. So that's why he had you steal the bag from us. Could be. As he says it Nanao thinks that it really might be true. Manejishi might hate the thought of saying good job and having to pay full price. By setting up a situation like this he can make the people he hired feel like they owe him, instead of the other way round. Now you're gonna pay, what do you think that means, exactly? Maybe he'd make you give him money, or maybe he'd have you shot. I bet he's thinking, I want someone else to do my dirty work, but I don't want to have to pay for it, wouldn't it be great if I could hire someone and then get rid of them? But if he hired someone else to mess with our work, wouldn't that cost him money too? There'd be no point. If it's an easier job he could hire someone for less. It would probably work out cheaper for him in the end. When a train works hard, you gotta make it feel good, tell it it's a useful train. Some people would rather die than praise someone else. Could be that's how Manejishi is. Nanao is still wary of the gun, still trying to make it look like he doesn't care. He's doing his best to distract Lemon from the possibility of pulling the trigger. Your partner Tangerine, is he still in the toilet? He has been gone a while. But Lemon doesn't look at the door, he keeps his eyes on Nanao. Maybe there's a cue. A thought occurs to Nanao. Is there a chance he's double-crossing you? Tangerine wouldn't do that. He could have hidden the bag somewhere. Nanao's doing a balancing act, he wants to shake Lemon up a bit, but not so much that he pulls the trigger. Nah, Tangerine wouldn't screw me. Not because we share some deep mutual trust or anything. He's just a cool customer. He knows that if he turned on me it'd be a whole mess of trouble for him. And you're not mad that while you're here fighting me he's just taking his time in the toilet? Nanao keeps looking for ways to sow doubt in Lemon's mind. But Lemon just makes a disparaging face. Tangerine knows you and me are in here together, bud. What? The second you came in, he said I saw someone I know from the neighborhood. All of a sudden, you know. Which is our code. For when someone we know shows up. We say it that way so that the person doesn't. No we know. When Tangerine got up to go to the toilet he said he'd leave. You to me. Oh, oh really? Nanao is struck with a feeling of incompetence. Everyone in the business uses secret codes and messages. He tries to think back to the conversation he overheard. He can't recall having noticed anything that stood out, but he figures Lemon is probably telling the truth. There's also a new rush of urgency. If Tangerine knows Nanao's here, he could come back at any moment, and two against one is not good odds. Hey, Lemon says suddenly, you don't hate being woken up, do you? Being woken up. I heard about somebody in the biz who hates being woken up. Supposed to be a beast. I thought for a second it might be you, but I guess not. Nanao had never heard about anyone like that. It seemed like kind of a silly thing for a professional to be known for. He's tough, huh? He's like the legendary train city of Truro. Even Gordon was too slow to beat city of Truro. Sorry, I don't know the reference. Listen, you're not gonna be able to beat me, bud. And if somehow you manage to kill me, I still won't die. What do you mean by that? I mean that the Great Lemon is immortal. Even if I die, I come back. I'll appear before you and scare the shit out of you. No thanks, Nanao says, scowling. I'm not into the afterlife and I don't like ghosts. I'm worse than a ghost. At that moment Nanao notices another Shinkansen passing in the opposite direction across the aisle and out the far window from where they're sitting. It roars by, and the two trains seem to be jostling one another, as if to say that there's no peaceful passage through life, everything is a struggle. 
Hey, maybe that's Murdoch, Nanao mutters absently, not intending anything in particular. It isn't a ploy, and if it were he wouldn't expect it to work. He just noticed the other train and wondered what model it was, and spoke his thoughts aloud. But Lemon, without any skepticism whatsoever, excitedly says, where? And turns to look. Nanao is astonished. Lemon has a gun on him, but he looked over his shoulder as if they were just having a friendly conversation. Not going to get another chance like this, Nanao realizes. He grabs the gun hand and forces it down, at the same time ramming his other fist into Lemon's chin. Snap back the chin, rattle the brain, knock the opponent unconscious. It was another of the techniques Nanao had practiced over and over again in his teens, just like he practiced football. He hears a sound like a muscle popping or a large switch being flipped. Lemon's eyes roll back and he slumps over in his seat. Nanao hauls the long body across to the window seat and arranges him against the window. For a moment he wonders if he should break Lemon's neck, but something stops him. After the wolf, it feels too risky to kill again. And he's also sure that if he takes Lemon's life he'll have to deal with an enraged tangerine. He needs to try to keep these two from becoming his enemies. It's hard to. Imagine that they become allies, but he knows he doesn't want to provoke them more than necessary. Now what do I do? What now? What now? His head feels like it's heating up. The gears start spinning faster. He takes Lemon's gun and secures it in his belt under his jacket. He also takes Lemon's phone. Then he leans down and looks at the knife on the floor. He thinks about grabbing it, but decides not to. What next? The pulleys and blocks of thought work furiously, hoisting up one idea after another. The ideas appear and then vanish. What are you going to do? Whispers a voice inside. Should I go to the front of the train or to the back? Tangerine will be here any minute. As soon as he thinks that and remembers where Tangerine's coming from, he knows he can't go forward. The only choice is towards the rear. His mind buzzes with options and fragments of escape plans. Even if I go towards the back Tangerine will just come for me. Both ways are dead ends. He has to figure out some way to get past Tangerine. He opens his waist pack. First he takes out a tube full of first aid cream, unscrews the cap and spreads some where Lemon slashed him. It isn't bleeding heavily, but it seems like a good idea to try to stop what bleeding there is. The arm throbs with pain both from being cut and from blocking punches. Bruises are already forming where he was hit. Lemon had got a few good blows in, pounding Nanao's flesh and bones. Every move stings, but there's nothing he can do about it. Next he takes out a digital wristwatch. No time to think. He sets the alarm volume to max and picks a time. How long will I need? Too early won't help, too late is no good either. Just in case, he decides to set a second alarm on a different watch, ten minutes later than the first. He places one watch on the floor under Lemon's seat and the other on the luggage rack above his head. Nanao is about to leave when he glances at the row in front, the three-seater where Lemon and Tangerine had originally been sitting and where the third man still sits motionless by the window. Something seems off about the man, so Nanao moves closer and touches him warily on the shoulder. No response. No way, he thinks. He lays his fingers on the man's neck. No pulse. Who is he? Nanao sighs, overwhelmed by the unknown, but he knows he can't hang around any longer. Just before he steps away he notices a plastic water bottle, half empty, in the seat back pocket where Lemon had been sitting. He hits on a sly little idea and takes a packet of powder from his waste pack. Water-soluble sleeping medicine. He tears it open and pours it into the bottle, then shakes the bottle up and replaces it in the pocket. He has no idea whether Lemon will drink it or if it will even work, 
but he reasons it's best to plant seeds wherever he can. Then he hurries towards car number two. Okay. What now? The prince. Just as he's thinking maybe he should go back to his seat, the toilet door opens and Kimura steps out wearing an agitated look. What was the combination? How'd you know I got it open? I could tell by the look on your face. Well, you don't look surprised or even happy. You're just used to being lucky, is that it? It was 0600. Kimura glances down at the suitcase under his arm. I locked it back up for now. Let's go. The prince turns and leads the way, Kimura following with the bag. If they bump into the bag's owner it'll be easy enough to blame everything on the older man. They arrive at their seats and the prince has Kimura sit by the window. This next part's critical, he thinks, readying himself. He'll feel much safer if he can manage to get Kimura tied up again. Mr. Kimura, I'm going to retie your hands and feet, okay? Your son's well-being is at stake so I imagine you won't try anything stupid, but we might as well do you up like before. I don't particularly care if you're tied up or not, either way is fine by me, the prince is trying to project this attitude. When in fact the difference between whether an opponent is bound or free is considerable. Kimura is much bigger than he is. Even if the man knows his son's life hangs in the balance, something could make him snap, launch a desperate suicide attack. If that happens, the prince might not be able to stop him. Things don't always go as expected when the situation turns violent. The best way to ensure his safety is to put things back how they were before. But he also has to make sure Kimura doesn't realize all this. The prince knows this is the key to exerting control over someone else. If someone understands that the moment of truth has come, that if they're ever going to make a move to change the situation then now's the time, then they'll most likely take action, regardless of what kind of person they are. If they know for certain that this is their only chance they might fight. With a wild abandon. That's why if you can prevent someone from knowing this, you're much more likely to win. Lots of rulers do it. They hide their true intentions, as if they were taking a horde of passengers on a train journey with no information about where the train is going and yet this state of affairs was the most natural thing in the world. The passengers could get off at any of the stations along the way, but they're never allowed to realize this. The conductor just keeps the train going, perfectly calm. By the time people start to regret not having got off earlier, it's too late. Whether it's war, genocide, or revisions to the law, in most cases people don't notice until it's already happening, and they feel like they would have protested earlier if they only knew. That's why when the prince finishes re-securing Kimura's hands and feet with the bands and tape, he feels considerable relief. Kimura doesn't even seem to notice that his chance to fight back slipped away. The prince puts the suitcase at his feet and pops it open, exposing the sheaves of notes. Look at that. Not much of a surprise. Nothing special about a bag full of cash. The bank cards thing is new though. The prince takes another look, and sure enough in the webbing on the inside of the suitcase he finds five debit cards. Each one has four digits. Written in marker on the back. I'm guessing these are the codes to make a withdrawal. Probably. Two kinds of payment, cash and card. Pain in the ass. I wonder, if you used the cards then could the owner of the bag find out the location where you made the withdrawal? No way, they're not the cops. Anyway, nobody involved with this bag makes a straight living, not the carriers and not whoever it's going to. They probably have some arrangement worked out so one doesn't screw the other. Hmm, the prince thumbs through a few notes. Hey, Mr. Kimura, you took one of these, right? Kimura's face stiffens and his cheeks go red. What makes you say that? I just have the feeling that when you saw this you'd want to try something, like take a note or two and tear them up and flush them down the toilet. Did you do that? The prince notices the blood drain from Kimura's frowning face. 
looks like I guessed right. Now Kimura starts to move his hands and feet. Unfortunately, there. Already all bound and taped up. If he was going to make a move, he should have done it before. Mr. Kimura, in this life, do you know what's right? The prince slips off his shoes and pulls his knees into his chest. He leans back in his seat and balances on his tailbone. Yeah. Nothing. Exactly. That's 100% correct. The prince nods. In life, there are things that are said to be right, but there's no saying if it's actually right. That's why the people who can say, this is what's right, those people have all the power. Over my head, your majesty. Talk so that the commoners can understand. Like there was that documentary in the 80s The Atomic Cafe. It was pretty famous. There's a part where soldiers are doing training for a stratagem involving nuclear arms. The soldiers have to enter an area where a nuclear bomb has just been set off. In the briefing before they go, a high-rank-looking guy is writing on the blackboard and explaining the operation to the soldiers. There are only three things you have to be wary of, he says. The blast, the heat, and the radiation. Then he says, the radiation is the new threat, but it's also the one you need to worry about the least. How could they not need to worry about radiation? It's invisible and odorless. The solders are told that as long as they follow procedure, they won't get sick. The nuke is detonated, and the soldiers start marching straight towards the mushroom cloud. In their normal uniforms. You kidding me? And the radiation didn't hurt them? Don't be ridiculous. They all got radiation sickness and suffered horribly. Basically, if people hear an explanation they want to believe it, and when someone important says with full confidence, don't worry. Everything's fine, people go along with it. When really, the important person has no plans to tell everyone else the whole truth. In the same movie there's an educational video for kids, with a cartoon turtle in it. He says, when there's a nuclear blast, make sure you hide right away. Duck down under the table and hide. That's stupid. We think it's stupid, but when the government calmly and confidently declares it to be so, we have no choice but to believe they're right. Right? And maybe it even is right, for that time and place. Like, for example, asbestos. It's prohibited to use it in construction now due to health hazards, but it used to be prized for its flame retardant and heat resistant qualities. There was a time when everyone thought that using asbestos when building buildings was the right thing to do. Are you really 14? How are you talking like that? What a moron, the prince thinks as he laughs through his nose. How's a 14-year-old supposed to talk? If you read enough books and gain enough knowledge, your way of speaking naturally evolves. It has nothing to do with age. Even after there were reports that asbestos was dangerous, it still took years until it was outlawed. Which probably made most people think, if it's really dangerous, there would be more of an outcry and they'd pass a law banning its use, but since that hasn't happened, everything must be fine. Now we use different materials, but don't be surprised when you start hearing that those are health hazards too. Same with pollution, food contamination, unsafe medication. There's no way anybody can be sure of what to believe. The government's rotten, politicians are the worst, everything's a mess. Is that it? Not the most original opinion. That's not what I'm saying at all. My point is how easy it is to make people think that something wrong is actually right. Although in the moment even the politicians probably think it's right, and they're not actually trying to trick anyone. So, so what? So, the most important thing is to be one of the people who decide what people believe. But even if I explain this to you I doubt you'll ever understand it. It's not politicians who control things. Bureaucrats and corporate leaders, they're the ones who call the shots. But you'll never see them on television. 
most people are only familiar with politicians who appear on TV and in the newspapers. Which works out well for the people who stand behind them. Shitting on bureaucrats isn't hard either. But say someone thinks that bureaucrats are worthless, they don't actually know who the bureaucrats are, so there's nowhere to direct any anger or discontent. Just a set of faceless pronouncements. Whereas politicians have to work in the public eye. Bureaucrats make use of that. The politicians absorb all the fire and the bureaucrats stand safely behind them. And if a politician causes any trouble, it's a simple matter of leaking sensitive information to the media. The prince realizes he's talking too much. I'm probably just excited about getting the suitcase open. Basically, the person who has the most information and can use it to further their goals is the strongest. Like this suitcase, just by knowing where it is I can control the people who want it. What are you gonna do with the cash? Nothing. It's just money, after all. Well, yeah. Exactly. It's money. It's not like you want it, Mr. Kimura. No amount of money will help your stupid kid get better. The lines in Kimura's face deepen and shadows harden around the edges. Too easy, thinks the prince. Why are you doing this? You need to be more specific. What do you mean by this? Are you talking about the suitcase? Or am I tying you up and taking you with me to Moriaka? Kimura doesn't answer at first. He doesn't even know what he's asking, notes the prince. He asks why without being sure of what he wants to find out. Someone like him will never be able to turn his life around. Finally Kimura settles on his question. Why did you hurt Wataru? I already told you, little Wataru followed me and my friends up to the roof and just fell. Let me play, he said, let me play. Careful, it's dangerous, I said. I warned him. Kimura's face turns so red it gives off heat. But he suppresses his rage. Whatever. Not interested in your bullshit story. What I'm asking is, why Wataru? Why him? Well, of course, it was to get at you, the prince says with great humor. Then he holds a finger up to his lips and whispers, but don't tell anyone. You know what I think. Kimura's mouth hangs open in a half-smile. All at once the tension vanishes from his face, his expression comes alive, his eyes flash. He seems to be young again, a teenager, as if he too were in school. The prince is overcome by the sudden sensation that he's dealing with an equal. I think you might have been scared of me. The prince is used to being underestimated. There is no shortage of people who look down on him because he's a schoolboy, because he's small and weak-looking. He relishes turning that underestimation into fear. But right now he's the one feeling unsettled. He thinks back to that evening a few months ago. In the park, among the trees of a small wood, at the bottom of a gentle dip in the terrain, the prince and his classmates were getting ready to test the medical device. He proposed that they use it to shock Tomoyasu, that flatfoot dimwit. Although it wasn't really a proposal, it was an order. Unlike an AED, if used on someone whose heart was still functioning this defibrillator could conceivably kill. The prince knew this, but he didn't tell the others. He only ever gave them the barest minimum of information. He also knew that if Tomoyasu did happen to die it presented an opportunity, the others would all panic, and in their discombobulated state they would look to him for answers. Tomoyasu was screaming and crying so annoyingly that the prince agreed to use the dog as a test subject instead. At that point his interest shifted away from the effects of the defibrillator. Instead the prince wanted to see how it would affect Tomoyasu to sacrifice his faithful dog, which he had raised since he was a boy. Tomoyasu loved the dog, but he was ready to subject it to pain and suffering. How could he justify it? No doubt he was casting around for justification, trying to convince himself he was not a bad person. The first step in gaining control over his classmates was to destabilize their sense of self-worth. 
he made them realize how flawed they were as humans. The quickest way to do this was to exploit their sexual urges, find out their secret desires, expose and humiliate them. Or in some cases he would confront them with their parents' sexual activities, sullying their image of the people they depended on most. Even though there's nothing unusual about sexual desires, having them exposed never fails to make someone feel shame. The prince couldn't help but be surprised at how well it worked. The next step was to get them to betray someone. It could be a parent or a sibling or a friend. When they turned on someone important to them, their self-worth plummeted even more. This was what the prince was hoping to do with Tomoyasu and his dog. But just as they had the dog tied down and were ready to administer the shock, Kimura showed up. The prince immediately recognized him from the time they met at the local department store. He had struck him as a grown-up juvenile delinquent with a kid, vulgar and boorish, the sort of man who can only think in straight lines. Hey now, what do you think you're doing to that dog? Kimura simply seemed to want to rescue the dog and the boy. There you go, get mad, kid. I'm messing with your mission, if you don't do something quick his highness the prince will be angry. Hey, where is the prince anyway? He didn't like the way Kimura was laughing. Wow, sir, you sure seem pleased with yourself. Then he threw a rock at the man's face. It hit full force, knocking him over backwards. Shall we try to hold him, the prince said quietly. His classmates obediently sprang into action. They hauled Kimura up and held his arms on both sides. A third came from behind and clamped an arm around his neck. Ow, that hurts, the man bellowed. The prince moved closer. I guess you didn't notice me there, sir. You should pay better attention. The dog started barking, drawing the prince's eye. Tomoyasu and his dog stood off to the side. He must have got up while everyone was busy with Kimura. His legs were shaking. The dog didn't try to run away, it just waited loyally by its master, barking bravely. South close, the prince thought bitterly. It would have only taken a bit more to shatter the bond between them, just a bit more pain, a bit more betrayal. Hey, your majesty, you get off on ordering your friends around like this? Even though his assailants were just school kids, the two boys holding his arms and one gripping his neck made it difficult for him to move. Look at the position you're in, the prince replied. And you're still talking tough. Hilarious. Positions change. It all depends on what happens. Kimura appeared totally calm, unfazed by the fact that he was being held fast. Who wants to punch this old man in the stomach? The prince eyed his. Classmates. A gust of wind blew through the trees, kicking up the leaves on. The ground. The school kids, confused by the sudden command, looked at. One another warily, then all at once pushed to be first in line to attack Kimura. They punched him with glee, one after the other. He grunted with what sounded like pain, but then he said, I've been drinking, you're gonna make me puke, and his voice was quite relaxed. You guys know that you don't have to do what he tells you. I've got an idea. Why don't you be our test subject, sir? The prince looked over at the defibrillator on the ground. How do you feel about an electric shock? Sounds great, Kimura said lightly. Happy to give my body to science. I always thought the curies were cool. I wouldn't be so laid back if I were you. What an imbecile, thought the prince. How has he survived this long? I bet he's never worked hard, never suffered, always just done whatever he felt like. Yeah, you're right, I should take it more seriously. Oh no, I'm scared, your majesty. Kimura's voice went up an octave. Save me, your majesty. Then give me a kiss. The prince didn't think it was funny, but neither did he get angry. He was mostly just dumbfounded at how Kimura had made it this far in life. All right, let's give it a shot. The prince looked at his classmates again. 
After punching Kimura, they had just been standing there dumbly, awaiting the next instructions. At the prince's word several of them moved to pick up the defibrillator and carry it closer to Kimura. They would need to affix the electrode pads to his chest. One of them leaned in and pulled Kimura's shirt up, about to stick on the pad, when Kimura spoke again. Hey, you should be careful of my legs. No one's holding them, I'll kick the shit out of you. Your Highness, tell these idiots to get my legs. The prince couldn't tell if Kimura was trying to seem unconcerned or if the man was just crazy, but he took the suggestion and ordered one of his classmates to hold Kimura's legs. Don't you have any girls in your gang? I'd rather have girls grabbing me. You guys all reek of jizz. The prince ignored this and told them to stick on the pads. And if this kills him, he thought, we'll just tell the police that this drunk stranger showed up with a defibrillator and hooked it up to himself. He guessed that no one would bat an eyelid if a slovenly alcoholic were to wind up dead. Here we go, said the prince, gazing at Kimura. With the way the four boys were holding him, he looked like Jesus nailed to the cross. Wait a second, Kimura said mildly. Something's been bothering me. He turned his head to face the school kid holding his left arm. I think I have a pimple on my lip, does it look bad? Huh? The kid blinked in confusion and leaned in. Kimura spat violently at him, hurling a gob of saliva right into his face. The kid flinched and pawed at the spit on his face, letting go of Kimura's arm. Kimura immediately swung his fist downward, bashing the kid holding his legs on the top of the skull. The kid squinted hard and held his head with both hands, freeing Kimura's legs. Then Kimura kicked backwards, smashing his heel into the shin of the student behind him. Last he punched the kid holding his right arm straight in the face. In just a few moments he was free, leaving four schoolboys moaning with pain. Tada! Did you see that, your majesty? Send all the classmates you want after me, it won't matter. Look, not even a scratch. Now it's your turn. He advanced on the prince menacingly. You guys, take care of this old man, the prince ordered. Don't be afraid to hurt him. Aside from the four hapless kids Kimura had just shaken off, there were three more. They were clearly terrified, after seeing what he had just done to their friends. Anybody who doesn't fight like they should gets to play a little game later. Or maybe I'll make your brothers or sisters or parents play. It was all the prince needed to say to get them moving. At the mere hint of getting an electric shock they followed orders like programmed robots. Kimura dealt with them easily. Two of them had knives, but he administered swift beatings all round, handling them roughly, yanking them by their collars into his fists, sending the buttons from their uniforms flying. He didn't hold back. One went down, bleeding from the mouth, but he kept smashing the kid's face with his elbow and palm heel. The two others, he purposely broke their fingers. By the end his legs were wobbling, either from alcohol or from fatigue, but it only made him look even more monstrous. What do you say, your majesty? You think you're so fucking tough, but you can't even handle one old man. Kimura's face shone here and there, as if flecked with spittle. Before the prince knew what was happening, Kimura was on him. He grabbed two fistfuls of the prince's uniform and wrenched it apart, tearing the fabric in two. Suddenly he was about to affix the electrode pads to the boy's naked chest. The prince flailed his arms in defense. Yeah, I think you might have been scared of me. Sitting here now in the Shinkansen, Kimura sounds almost triumphant. That's why you came after my kid. You wanted to get me back for scaring you. The prince almost sputters that's not true. But he swallows the words. He knows that showing emotion is a sign of weakness. Instead he stops to ask himself, was I scared? It's true that Kimura's berserk rampage in the park cowed him. Kimura was strong and raging and not the least bit bound by propriety or common sense. Encountering such purely physical dominance came as a shock to the prince, 
who relied on book learning to make up for his lack of life experience. The sight of Kimura beating his classmates bloody made him feel like he was observing humanity in its true form, while he himself was just a painted prop in a cheap stage production. That's why he turned and ran. At the time he told himself he was going after Tomoyasu and the dog. Naturally it wasn't long before he regained his composure. He knew that. Kimura was nothing but a loser who easily resorted to violence without considering the consequences. But that moment of terror and confusion Kimura made him feel, that stuck in the prince's craw, and his desire for. Revenge grew with each passing day. He knew he wouldn't feel satisfied until he had terrorized Kimura in return, until he could bring the man to his knees. And if he couldn't do that, he would have felt like he had reached the limit of his powers. He saw it as a challenge, a test of his skills and abilities. I wasn't scared of you, Mr. Kimura, he replies. What happened with your son was just part of a test. Like an aptitude test. Kimura doesn't seem to understand what this means, but he gathers that the prince is making light of his comatose son. His face reddens again and the confidence he felt a moment ago vanishes. That's better, thinks the prince. He lifts the bag up to his seat and dials the combination back to 0600, then opens it. So now his highness wants the money. Guess your parents don't give you much allowance. He ignores Kimura's taunt and reaches in, takes the debit cards, tucks them into his pocket. Then he closes and locks the bag and grips it by the handle. What are you doing? I thought I would put the bag back. What the hell does that mean? Exactly what it sounds like. I'm going to put it back where it was, in the panel over the garbage bin. Oh, or maybe I'll put it somewhere easier to find. That's probably better. I could just leave it on the luggage rack. Why would you do that? I found out what's in it. Now I don't really care about it anymore. It'll be more fun to watch the other people who want it fight over it. And I took the debit cards, so that should cause some problems for someone down the line. Kimura stares, flummoxed. He can't seem to wrap his head around what motivates the prince. I bet he's not used to people doing things for any reason besides money or bragging rights. He can't relate to my desire to figure out how people work. I'll be back. The prince stands and steps towards the door, wheeling the suitcase behind him. Morning Glory. He makes a phone call and reports, the job's done. At the other end of the line is a man who could be called a go-between. He used to do jobs two years ago, but he put on weight and slowed down, and now that he's into his fifties he's established himself as a contract broker. Morning Glory used to handle his own contracts, but these days he's been getting jobs from the go-between. He had grown tired of negotiating jobs, ever since the Byzantine arrangements around the large-scale operation to bring down the Maiden organization six years back. That whole affair started at the same large intersection. The memories reawaken. A man who worked as a tutor, two children and a woman, Brian Jones, Pasta, the images bubble up without context or order. They cavort through his head, then settle like dust, then fade. The go-between says, good work, and then, while I have you. He gets a sinking feeling. The go-between continues, I've got good news and bad news. He smiles acridly. The go-between always says that. I'm not interested in either. Don't say that. Okay, bad news first, says the man. I just got an urgent call from someone I know. There's a job, could be a bit of a pain, and it has to be done right now. Sounds rough. Morning Glory's voice is neutral, he's merely being polite. Now for the good news. The site for the job is right near where you are. Morning Glory stops walking. He looks around. A broad avenue and a convenience store, not much else. Those both sound like bad news to me. The client, well, we go way back, this is someone who's helped me out before. I'm not in a position to say no, 
confesses the go-between. That's got nothing to do with me. It isn't that morning glory is against the work itself, but he prefers not to pull two jobs in one day. This guy who's asking me, he's like a big brother, he showed me the ropes back in the day. And he's the real thing, a classic, the go-between says with some excitement. If he were a video game he'd be Hidlaid or Xanadu, one of the greats. You'll have to use an analogy I understand. Okay, if he were a band he'd be the Rolling Stones. Ah, them I know. Morning Glory smiles slightly. Or no, more like the Who. Because they broke up, but they get back together every once in a while. Yes, well, regardless. What, you don't like the classics? Anything that's existed for a long time deserves respect. Survival is proof of superiority. What kind of job is it, anyway? He decides to at least hear the man out. The go-between sounds happy. Apparently taking this as a sign of assent. Morning Glory listens to the job description and almost laughs out loud. Not only are the details extremely vague but it's not at all the sort of work he's suited for. Why would you say that? What makes you think you're not right for the job? I only work where there are cars or trains going by. Vehicles don't pass through buildings. Indoors isn't my field. Ask someone else. I understand that, but there's no time. And it's right near where you are. No one else could make it in time. I'm actually on my way there right now. I've been arranging jobs for other people for years now, it's been forever since I actually worked a job, but I've got no choice. I have to get out there for this one. Should do some good. And like you said, you're not in a position to refuse. I'm a little nervous, says the go-between, his voice quavering slightly, like a recent graduate confessing their fear of going out in the real world. It's been a long time since I worked, so I'm nervous. That's why I'm asking you to come with. Even if I did, what could I do? People call me the pusher. This job doesn't require any pushing. It's like asking a shot putter to run a marathon. All I'm asking is for you to come with me. I'm almost there. I'll be praying for you. Really? Thanks, Morning Glory. I owe you one. Morning Glory is left wondering how exactly the man interpreted that as agreeing to come along. 